Summon Sign is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash Media. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode six of Summon Sign, Last Stand Media's weekly in-depth gaming discussion podcast. I'm your host, as always, Brad Ellis. And joining me this week are the Super Moriarty brothers, Dagan <laughs> and Colin. I love these two dudes. Glad to have the brothers. I like having you two around because it reminds me of me and my older brother, too. Same kind of vibe, almost. We're much closer in age, but same vibe. Okay. So nice. It makes me feel comfortable around you, too. Same vibes. So, autistic, and my brother was the, the autistic vibe. <laughs> no, <laughs> not quite. Which ones? <laughs> I don't get that from Dagan. Only a little bit yeah. from you. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Sorry, I interrupted Only you though. No, no, no. You're all good. That's what I like, Colin. I want you to. Yeah, two seconds into the show, we're interrupting. That's all right. You're you've been hosting for like what ten years, podcast. So yeah, it's just in your yeah. blood at this point. Man. I'm the Jaffe of the show now. <laughs> <laughs> well you're not using soundboards yet but yeah we'll that's right that's right <laughs> um before we get into the show please check us out on patreon.com slash last stand media five dollars a month gets you early access to and ad free versions of this show and our other shows like it's sacred symbols and defining duke and punching up and if you enjoy the show give us a nice review leave us a like all that good stuff we appreciate it now last night from when we're recording super bowl colin I know you love football. Mm. Give me your thoughts. Yeah, it was an interesting game. Somewhat low scoring. I picked the Chiefs to win. I have this very complicated. This bothers Micah when I talk about this. So I have to be quiet. That because she's a Patriots fan. That oh. I have this theory that the Chiefs now need to win a bunch of Super Bowls in order to erode away the Patriots kind of legacy. Oh. So I'm rooting. For, so this will be their third Super Bowl in their run. And that's two back to back in three and five years. Either three and four years, maybe. So yeah. I have this very weird hate hater energy and I'm just rooting for teams in order to diminish other teams that would otherwise look better for if not for all of those wins. So yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with the outcome, but I really had no investment in the game whatsoever. I, I, we were actually remarking that we went to my uncle Mike's, our uncle Mike's, which we go to every year for Super Bowl. And he's a big football fan and I am too. And, and in my opinion, the, the conference championship games, the ones that lead into the Super Bowl are the most exciting games of the year. And the Super Bowl, I'm just kind of like, Mm. And and here's a thing. This is not going to really, especially you, Brad. You probably won't give a shit. Dagan maybe is a, a somewhat cursory sports fan with other sports. We'll appreciate this more. And I've said this on other shows, but I'm a firm believer that what ruins the Super Bowl is that it's a neutral site game, and that the better team should have a home game, mm. just like in every other playoff game, like where that. the team with the better record or the team with the better seating gets a home game. Sure. And that would be fucking hy- hysterical and awesome and exciting, for, and yeah. have that home game energy, but a Super Bowl. Which yeah, I think would make I it much. Instead, it's just a, it's just a commercial fucking. It's just yeah. commercials, and I, I don't even really. It's impossible to pay attention to the game. You know. So do they treat it like the Olympics, where cities bid on it or anything like that. Yeah. Well, what, what usually there are there are some bids, but what usually happens is that new buildings. There's always yeah, right. like a new building. They'll always get the Super Bowl pretty quickly, and then it'll go okay. to a selection of other, usually southern domed locations. So like New Orleans, Arizona, Dallas. Uh, stuff like that like there was a Super Bowl where the Jets play when their building opened up and that's that's in in New Jersey and it's uh in the middle of the winter and they got away with it but that could have been a disastrous situation so they try to stay away from that so Vegas had it because their building is new oh right that's brand new right yeah Yeah, that's uh two years I think it might be yeah Dave are you into football no man I you know I could give a rat's ass about football (laughs) I am a baseball fan but I have two thoughts about the Super Bowl yesterday First of all, it was interesting because I thought I would see a little more. I'm in the Philadelphia region, for those of you who don't know, in the in the Philly burbs. And I thought that would be more animosity against the Chiefs because of what happened last year. But there really wasn't. That wasn't a sentiment I saw, like people rooting for the 49ers in spite of the mm. Chiefs. Two, I have two thoughts about the Super Bowl, though. Because we my family and I watched sat through the whole thing. And I have two teenage kids. So like any event that's going to get all of us on the couch shoulder to shoulder like that because I it's hard to it's like hurting cats at yeah. this point they don't want to hang out with us so we we watched and first of all Madison Avenue needs me uh, that's my first thought mm. the commercials were fucking 
I don't know what happened. Here's the thing about the television commercials, okay? I won't go on and on about this, but I have two thoughts. First of all, very polished, very expensive, high budget, high level CG. I pr- Production values through the roof, okay? Second thing, crazy star power. Like everything's about how how crazy we can make this look like a Michael Bay movie and who can we get in this thing? You know what I mean? So you get a little bit. But where are the where are the concepts? Where is the conceptual? Where is the conceit, right? The brilliant concepts. I'm seeing that become less and less relevant. I don't even care if it's funny. It doesn't even yeah. have to be humorous. It could be a tearjerker. Actually, one of my favorite my, one of my favorite commercials last year or two years ago, and it's a crypto commercial, so I don't like crypto. I don't support crypto, so I'm not telling anyone oh, to get involved one? in it, but I loved it because yeah. it was just a black screen with a QR code just bouncing around for 30 <laughs> seconds. And it was just a and it was just and and it was for like Coinbase or something. That's actually and I was like, that's funny. fucking brilliant. Like I, I, I never QR, I never scan QR codes. And I was like, ah, fuck it. And I went and, and I went and did it. You know? Um, that, yeah, because who could resist? Dude, that's I mean that's, that's good. the thing. That's the one the, good commercial you, this year, Dave, for me was the Dunkin' Donuts commercial. The Ben did, Affleck Matt yeah. Damon one? Yeah, because it's like Tom Brady's in it. It's like it's funny. It's like it's it's all it's a bunch of Boston characters. Know. It's just it's I don't know. To me, you I thought that funny was funny about that one. Dagan hates Boston so much. He does. I don't. I don't. I don't hate Boston. I mean, the, I mean, I hate Boston I'm a, too, I'm a diehard I, Yankees fan, so yeah. we have that built-in sort of bad blood with Red Red Sox. But I actually think Boston's a great town. One of my best friends went to school there for his undergrad, so I spent oh, a lot of time there. You know, not to mention Colin went to school. Yeah, Colin went to school in Boston as well. To say, um, <laughs> but that was way before you because I'm much older. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I, I was really hard on Ben Affleck for being in that commercial, and I gave Matt Damon a pass, which isn't fair because I really like Ben Affleck as a director, and my whole thing was, why is he doing this? He's such a good director. But Matt Damon, I was just like, oh, that's fine for him. I don't know. There was something about that that there was a crazy double Dude, standard going on. That the other paycheck. thing I'll say about the Super Bowl real quick is that Taylor Swift, they only showed her like six or seven times. That's fine. Definitely responding to the pressure, though, don't you think? Well, Jaffe and I had this conversation, Dig, where I am of the mind that people complaining about Taylor Swift are orders of magnitude more annoying than Taylor Swift. (laughs) Like, (laughs) she doesn't bother me. She doesn't bother me really either. I've said it many times. So people around, you know, like the family stuff, I'm like, she is the most famous person in the world. In the world. She's dating one of the premier football players who's in the Super Bowl and is on a good team. Right. And uh, like a historically good team. Right. And why is panning to her three or four? Like I watch football every week. In my opinion, they were never gratuitous about it. Like maybe that first or second weekend, they talked about it once or twice too many times. But even when you would look at the games, it's like sh- they'd show her a few times. It's like, who cares? Do they show? I watch the Jets games. They'll show Woody Johnson looking like he's going to fucking cry in the fucking <laughs> skybox. Probably <laughs> who's the owner of the Jets? Probably 25 times a game. <laughs> Yeah, you know? go to a reaction shot. Mix it up. Why who cares? Not? Who yeah, cares? Right. Like, that's right. my whole thing. Is like, who cares? People are such haters. You know, Let, yeah. leave the hating to me. We have to call Aldi do the hating. Big okay? hate. Big hate energy going on with with uh, T right. Swizzle. Two more questions for you, Colin. Specifically, you. The shake on the coach. What was that yeah. about? I saw a yeah, player I, shaking a coach. Yeah, what yeah. Was that's that? that's Kelsey. That's that's her that's bow her guy. Um, okay. Who's the who, Travis Kelsey's a uh, tight end and a great sure catching, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a great catching tight end. He can block and stuff too, but you know, obviously going to be a future Hall of Famer. And this might be his last season. I, I, he's not very old, but tight ends age very quickly because they're so, there's, it's like not as bad as a running back, let's say, but they, they don't have very long careers if they're, if they play a lot. Look at Gronkowski and how fucked mm-hmm. up he, he, his body is and all that. He can barely move by the end of his career. Um, but the he had said after the game that he was saying something about how he, much he loved him. And I kept I don't know if he was being facetious, but I kept watching it over and over again. And I'm like, it could be, I guess, that they were just heat of the moment. But it, sat, it looked to me like he was yelling at him for wanting to stay in. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, these guys are not roided out anymore. It's like not at all like that. I just think that there is because like if you saw that 20 years ago, it'd be like, oh, my God. Like, right. Jose Canseco was fucking breaking a bat in the, <laughs> in the not even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, he'd be breaking a bat in the fucking dugout or something. It's like, all right, he's roiding out or Mark McGuire has 80 home runs. I wonder how that happened. Um, it's just that's not what's happening anymore. I think they're just in the heat of the moment. I was saying right. during the, the game to the family, especially with Brock Purdy, who is the Niners quarterback, Mr. Irrelevant. 
as it goes because he was the last player drafted he which means that you have no future basically and there he is i'm like he must be dying i mean i'm like this must be so scary and i do the ice water i'm a big fan of sport love it just love it the ice water going through the veins in moments like that the 56 yard kick Mm -hmm. in the super bowl that was intense you know it's like it comes up on on a podcast i listen to a lot around the nfl often is that this doesn't matter to to you brad i know but kicking has become so good in the nfl when dagan was young people would not even bother trying to kick 45 yard field goals like not even bother 40 yard field goals were no gimmies now these dudes are booting 60 yard field goals in outdoor this wasn't outdoor but in outdoor weather it's just incredible the amount of just composure (laughs) i would get the yips which is what it's called in sports so badly. I couldn't even imagine how badly I would get it. Cause when yeah, I played yeah. hockey, even in high school, which was on a decent level, it's like, mm-hmm. I would get the yips. If I sure. let in a bad goal or something, I would know. Yeah, you're, like, a, oh. you're a goalie. So yeah, yeah. you get it probably worse. It's a lot of yeah, pressure. Like I, you would just let up a soft goal or something once in a while. And in my mind, I'd be like, I'm going to let up three more goals. That, like that I'm not going to yeah. stop anything. And lo and behold, oh, like you just, you turn into like a big doorway and everything just yeah. goes through these the guys. I, I, I just love the performance, like the ability to just like everyone is watching you. Everyone. Yeah. It's, 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 it's good shit. I mm-hmm. love it. I love sport. I just love it. Yeah. Uh, did you see the SpongeBob thing about? Yes. Football? Yeah, I did. Like so Nickelodeon has been reacting? doing, yeah. Nickelodeon has been doing these telecasts for a couple of years, a few years. They're a few years um, deep, yeah. Because they're what? So they, the connection is what? Paramount to Nickelodeon, Paramount, the mother, right? Yeah, the uh, parent company. Right, exactly. So those connect those two. And they would do it for like regular season games, kind of these kinds of children's oriented broadcasts, which they've been doing for a few years. And apparently they work. And so I, I think it's really great because football is a wonderful sport. I've said before, Brad, and I don't know if I've, I've articulated it to you, but it's like it's the ultimate turn based role playing game. Yeah, I've heard you yeah. say that. Yeah. And it's got character classes and mm-hmm. rules and a clock and all different ways to score and ways to fuck up your opponent's shit situation, which we saw many times in the game yesterday. It was what four catastrophic fumbles in the red zone. It's like totally crazy to see that. And um, so anyway, I'm going on and on, but I, I think that there's so much to, for, for gamers to love about sport and they, sure. there's just so it bums me out that there's people are just so, closed-minded to it so to see like a kind of an ancillary brand try to incorporate children into it i think is so important because especially in an era when parents are, are afraid of letting their kids play because it's such a violent game and right. obviously there's major cte ramifications to playing the sport yeah so yeah. It's, it's important to kind of you don't want to say it but it's like you want to kind of indoctrinate children into like football young if you want to do it at all and so that's a good way of of doing it dude that's i wish true. i knew I, I didn't know i loved football until i was too old to play you know, hmm. So that's that's like one really? of my I I always like the sport because I like all sports, you know, love basketball, baseball, whatever, tennis. It's all good. Golf, all good. You like them all? Uh, I'm sorry, like playing them all or just watching? Yeah, them yeah, all? no, I like playing them all. I'm not very okay. good at tennis. Is tennis? I I uh, I I have always felt that tennis is the hardest that's sport hard game to play. Like it. Yeah, the court is so big. It looks so simple until you're on the court. Even if you're just volleying back and forth golf i'm horrible at golf but i do like playing golf i think it's a fun sport what stresses me out about playing golf outside of a driving range is people are always playing behind you and i'm bad so Mm -hmm. it's like i it's just like you're constantly pressure you have to people have to play through it's just too much if i could have the you know do nine holes or whatever to myself that would be more fun but that's not the way it ever works yeah yeah Um, man i've always had problems playing sports because i'm left-handed so like oh i always wanted to try like no one has left-handed golf clubs mm-hmm. I can try out or anything. Yeah, like that. that's tricky. But Dude, that's gonna... that's so funny. My friend Cody's dad, because uh, I'm a lefty too. My my friend mm. Cody's dad. I'm actually cross-handed, depending well, on what you talk about. Most people, left-handed people are, because I do yeah. some stuff right-handed too. <laughs> right, like I use my mouse with my right hand and all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's about the way you 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 I guess are brought up and whatever. <clears throat> but I'm a lefty with all sports. Okay. Kicking, throwing, batting, golfing. Yeah. And my friend Cody, who I grew up with down the street, Dagan will obviously remember, his dad was a lefty and I was able to use his golf clubs, which was the oh, only nice. way yeah. that I was. So, but I was bad. <clears throat> and when you go, I go driving once in a while, like at a range and they just have righty clubs out and you have to specifically ask them for lefty clubs. I know, and it's sucks. always like, yeah, it's always like a, like a thing. It's like, come loser. on, man. 
It's a stigma. And what what bothered me so much about it, because you throw lefty too? Yeah. yeah I play so, all sports left-handed. Yeah, yeah, me too. Hockey, oh, I wow. bat lefty and all yeah. the rest. So I totally relate to you. And as growing up playing baseball and being really in love with baseball, I was like, I didn't think it was as rare as it is because mm-hmm. baseball selects for left-handed people to the point where it almost looks like half of America plays sports left-handed. So you'd then be in the wild and no one would have a left-handed glove for you. Like if you were going to go play ball, like hardball, like another friend's house or whatever, it's like, all right, I want to play, but I'm, and I would have to play with a right-handed glove and then catch God the ball damn. and take my, like I was fucking, Dave, who was that guy? David Cohn? Was that the guy? That, no. Oh, Jim Abbott. The guy that there was a, a pitcher on the Yankees that had one hand. And now, oh, that's I don't the, even and, know who that is. Yeah, that's Jim Abbott. He used to he would he would pitch. I think that was Jim Abbott. He would pitch. He would put a, the glove over his hand, throw and then put his hand in the glove to catch the ball. What era is this? I don't even know. This My is era, like spot. late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. OK, yeah, that's a blind spot. Mm. And uh, so that's how I had to play because no one. So it's so funny because baseball made it look like oh, you'll, you'll find a bunch of lefties out there. And then like, I can count the, and I know who the lefties were in my life. Like my friend, Eric was a lefty, like all these different, and now you're a lefty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, it's good to meet you because uh, <laughs> it's, it's dire out there. It's same thing with it hockey, is. you know, it is, but you know, what sucks Colin is my brother and my dad are left-handed also, but oh. they both oh, wow. play right-handed for sports. Oh, oh, that's interesting. So I got really left out in the cold. I couldn't they even borrow family probably. members. Wow. What, what, what's it's this is this is like so off topic, but I don't care. I have all I have all day. I don't give a shit. But um, <laughs> playing hockey, which was my mm-hmm. main sport, I was a goalie. Same. Oh, OK. Wait, so you played? I played roller hockey for like 10 years, I think. Oh, Sick. Wow. I didn't know that. What uh, yeah. what position did you play? Uh, I usually just played on all of them because I didn't. I played it on our junior high team. And earlier when I was younger, we had this coach that I've been with for a long time. We were always the best team in the league. Or the fucking worst team in the league. And so we would just kind of play whatever. Because a lot of my friends played too. So it was more about just fucking around and having fun for us. So I played offense, defense, everything but goalie pretty much. How did you... Um, how did I not know this? And you grew up you? in SoCal, right? Yeah. 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 Like ice hockey was very expensive out here. So we yeah. were all like, nah. Yeah, ice time's really expensive. Oh, that's that's yeah. awesome to know. Um, so you'll you'll appreciate this then. Like I, be, so I, everyone played when they learn how to. I learned how to skate when I was, I guess, like six or seven, yeah, which really is pretty, young. which is pretty late, actually. And mm-hmm. you all start by playing what's called out, right? Which means you're playing all the positions but goalie. So yeah. left defense, right defense, center, left yeah. wing, right wing, and then you slowly become a goalie. And I did. I became a goalie over time. Like over the first few years, I played defense actually until I was ten, mm-hmm. and then I became a goalie. And I played goalie right handed because that was like how I was taught how to play. Mm. So I held the stick with my right hand, which is the natural way to play. However, see that. However, there is a major advantage if you're a left handed hockey player to play goalie right handed, which is that the stick is a left handed stick. You are playing goal so you can puck, you can stick handle really well. And I was an exceptional stick handler for a goalie, although the NHL has neutered stick handling almost completely behind the net because because goalies were becoming so proficient. Yeah. That it was like unbalancing the game, making it hard to dump the puck in and all that kind of stuff. So they, oh, they that's, that's why there's like an octag or not. I don't even know what shape shape it is. It's like some sort of shape behind the the goal line that they draw. Right, and the yeah. goalies are not allowed to play the puck in those corners yeah. anymore because goalies would just go into the corner, be able to whip the puck around the ice and just dump it down. So that's awesome, dude. I didn't know you played hockey. That's so yeah. exciting. I played yeah till high school, I think, because, you know, at that age, I was skateboarding and shit and playing video games. So we wanted to do that more than hockey. So we kind of yeah. moved on from then. And it got too yeah, serious, yeah. man. Like I remember like parents, I remember getting really intense about hockey. It's like, we're just, we're just having a good time. And I, yeah, I was like, all right, I think we're good. My brother stopped playing. So I was like, I'm out too. Yeah. Brad, I was on- it's funny that you say that. Yeah. My, yeah. my son's what, you know, he's in intramural basketball. It's not, he's not on the school team. So he's in a basketball league outside of school. They had a game yesterday and the game was, you know, they're probably like eight or nine games into the season. They've all been, they all have been like runaway victories in one direction or the other. This was like the first really close game. So the parents were getting really passionate. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. But it got so ratcheted up that a parent on our team started yelling at and threatening a kid on the other team. Now, yeah. these kids are 13 years old. <laughs> and the referees are high school kids. And sometimes they do a good job and sometimes things go sideways and yeah. they, their calls are off. Usually I'm just kind of looking for if they're not calling traveling on the other team, maybe we'll be the recipient of a call. 
it'll go in our direction. But it was getting really unbalanced and the parents on our team were getting frustrated. And this one kid just committed an egregious foul. He was literally trying to punch the ball out of our guy's hand from the back over and <laughs> over again and was hitting the guy, was hitting the kid like in the chest and they weren't calling it. So the parent, I guess it was the dad of the guy, you know, of yeah. the kid who was getting punched. And he was like, ref, come on. Like, what are you doing? And the kid who was doing the fouling looked into the stands and smiled. And the dad said, what the fuck are you smiling at to the kid? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it was the most awkward. It was like that whole thing that you see, like that whole soccer mom thing. Yeah. Like playing out in real life right in front of you. It was just so awkward for everybody. And it was only halfway through the game. So we had to endure like another whatever it was get the camera out dig 25 minutes dude it was a whole subcategory this is um, as a freak out video connoisseur this is a whole subcategory of of freak outs which is it could have went youth sport parent (laughs) freak outs which are usually at baseball games but but happen at at other things yeah but but it happened at other things too yeah yeah like a whole soprano oh yeah type thing you know right right that's exactly right yeah yeah because it's uh it's funny, like by the time I, I played on serious, I played in spe- in serious travel leagues when I was younger. So like it was just a generally nicer environment. It did get pretty serious and there were some hairy situations. But by the time I was older, like in high school, I was on my art teams were horrible. So mm-hmm. no one gave a fuck. You know, like the parents didn't care. They were, it was like the Mighty Ducks. If you remember the first movie, like oh, the parents, dude. like the parents that, there. I was like, on just so like, many teams. Like yeah, that. <laughs> it, it's just like, but it's funny, dude, because Dave, you'll appreciate this. and um. You know, rest in peace because I'm talking about someone that that's passed, unfortunately. But our friend, my friend Tim's father, was mm. the coach of our. So I played roller hockey over the summer. So we right. th- like I played ice hockey, you know, fall and spring, and then in the summer I played. Sometimes I played ice hockey too, but there was always a roller hockey league that was like attracted all the ice hockey kids because it was just cheaper and it was school was out. You can play at weird times and it's just cool to play outside a lot. Mm-hmm. These were outdoor rinks, and uh, there was some situation. I don't remember exactly what happened, but he, me and Tim were on this team, the Hawks. I still have the jersey actually in my closet. It's hysterical. It's like these white penny like jerseys with Hawks right now and diagonal. And I was number one because I was the goalie. And uh, push comes to shove and, and our, the, uh, Tim's dad gets into like a, a, a scuffle with this dude. I will never forget it as long as I live like adult fighting you know (laughs) over like what this dude said to Tim or what's said to me or whatever. And I always remember that I was like, damn, dude, that was. That was, I think, the most crazy I ever saw. Like, and 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 that wasn't, and it wasn't even. That was just like a joke of a league, but compared to what, what what we were usually doing, where it was, you would think it would get more serious. So, there's a lot of degeneracy going on out there, generally speaking. <laughs> oh yeah, in with youth sports, and I, I would love, I would love to be a, uh, a youth hockey coach like that. I think that would be so fun and interesting. I had some coaches, especially um. His name was Matt Leonard. He was the coach of my squirt A team in New Hampshire, the travel team Dover Stars. And we won the state championship that year. And he was 22 and he was a senior at UNH and he wow. failed out <laughs> because he <laughs> was so, because he was so like, we were so good and we were so obsessed with our team. And like, mom will tell you the story, Dave, like he, cause everyone was like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you got to like focus on your, st-. like, and he was just like, no, we got to like, it was all about practice and like playing the games and he was a fucking dope ass coach, but like it, it cost him apparently like his, his I hope he got it together after that. I haven't heard wow, you. I haven't talked to him intense. in you know, almost 30 years probably, but damn, <laughs> threw it all away for a bunch of fucking kids. It was dude. Like I remember me and my friend Steven were the goalies on the team and we were, we were boys and both of our moms were single, like working mothers. And we used mm-hmm. to play in these tournaments in like fucking Quebec and all these like random places and we couldn't go. And he used to drive us. He used to, like we would get a we would get a hotel room with like a two queens so we could we could stay together and he would like help us circumvent the Super Nintendo lockout but we bring our Super Nintendo and hook it into the TV which you weren't allowed <laughs> to do and like the amazing. hotel rooms and all of that and he was just a really sweet dude almost like an older brother figure but he really like put his all into our team it was <sighs> people were probably listening to this being like what are we even doing <laughs> hey man my thing is. I just let you boys go mm. and you boys go as long as you want. It's go. turning into knockback. <laughs> it really <laughs> is turning into you knockback. You have to turn. You, well, have, to, you have to get away the from roster. Us. They know yeah. the roster. They know yeah. what they're getting into. Oh, it's just so the way sorry, it is. Brad. No, On it's all good. I want you guys Boomer. to just talk as much as you want to talk, man. I think it's good entertainment. 
Yeah. <laughs> Boomer edition of Summon Time. <laughs> Listen, postscript, this is why you parents out there make your kids, not make, have your kids skateboard because there's yeah. none of that soccer mom shit. That's yeah. one of the great attributes of skateboarding over team worry about sports. Cracking our heads open and breaking our limbs, I guess. And another subgenre of freakout video is the oh skateboarding con- confrontation usually Cop. by cops or Karens. Yeah. 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 Well Did you ever get really hurt, Dagan, skating? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. I broke my arm really bad. Compact Damn. fracture. Probably, I was 17, so I was like four years in at that point, which is funny okay. to think about because I already felt like at that point I was skateboarding for 15 years, but I really wasn't. I was skateboarding for like less than five years when it happened. And it was at like a real formative, like formative time where I was a junior in high school. I was already like art school was already in the offing, right? I was going to go be an animator, like, you know, played out exactly how it was supposed to. But it was the type of thing where my arm needed surgery. I was in the hospital for a few days. And um, the surgeon was like, if you break your arm again, like it could affect because it was my, what is that? The radius and the ulna, right? Your lower arm. It could affect whatever that inside arm bone is. It could affect your thumb which is my right hand, which is my drawing hand. So they were basically making a point of like, this is a serious injury. You don't want to re-break this. Yeah, our parents were freaking out about it because- They of, were. Of course. Of the, yeah. uh, of the implication that they wouldn't be able to That it could draw. happen. Yeah. And I was actually out filming again with my cast on my arm a week after I got out of the hospital. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, That's when a, you know you really love something yeah. though. You Brad, know, it's like, a, fuck it. A funny memory of Dagan being in the hospital for that is that I remember going- with my mom to see him mm. and my mom went to McDonald's to get him McDonald's and wouldn't get me any. Duh. <laughs> like, cause it was like, no, this is for like, we have dinner at home. Like Dagan's in the hospital. We're getting him like the big Mac meal. And I remember Man. being like, I remember and you were like oh! five years old, six years old. Yeah. Probably six. Yeah. And my, we talk about this all the time. I'm like, why were our parents acting like we had not like, so we don't, frugal. we can't afford. No, Colin, you can't get the $2 Happy meal. I'm going to bring Happy the McDonald's meal. to your brother in the hospital. You should be glad you're not in the hospital. We're going to have fucking <laughs> peas and onions and chicken cutlets tonight, which is great. No, yeah. no, no doubt about it. But when you're a child. McDonald's, yeah. Happy meal is like the best thing. Dude, you that's a form. It. Clearly, that is a form. That might be like one of my 10 earliest memories, which is like what's so funny about it. Yeah. Like, it's like the permanently scarred memories. you, dude. Yeah. The clearly. Happy Meal denial. I remember. Yeah, that's, so hard. that's hard. What about that's you, Brad? Hard. Did you ever get injured skating? No, I, I actually lucked out. I never broke anything. That's I think good. maybe I sprained my ankle, but that was like about it, you know, from rolling it or something. And same with yeah. my brother. Well, my brother got his board, like hit him in the mouth and he had braces and his braces got stuck in his lip. I think that was like Ooh. the most we ever had of like injuries. That's Ooh. brutal. But yeah, we lucked out. We could have got because we did some dumb shit. Of course. Yeah. All skateboarders do. It is luck at a certain oh, point. It's, yeah. <laughs> There's sure. some luck in it. Yeah. Yeah. Pray to God oh, you don't hit a pebble and just die. <laughs> or something like that and i used to go like fucking longboarding down like really steep hills and shit too when i was older and i i luckily never wiped out but i was with a guy who did and fucking ruined his face and had to go to the er right after so i was like all right i think i'm done with that oh that that put you that was it that was kind of well yeah i was like 19 i was like yeah (laughs) i don't know about this isn't it funny though you're just when you're young let's say 16 17 18 and younger you're missing that fear muscle yeah it's just like when i think back to the things i did on a skateboard and and otherwise i would as a as a 50 year old man now i'm like what was i even thinking about yeah in a way, it's fun. It's fun to have those memories, but it just it gives me the it gives me the heebie-jeebies even thinking about it. Yeah, you know, well, because like, now wow, if we I get hurt, a lot of bullets. If we get hurt, everything's fucked now. It's yeah, that's true. Major ramification. You're gonna like, stay. Can't hurt. do your job essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't afford that. Very true. Uh, Colin, I actually wanted to ask you. So there's been rumors for a while about Xbox. I wanted to ask you about this because. You know, Phil last week said, we're going to talk it out. You know, there's the rumors about maybe third party, some stuff. Mm. Now they put out, they're doing a podcast about this. Yeah. How do you feel about this? Do you think this is the correct approach or would you like to see something else from them? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I to me, it reads as like, we have a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> That's and, what I thought. And I don't know that 
that's going to be heartening to a lot of people that care deeply about keeping Xbox games exclusive. I mean, I'm kind of the exact opposite where I'm playing Helldivers 2 right now, which we'll talk about. And mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not very deep into it at all, mostly because it hasn't been operable sometimes when I've got right. to play it. But um, there's a uh, I don't know, there's like a, a, a certain. There's a certain energy, there's a certain positivity to to saying less and having more to say behind um, this facade of a conversation where, um, you know, are we going to have to explain ourselves out of being exclusive when you have a game like Helldivers explicitly multi-platform and doing really well, which makes me want to just have all PlayStation games release on PC at the same time. It's like, why wouldn't we just Mm -hmm. want that? so my mindset about what would upset people in the Xbox space, I guess, is what I'm saying is not it's not something I can relate to because I want to kind of broaden sure. PlayStation's access to the PC market specifically, where I think it makes a lot of sense. I don't think it makes sense but PlayStation games, for instance, for the most part on Xbox, because I think it would make the most sense for PlayStation to put its knee on Xbox's neck, considering mm-hmm. yeah. the situation they're in. So I, I, I don't from a business point, point of view, I don't, I don't know. So. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. That's a kind of a long winded way of answering it. But I just since I can't relate to the major. Problem people are going to have, which is that Hi-Fi Rush is coming to PlayStation. Sea of Thieves is coming to PlayStation, maybe Mm -hmm. Starfield or something like that. Like I've said over and over again, I think that people should get used to the fact that like Bethesda games are going to be day and date, probably games moving forward. Doom, I think, is going to be day and date. I think it's obvious as the day is long that Blades platforms weren't announced because it's going to be on PlayStation 2. So. Um, and I said that since the beginning. So do I, I just think, I just think they need to, <laughs> it's just so complicated. They just have, so, they have so yeah. many problems. Like, I don't know if this wasn't true and we'll see, this is going to play out in a few days. Maybe they're going to come out and be like, ah, fuck you jerk offs. Like nothing's changing, <laughs> That'd you be know, amazing. but like you would, which would be hysterical, but that would be obviously horrible for their brand to, to have done that to it. Like yeah. the fact that they didn't shut it down immediately means they have something to say. The fact that they can't get it out in a press release means that they have to massage it. The fact that they don't want to do a produced video indicates that maybe the fluidity of the conversation indicates that maybe they'll take questions or have some sort of way Mm, to answer things more dynamically. But uh, what they're going to say, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I keep using this idea of concentric circles. Like, I think things that are held by Xbox Studios remain exclusive with the exception of legacy stuff. So I think like Halo and Gears and stuff like that might come over, like the old stuff, Master Chief Collection or something. Right. And then the next circle would be Bethesda and ZeniMax. And I think that stuff's all going to be either day and date or timed from from now on. And then I think Activision is the 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 furthest circle. You are Neptune, as it were. And I think uh, that just remains as it is, which yeah. is which is third party for everything. So I think third that party. that's what they're okay. going to explain. There's this idea that they're going to mess around with Game Pass, which I feel like would be fatal to Game Pass in some way. Um, mm-hmm. The getting rid of the day and date access removes the purpose because then you just have a back catalog rental service, which is great. But that's something that's going to be more interesting to Well, we know on PlayStation side, they have fewer than 20 million people subscribed to those tiers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for Xbox, it's going to be wor- way worse if they get rid of the, the day and date stuff. Yeah, and so I think that definitely. But I do think that they're going to have to start explaining why things like Call of Duty might not show up on Game Pass or something like that. Um, I agree. I'm I'm so anxious to see this because I just feel I don't I'm going to be honest with you and I'm not trying to be a dickhead. I don't really care if the games come over to PlayStation or not. Most of them don't speak to me or I've played them like I I like Gears and I've played Gears. I've played the first three Halo games like there's just not that I don't. It's like whatever, dude. But as an analyst, it's like, damn, we could use a few things to talk about. And it'll be very interesting to earn trophies in Halo, won't it? So. (laughs) <laughs> when you guys say podcast, is it a, is this planned as a one off podcast or a continuing series of podcasts? I think it's a one off. I think it's or a is it on it? there. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it's gonna like be Android. it's just gonna be detailing and outlining yeah. all of this. Yeah. Interesting. Called, uh, called a business update. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Dig, that also reminds me, um, we should probably be getting a direct Nintendo Direct sometime yeah. this month. It's finally cut time. Switch to maybe. Might be a little early for that. I'm thinking summer for that. But mm. we're getting close because I know you're a Nintendo guy. I am indeed. You're thinking you're thinking possibly a summer announcement. Yeah, I think it'll console? be on the fall. I like that. I, I, I don't think it's coming earlier than that. I just yeah. don't know what they're going to do to keep the momentum going between now and then. I'm totally with you on that, Brad. Everybody's yeah. like, it's going to be announced imminently. I 
we were joking around on punching up because I'm going away on Friday. So I figure they will announce something as soon as I leave for Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to do the episode yeah. of Punching Up next week, um, which is possible. You know, right. they def- definitely consider that possibility. But yeah, I'm with you on on announcing. I don't know. There's something we know how old Switch. We know how long Switch has been around, right? There's just something really baller and appealing to me about having this console last for another year. <laughs> like just get, oh, just yeah. having it go right through another year. You know, they'll still make and- software for it. Yeah, for years, probably for like two more years at least. Absolutely. So, so keep why? It going. Oh, dude, longer. I think. Yeah. You, know, you think that. so? Yeah. It's well, probably going to be the best-selling piece of gaming hardware ever when it all said and done. I mean, it's not that far off. I think it's ten million away from. It's pretty close. PS2 from PS2, PS2 at this point. I mean, that's yeah. that's unthinkable. Yeah, that's I mean, it's just totally unthinkable. I I can't believe how Nintendo turned it around. Yeah. Amazing. They really did. Can you imagine? We we were just we. There was all the coffins in the nail, but one. I mean, all the nails in the coffin, but one at during the Wii U. The Wii U is oh yeah, you're finished. Stinky Wii U, yeah, it sucked Stinky ass. Wii U. I hated it. Yeah, me too. There's some great games on it, but it was the most annoying piece of hardware around. I agree. It was clunky and out- it seemed clunky and outdated, even while that was the yeah. contemporary thing. Even it was yeah. like, this is not, this is not right. <laughs> it's not Virtual Boy, but it's not. Yeah. you know, <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not Virtual Boy. Colin, man, what are we going to have to do to get you to try it, Nintendo? Are you going to try the new one when it comes out? Micah's for sure going to get it. She'll get it. Yeah, yeah. I I actually gave my Switch to Ramon um, because I just never played it anymore and I just use hers. When I use Switch, I only use the, I pay for it. Well, I I think I paid for it for the first year. Oh, you played the online? The online, which I think. Okay. The online service is so good that I've said this before, but people are all like crying about it. It's like, dude. It's excellent. It's awesome. What are you, crazy? I I was looking at this thing. This is like. The fucking video store in 1992 or something. This is amazing. <laughs> it's a yeah. lot of value there. Just some of the emulation wasn't good on it, but they've actually fixed a lot. Like Ocarina of Time was bad on it when it first came out, but they, they've updated to make it better. That. So but let me, I at least appreciate that. But let me say this, and this is yeah. this is a fact that doesn't come up often, in my opinion. And I want to I know if you guys can speak to this, is that the thing that bothers me about the Switch when I play virtual console games is it defaults to nonsense button configurations Mm -hmm. that in no way shape or form bear any resemblance to the way the game was played on original hardware and i have no fucking idea how people play the games like that like the games are the buttons are inverted they're they're we i if you try to play like a castlevania or Mega Man or something it's like what the because i was playing wily wars or whatever that 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 genesis port Mm -hmm. and i was like what the fuck is with this button configuration like this is like how is this acceptable to like nintendo fans or did you were you guys around then it's not and and ocarina of time was a major example of that where the only way to fix it is to do it at a system level so yeah. i have to like literally make this weird spoof yeah, account right. with all of this made up button props that don't make any sense outside of the con- outside of the confines of ocarina of time or something in order to make it work yeah. and i'm so shocked that that now i know that that's circumvented by using the classic controller plugins and all of that but yeah it's weird is that not weird to anyone else it's like extremely i, I don't, weird I don't hear anyone talk about that like it, it almost it almost tells tells me that most people playing these games don't know how they felt so they're like oh right. yeah this is the way the game plays and it's like no dude you and inv- you put b and a on the other side of each other on an nes controller and it changes the entire Oh, I couldn't play it. it was. Right. If you handed me yeah. Mario and were like, dude, the only thing about different about this game is that B is A and A is B. Here you go. Yeah. I would be like, I can't right. play. I can't play this. I don't know. I can't do this. You know? And so the the switch is like a is a completely compounded version of that to like the GameCube controller, the N64 controller. It's like this is like this is nonsense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, oh, it bothers me right. so much. Stop letting Nintendo get away with it. They can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> I will call and I'll say as a, a Nintendo fan still long time, and I'm sure Dagan agrees. I'm just so used to getting fucked over by them. It, I'm just numb to it at this point, Colin, and I accept anything that's bad is just how it is. When, when that happens, Colin, I begrudgingly buy like an N64 controller that works on the Switch. Yeah, right. I played Star Fox with like the Pro Controller and it was horrible. I had like a terrible time playing it because it, it's just so bad. But with Nintendo, man, that's just the way it is. Yeah, like no achievements, no nothing. It's it's no, fucking that's another prehistoric thing. on there. Dude, sometimes. the achievements, because you know that they're not doing achievements because people want them to do achievements. They, you, they, you know that that's the reason. <laughs> there, there is were, a I teenage think, child thing going on there. Right, like, like the, rebellious. 
I think it was the 3DS maybe first where I was like, this has to have achievements. And then it was the Wii U. Where I'm like, oh, certainly this is. And then the Switch came out. I'm like, you got to have yeah. achievements on this thing. Right? People are getting all their these hopes years- up for that with the new console. And I'm just like, it's yeah, so I gave even. up. I just gave up, dude. Like, I, if I could get achievements in like a Zelda game, I would lose my mind. It's a very peculiar choice, in my opinion. It really is. And, and it is weird because they do have even thus. You know, those of us in the know for so long, they do have us wishing like, all right, maybe it's going to change this time. That sort of dynamic, that relationship never really changes. The button thing is weird because I always feel like, all right, Nintendo, if you think about it and you try to be reasonable and say, okay, how do we make an excuse for this? They're serving two masters, right? They're serving the OG player and they're serving the young people, right? But even if that was the case, just default to the way it was so the young players could learn because they don't know either way, right? So there was a lot of young players, let's say, currently in their teenage teenage years that don't know how it was to play these NES and SNES games. But if just just do it the old way so you kind of appease everybody, right? That whole thing. And it's definitely not one-to-one. Like I hear that gripe so often that it is definitely something that's generally recognized. And I bet it's more than, you know, even percentage that it bothers more people than it doesn't bother. So then fix it. Yeah, you got to Don't you think you would have these like sub programs would be like, make the switch into an NES, like just total NES controller format. Because again, just inverting A and B, which is the which is the default format means that you can't do like yeah. the thumb roll in Mario. You can't pull, you can't hold down power and, and Mega Man and stuff. like you can't play the game the same way. It's just and it's crazy that people don't know that when they're going like that. There are people that because I would go into some of those games and be like, this shit sucks. You can't play. It's not quite right. Yeah, you would right know now. even as a, yeah. a first time player because it's one of the most famous games of all time or something. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's just Nintendo. They're so genius, like ninety five percent of the time, but they always just fuck up like. Somewhere, just a little bit, just enough to k- keep you remembering that they are if Nintendo and they always be Nintendo. That's just the cycle. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's definitely true. All right. Now, about 42 minutes into this show, mm-hmm. let's talk about what we've been playing. The main focus of this podcast. We're going to start off with Hell Divers 2. Colin, you've been playing this. I've also been playing this, but we've been playing very different ways. You've been mm. playing mostly solo or mm. pretty much solo. I've been playing with yeah. people. So let's hear your thoughts first. Well, yeah. So it's funny. I was going back and researching the original Helldivers because I played it, but not very much. Like I played it for probably 10 hours. I played on Vita. And it was an interesting game from an interesting studio. And I went and looked at my work from IGN and there was a preview I wrote at Gamescom in 2013, having gone hands on with the game and explaining what makes it so interesting. And it's the same stuff that still makes the game interesting. The sequel all these years later, interesting, literally 11 years after I wrote that preview, which is the comedy of how hard it is and Mm -hmm. not hard in that it's like insurmountable, but how there's no there's no leeway. It's not very gamey in some way. It's like if, oh, walk in front of the gun turret bye. oh, walk in front of your friends, you know, your units, friendly units fire, you're going to die. Mm-hmm. get too close to a I was extracting and got crushed by the ship coming out to extract it <laughs> because I wasn't paying attention you know and you can get caught yeah, in the I'm afterburner busted. of it and stuff it's so funny yeah. and I, I'm i very curious about the story behind Helldivers 2 in terms of Arrowhead releases this game PS3, PS4, Vita and then a few months later PC all in 2015 and Sony publishes the game on PC so they're messing around with publishing on PC at that time Mm -hmm. And then there is this idea that I have. It can't be proven, but I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, especially because the CEO of Arrowhead recently said that they they were working on it for like eight years, is that the game was rebooted at some point, the sequel. Because if you go back and look at the original game, it's a very crude top down shooter. It's it's not very crude. It's just a top down shooter. It's it's not unlike something you would see at a house market that time or something. And I feel like at some point, someone very wisely said, "What, what if we made it into a third person shooter that fundamentally changes the entire game because otherwise and and again in just comparing and contrasting to the original experience my memories of it reading about it it's really the same game it's just expanded a little bit and it's much more triple a but i I don't know if you would even call it that 
it's it's double A at the very at the very least. Yeah. And much more expensive. I think Arrowhead went from like 20 or 25 people to almost 100 when they were making the, you know, during the course of making the game. And there was an old leak. So what feeds my idea that this was rebooted was that there was an old leak. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Brad, of a trail, like a piece of a a Hell Divers 2 trailer. It had the old Sony Computer Entertainment stinger on it um, and indicating that it was quite old. And it just never came out. I think they probably just were internally sending it around and they just decided never to do it. And at, at that point, it was rebooted. And I would like to know more about that. Because they spent a lot of time. I don't know if they spent a lot of money. It's probably not an incredibly expensive game to make, but they spent a lot of time and a good deal of money getting this out. And I'm fascinated about how well it's doing on PC. It's not doing Mm -hmm. power world numbers or anything like that, but it's it's cleaning up. And I hope it opens Sony's eyes and in my view to getting all of their games as a service at the very least. And I think they're doing it with, I think they've already announced that they're doing it with Concord. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. I um, think they'll do that with all of them. and fair games. I think will end up being on PC as well. And I think yeah. this is very wise. Like just, just keep catering to that market to keep the game viable, especially with cross play. So from a marketing and, and business standpoint, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. As far as gameplay is concerned, like I said, it's, it's just a third person version of Helldiver, So it really isn't, revolutionary in and of itself it's just fun and yeah. it seems to be very very sticky for people yeah um i don't know if it's been updated or anything like that to get or if they're all there or if they'll ever update it for this but you can't play it by yourself like you can make it as hard as you can to get into your game but you mm-hmm. there's still ways to get around the goalie and for a per, I, so I just have two thousand friends on my friends list because that's the maximum you have, and people just friend me, and I just accept it. I don't mind that at all. Right. I think it's awesome. It's cool to see what people are playing. Like I go to a game, like a big game coming out, like a, a Horizon or something, and it's like you and two hundred and thirty-two other people pre-ordered this or whatever. It's like holy shit. <laughs> so it, it gives you like a good idea of what like PlayStation hardcore people are are uh, are looking at. But the downside with Helldivers too is that there's only options to make your game public or friends only. And so that still oh. gives me 2000 options to get, if they're playing it to get into the game. And I feel like this wasn't that way in the first game. You could just play it explicitly by yourself. And I know it's not made for that, but that's the way I want to experience it. The division wasn't made for that. And I played it like that, like that borderlands wasn't made for that. And I played all three of them by myself. So I don't want to, more recently, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands or even the new Far Cry games that are really made to be played with other people. I play them by myself. That's the way I want to play. You need to make an explicit way and you don't have to change anything else about the game. You can see like this game is literally impossible by yourself. Like once you get to a certain level, I'm Mm -hmm. playing it on easy. There's like, I think there's like you, you unlock the levels by beating them. So I think Mm -hmm. I unlocked like the first one, the second one, and then like the third one. And I think there's 10 and I'm already having Mm -hmm. a hard time extracting at that point, you know, by myself. I'm not asking them to make any changes to the game. I don't care about that. I just want to have the option to play by myself. And what annoys me about having people come into my game is sometimes I've got like a good partner or whatever, but like one guy came into my game and I don't think he meant it on, he obviously didn't mean to do it on purpose, but he like called in something and it ended up landing on me and killing me or whatever, (laughs) which is fine. You just, you just come back anyway. There's just, you have many lives or whatever, but right, right. But what bothered me about it was I was like, I was having fun. I was I was explaining to Micah because she was watching and I was like, this is kind of a bummer. I was mm-hmm. actually kind of in the mode. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm running this planet by myself. I'm, I'm maybe going to get out. I'm kind of doing well. And this guy comes into my game, which is cool, but then accidentally kills me. And that's part of the comedy of the game. I get it, but I'm not looking for that right now. So I hope sure. that they instill, if they haven't already, this ability to just say, like, take my game offline. I know you can't fundamentally remove me from the servers, I'll still contribute to the global galactic campaign and all that, which is totally cool. But I hope that they include that option. And the reason I say I don't know if they did is because the last two times I've gone to play it, the game has been down. So mm-hmm. I haven't gotten nearly oh, wow. as much time with it as I want, because I think that they have been surprised by how many people are playing it. Oh, and, yeah. They and I don't are. know. Like Sony, I'm disappointed in them for that. Like they need to f- fix that quickly. I don't. And it seems like they are being flexible, but the why are they surprised? They never release games. So like you have to expect <laughs> there's just this latent group of people that are going to play whatever you release when you only release select games. Why is that well, such a surprise to people? I think the game 
sales wise did better than anyone expected more than I expected. I was like, Oh cool. Hell divers is sweet, but I don't know how many people are going to play it right off the bat. And it's just become like, you know, the game of the week on steam and on PSN. So it's gone far beyond their expectations. I'm sure the servers are slammed. They're probably trying to get more servers going, but I don't know how much they're willing to invest in it. Cause who knows how long this flash mm. will last. Hopefully for a bit, because I, I know Helldivers had like a dedicated fan base, the original one. So it did, yeah. hopefully it keeps going. But Colin, I totally agree. Like, I think you should be able to just play privately if you want. I'm kind of surprised there's not an option like that right off the bat. Like, I think the point of the game is to play with other people. But if you want to play solo, I think that's totally fine. You should be able to allow it to do that. It seems like a very basic feature. And it's weird that it's missing. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised. I get again, I'm very loath to to come off as asking them to change anything fundamental about their game. I don't really like that. Either things hit for you or don't. And sometimes things are just bad right. and that should be fine. There's nothing bad about it with them mm-hmm. saying, this is a game for other people like to play with other people. That's how you play it. It's very similar to the dialogue about Elden Ring needing difficulty levels or something. It's like, no, I'm not asking you to do anything like that. I just think you should think about why people played the division and borderlands and other games like this and i know that your game is known for its difficulty but let us try to overcome it by ourselves like i'm willing to do the grind to unlock slowly unlock everything i need to make myself more strong but instead Mm -hmm. i often find myself in games with others and i'm not looking for that but i know that that's not going to be a problem for most people that go into the game wanting to and knowing that you should be playing with other people i'm just glad you can automatically mute your mic and not have to deal with yeah Mm. uh jordan allen burton wrote in hey guys my questions are simple how does hell divers 2 single player hold up does it feel like you're missing out or is it too hard? Does it feel like you're missing a major piece of the puzzle? I only ask because like Colin, I'm old and don't really play multiplayer online. So Colin, a lot of people wrote in asking about this because mm. they know you don't play multiplayer very often. Now you alluded to that. You kind of feel like maybe you're not missing out, but it's doable to an extent solo. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, definitely. It, it's not like the division is more than doable solo. You can't do the yeah. dark zone stuff in the division or in the division. I've I've never extracted from the dark zone ever uh, yeah. by myself. And so I've never done anything in the, those areas of the division or the division two by myself. Like you can't do it. But everything in the core game is doable. And same thing with Borderlands and games like that. It's again made to be played with others, but you can play it by yourself. I, I appreciate games that are more balanced towards that, but it doesn't have to be that. Again, that's why I'm right. kind of on the fence of not wanting to be too critical of it for that it's like um, maybe it's just not for you you know yeah i mean i think the critical i think it's fair to be critical about the game just not fucking working in a lot of times because like i tried to play with dustin yesterday and it just was down also for a while we got in later but like some stuff was still messed up and i've you know i've been around the block with many online games and that's just the way it goes a lot of times but it is still just kind of annoying when it happens so i just don't get and i'm sure there are technical reasons and certainly monetary reasons but why companies don't invest in more flexible interchangeable online infrastructure that you can for lack of a better term turn on and off as needed yeah that's part of a greater pool of assets you already own and have control over so you don't have to even wait 12 or 24 hours for contracts to clear and for you to get access to this new bandwidth and all that it just and i'm sure that there are a lot of reasons why that doesn't happen but you would think that problems would eventually stop like there would be a sure. game, a big game that came out and it just worked. And that doesn't seem to really happen too often. Yeah. But it's to your point, Brad, I never interact with these games. So mm-hmm. I am extra sensitive to it because sure. that's not what I'm typically used to when I sit down. It's very unusual for me to sit down in a game and be like, you can't play it. Be like, What yeah. are you talking yeah. about? I can't play it. That's but that's yeah. literally what happened. You know, uh, I think with some companies that have a lot of experience with stuff like this, like Blizzard or something, I remember, you know, World of Warcraft expansions come out. You just couldn't play or something like that. but as time has gone on now you can just pretty much work right off the bat. Like everyone remembers Diablo three's launch and how bad that was Diablo four much better. I think just some studios are more equipped to deal with it financially. Also, I don't know how much, you know, money, how much the budget for this game was or anything like that and experience. So I'm sure they're going to learn a lot from this game and money can help on that side. And I don't know what Sony's given them for money. So hopefully stuff will get sorted though. As it continues on, I assume Sony's going to buy them. So Probably a lot of money, but yeah, I was um, wondering that too. Yeah. If they'll buy them, seems maybe if they're still in that live service direction, they could probably scoop them up pretty cheap right now before they get too big. But yeah, I am curious because they've been working with them for a while, so makes sense to me. But we'll see. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think they're one of only two at this point studios that would make any sense to add to the family at all. Right. With the other being maybe Ballistic Moon, if if that Until Dawn, yeah, you know, remake comes out. Yeah. Um. I guess so. I've been playing the game too. I've been playing from the opposite side. I've been playing multiplayer pretty much the whole time. I played with you know. I played. There's a game where it was me, Dustin, Ben, Locke, and it was just chaotic fun. Like there are really good mechanic wise, like shooting feels really good in this game. Actually, I'm surprising like shredding a bug up with your machine gun is awesome. And that looks fun. That great Starship Troopers vibe, the green blood flowing everywhere. It's really fun. But the chaotic nature of, you know, four people, you can easily accidentally kill each other all the time. It happens just constantly like Dustin got killed a lot. I got killed. Just like fucking drop a pod. Someone's accidentally runs into it and gets stuck crushed like that is a huge part of the game is just this chaotic fun of death being around every corner but like you said it's pretty forgiving in the sense of you know you got a bunch of lives you can call people in i think the mechanic calling of the button inputs to put in commands is so brilliant yeah it's awesome because if you can remember it yeah Yeah. if you can Mm -hmm. memorize it it's great but it's like definitely when you're in a chaotic firefight or something you know you get swarmed by some fucking Mm -hmm. robots or something and you're trying to enter these codes and while everyone's dying around you it's really great pressure that i really love and that's good shit it's yeah it's really good um i do like um the progression kind of in it you know do missions you get stars or whatever or medals to buy unlock new gear and it's not like gear, like stats necessarily going up. You know, you don't get level two of this gun, which or level three. It's just like, no, you get this gun. You get this piece of armor. It's heavy or light, medium armor. It's all very basic. And I really appreciate that. It's not like Destiny, you know, where you're getting like plus two version of a gun or something like that or a better mm. rarity. So I think that's good. And um, I do think Colin, as someone who played the original one, it is really cool playing this one third person. I think that helps sell it a lot to people. I know pl- I know a couple of people actually who didn't like the first one because of its perspective being that like isometric kind of thing. So mm. I think this opens it up to a whole new audience, especially in the era of Fortnite and stuff like that. Third person is just taken off. So I think it's a really good idea. But um, I'm curious to see how the progress or like the long term longevity of this game will continue. Because we know they're going to add stuff later down the line, like they've teased the mechs and stuff like that, and it's all going to be free, apparently. Mm-hmm. So I am really curious to see how this all turns up or shakes out, especially with it is a life service game. And thankfully, a lot of the stuff I've seen, it's very cheap in the game. Like some stuff is like 75 cents, some stuff and other games, it'd be ten dollars easily or five dollars, which we'll get into foam stars later. Some of those mm-hmm. microtransactions. So I think it's been really solid so far. I, I've been having more fun than I thought I would with this game. I think if you're cool with playing people online, you're going to have a really good time. Really fun. But if you're solo focused, like Colin, I don't think you'll get as much out of it. But um, I think it's worth at least dabbling your toes in the multiplayer. And the game's 40 bucks. So that's nice, too. It's not a full price game. That's awesome. So, I know that. yeah, I think Helldivers is really good so far they got to get it stable though so hopefully that'll fit, sort out in a couple weeks or a couple days uh shiny ryuji wrote in hello cbd my question is mainly for colin do you think hell divers 2 is a game left over and greenlit from the sean Layden era it just seems like the marketing for this game was barely there like no dedicated state of play or beta it just seems like the promotion was not there like, why is there why is this not on PS Plus, but Foam Stars is? And why are they releasing two days apart from each other? It's sitting at over 116K concurrent on Steam as I'm typing this. It seems like it was sent out to die, but it's hitting. How do you feel about that? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there there is something to that in the sense. Uh, first of all, I, I'm sure it will, if my theory on it. Well, I don't even have it. It's not even about the theory. They admitted that they were working on it for eight years. So it was yeah. greenlit during wow. the, the laden era. And... I think I observed that on Sacred Symbols that when I saw that Foam Stars was coming to PlayStation Plus two days before Helldivers was releasing, I was like, that's strange because as the arbiters of the marketplace, they don't have to make that decision. That's not a co- that's not a decision that's like, oh, well, can't do anything about this. Uh, Square Enix wants to release this here and Arrowhead and Sony want to release this here. It's like, no, you have control of all the levers. So you made that decision. Mm-hmm. And th- there is a re- legitimate question of why you would do that. I have th- different theories. Some of them are more far flung about this. Like one of them, you could look into it and say like Sony is ex- 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 
conducting an explicit experiment on the PSN, which they often do. We talked about in the Insomniac leak that they intentionally released Horizon Forbidden West on PlayStation Plus after a year to see how much money they would lose by doing it. And that they lost like something like $70 mm-hmm. million dollars or something. So they do these really weird things on PSN that make no sense to see what happens. And maybe they did want to see like, what would happen if we had a free to play multiplayer game on PS plus, and then we released our own thing at the same time. I have no idea because again, it's not just a choice that's made outside of those walls. Sony clearly has money invested in foam stars. It's probably part of a greater package with square Enix to get access to the final fantasy games. Mm-hmm. and comes part and parcel with games like Forspoken. So that they're just kind of absorbing some of these bombs. But I I do think that the lack of preview coverage, no state of play, and key, I think key is no beta. I, I don't right. understand. That, that indicates to me that the game was like not ready until very recently and went gold kind of late. And I actually don't know. I haven't looked at when it went gold. I'm sure they announced when it did, but... um maybe they just weren't ready to go or they just weren't confident in it. Sometimes companies misread public publishers, misread things all of the time. And the example I like to use often is that the last of us in 2013, uh, internally reviewed at an eight and that's catastrophically wrong. Mm -hmm. And when you, and when you have, because it's more like in 96, 97 or something like that. And I gave it a 10 and a lot of people did. And that had, especially in the more retail centric uh, situation, like, you know, the PS3 was in where, you know, you're under ordering and people aren't ordering the proper amount of games and you're not doing the right amount of marketing and coverage. This game just seemed to be ignored to the point where it was peculiar why, especially with such a dearth of games coming out from them, that they wouldn't have had an event. Right. And had like Bethesda and ZeniMax and Microsoft had people out to play, um, to play Redfall and <laughs> they know that that game's bad. They knew. And yeah. they don't invite anyone to come play Helldivers with some notice, like an ability to play it a few months ago to have an open or even a closed beta. I'm sure that they might have even had a closed beta and we just didn't hear anything about it. But I don't know. It is strange. And I think a lot of people agree with that. And it makes you wonder mm-hmm. how they're going to. Well, it doesn't actually make you wonder. You can see already like Stellar Blade is getting a lot more attention. It's a similar situation. It's a second party game. Sony owns it. It's a studio that they don't own and it's getting a lot more love already. And I think even rise of the Ronin, like I would expect that that would probably get its own state of play too, but it's a good observation that it, it uh, didn't get its own state of play. And it's an obvious observation that they chose to release it and foam stars two days apart. So, yeah, well, I think they don't believe They didn't believe in foam stars at all. I think there was some kind of deal, like you were saying, like a package deal, maybe to keep rebirth, you know, on PS5 only for a little bit and all that kind of stuff. Who knows what kind of deals they got going on. But I could have, like, I think Helldivers is clearly the better game, but I don't think they thought it was as good as as it was. Probably like you were saying, like internal testing. I don't Mm -hmm. think they'd expected nearly this kind of reception for the game. They they also, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, bro. No, no, no. I was just going to say, like, I don't understand why they did Foam Stars and this game two days apart. Like, they are very different games. But if you want people to like focus on your game that just released, you got to give it like a week at least. This was like when Square Enix was releasing like games days apart from each other a couple of years ago or whatever. It's like people aren't going to play these games because they're playing other games first. And P- like PS Plus wasn't going to same foam stars no matter what. No matter what, people were already written that game off as a Splatoon ripoff. So. But Helldivers, I just think, is way more successful than they believed in. And I'm thrilled for Arrowhead, but I think you're right on a lot of your analysis on this kind of game. So. They, also, they also just don't have a lot to, to be, you know, I don't want to give Sony <clears throat> too much credit because I think that they they are fucking up the, the server situation and, right. and all of that. But they don't, this is part of the experience of making games like this. Like they don't even know what to expect. When you really think mm-hmm. about it, they haven't released a game a multiplayer like a multiplayer centric game in in years it, really since games like uh kill strain and drawn to death during the mid ps4 era where they were really and a lot a lot of duds like that obviously shadowfall had a really robust online ecosystem mm-hmm. at launch on ps4 but you have to go back even to socom and mag like they just don't right. they don't have that repeated experience so they probably just don't really know what they're doing right now so it's probably a pleasant surprise no doubt but the lack of 
calibration on how they judge these games is because they don't make them. So right. uh, it's probably a new experience from that. And they probably won't have be snuck up on like this again. And in, and in fact, might be too bullish and few, like they might release yeah. fair games and be like, well, fair games is obviously going to be fucking huge. Yeah, that's what I'm worried. You know, some so you can't like predict some success of just overnight. All it takes, Colin, is one big streamer to play your game and people will be all over it. Don't I know it? We're waiting for that big streamer to play Hybroxia 2 available now on PS4 and PS5, Xbox One, Xbox I need to play Series, that, X and S, Switch. I haven't played any of your guys' games. I should play those. Oh, we can send you codes. I'm sure we have. No, you don't got to send me it. I just need to play them. I'm curious about them. Thanks. I I'm think really they're, I, they're always on sale, too. You know, so. Yeah, oh, OK. Just, yeah, yeah. So you can go you can go get good deals depending on. I think like Twin Breaker is like 80 percent off on Steam right now. Oh, Steam shit. Deck certified, I think. So nice. you guys don't control the cadence of when those things go on sale or not. Uh, no, we do. Sometimes there you get kind of like invitations. Well, on Steam, okay. you can put things on sale whenever you want. Right. With the, oh. with the platform holders, it's a little different where you can. You're basically invited to, to like events like this is the PSN event hmm. or the digital download event or under ten dollar event or whatever. And then there are other rules like you can't you're not necessarily allowed on those closed gardens to be able to cut out, cut your own price. Basically, you have to yeah. when you pitch your game, you pitch your price and stuff like that. You, I don't think they hmm. ever push back, but it's not like a given. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Dagan, man, have you seen any of Helldivers? Does yeah, it look interesting the to you? gameplay footage looks so much fun. I mean, you <laughs> said Starship Troopers, Brad. It looks. Oh you yeah. Know, there, when now? When did the first Helldivers come out? 2015. 20. Yeah. All right. So it's been it's been almost 10 years. I I'm yeah. I'm a third person perspective guy, so I like that, and I, I I think it looks really fun, and I like the atmosphere. The game looks like it has mm -hmm. really cool atmosphere. I could see it being really it immersive. Not a yeah. I'm like Colin. I'm not a multiplayer guy, but I think this kind of game might tempt me, but just because it sounds the chaos actually sounds kind of inviting. You know, yeah. that sounds kind of like a fun component. Yeah, it's one of those games where like, if you die, I don't think it's a big deal at all. Like I think about like when I played some online games with other people, like MMOs or something. You know, you're in a dungeon with people. You're like, fuck, I don't want to die. I don't want to like <laughs> let my team down. Right. But in this game, it just kind of feels like. Man, who gives a shit? Everyone's dying. It's People expected flying all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So I like it's that. pretty loose in that way. So I do appreciate that about it. And that price tag is pretty inviting too. What do, yeah, you, what I do think you guys it's a, know about that eight year development cycle though? That sounds uh, like a lot. Like maybe yeah. it was like a stop and start type thing. Yeah. I think Colin's right. They probably rebooted it at some okay. point. Yeah, that's what I was saying oh. earlier was that they were as I understand it, they rebooted it away from like yeah. a, an immediate, yeah, like top down or isometric because again it was much more of an, a house mark style game and it is a shame I, i'm not so in isometric games i do prefer total top down if i'm going to get anything like a more of like a super stardust hd or okay. a dead nation or something like that but there's something that for some reason that just turns turns some people off or it looks a little cheaper i think especially today that would have been a huge mistake hell divers 2 would have been irrelevant if yeah if they I did agree. that so i think someone along the way yes yeah, said like let's dump some money and time into this and do it again mm -hmm. and yeah so that's that's um that's that good investment all right boys so final fantasy 7 rebirth had a state of play don't worry listeners i'm not going to talk about what was in the state of play because <laughs> i know colin doesn't want to know either um i loved remake i know you colin you loved it mm -hmm. dagan have you are you have you played it yet yeah we're playing it now for knockback Okay, so that's I'm right. I'm just in, I'm only maybe six or seven hours in. Okay, yeah. cool. So there was a demo that came out for this game. It's the beginning of the game, I assume, because Pro your progress carries over, which I think is a cool idea that Square's been really doing a lot, yeah, especially like with Final Fantasy 16. You know, here's like two hours of the game. First two hours of the game carries over if you like the demo. So I think that's really cool. I did play the demo twice, in fact. And I was very impressed with what I played. Colin, you're going to lose your shit, by the way. <laughs> I cannot wait for you to play this game and hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about like I'm excited. any of the story stuff. But um, Colin, you'll know where the, what the demo is pretty much. I'll just say it's it's the flashback. It's the beginning of the game. So everyone knows that. And it is really great just going through this world again with these characters, getting to see different sides of characters like I said, I remember when I reviewed Remake way back in the day and I was like, they made the characters perfect. How they interpret all the characters is like flawless. And 
continues once again. Everything is just masterfully executed. Performance mode runs good, Colin, at 60 frames, pretty Excellent. much locked. Excellent. It looks like um, semi blurry, you know, the resolution, but I believe the demo is an older build from like September. So it'll probably be polished up quite a bit. And you know, I'd, I always prefer higher frame rate. I'm willing to take a graphics dip. But it has 30, 4K if you're into that. So everyone's yeah, satisfied. 1080p is fine for me at this point. I think it's 1440p. Nice, that's I even think, better. But it might go up and down depending on the situation, kind of like 16 did. Um, but man, they have made so many improvements to combat this time around. It is staggering how much better I think it is. One thing, Colin, you'll probably remember is playing through Remake is the air combat is kind of iffy. On some of the things like enemies flying in there, like mm. launching T for a cloud for there is kind of not great all the time. Well, they made it so at least with cloud, because you could play as you can't play as a lot of characters in the demo, but cloud is one of them, and um you can do air attacks anytime now by doing like a dodge roll and holding score. He'll go up there and start attacking people. So you can plan it out more accordingly, and you could also do like your special moves up there, like braver. And stuff like that. So it immediately takes care of that issue. Those and remake way nice. more. Cool. There's synergy moves now with characters. So the beginning is Cloud and Sephiroth. You get to play Sephiroth, by the way. And That's... he feels exactly how he should. Elegant, graceful, but extremely powerful. And um, you can do moves together. With, they're called synergy abilities. And you can do these anytime you want. So and depending on who you have in your party and who you're playing as, they will be different. I love that. So, like, if you're playing as Cloud, you do one with uh, Sephiroth, he can charge up Cloud's, like, Buster Sword and give it some, like, a huge purple beam around it, and he can do, like, a really heavy, strong attack. Or there's one, if you're playing as Sephiroth, you can do a counter, and Cloud and him will do, like, a counter move at the same time, which is great. But they also added... They're essentially, like, double limit breaks, I would say. Like, the Synergy movies are more like dual techs, from Chrono Trigger, stuff like that. But these are like double limit breaks, man. And they are flashy as hell. They are so great. Like you think about 16, some of the choreography they got going on in there. It's just chef's kiss. These animations you see going oh, on there. I love it. Cloud I love and Sephiroth back to back. The their fl- swords like going. It's just like fucking That's so cool. Peak fanfic right there. And it looks so, gr- so good, dude. You know, Square Enix has always been flashy with their visual presentation. But man, they still... They still got it, and I love seeing that kind of stuff. It's like playing Avon Children. That's kind of what we're getting to now, and it feels like it, and it's so yeah. damn good. Good point, Brad. But, um, yeah, I don't want to talk about like a lot of the story in there because I want to, I know a lot of people are don't know what's kind of going on, but there is a lot of great subtle nods, especially if you've played the older ones, which is super important, I think, to getting the most out of the story. There's a lot going on there. I think if you enjoyed Remake, you're in for a hell of a ride. Remake almost feels kind of like a warm up now when I look back at it after playing Rebirth. Just the amount of flexibility and the amount of exploration you can do now, it's staggering how much more there is. So that was only the first part of the demo. There's also going to be another demo later down the line that's kind of in a more open area, the more open outworld area, so people can run around and get a feel for that because this one is seamlessly open world now. And I actually played some of that back in September. So people are going to get this part of the demo. And it's great because you get to play as Red 13. You get to play as all these other characters. So it's really awesome. That's going to come like a week before maybe 7 or Rebirth comes out. So, man, if you're a Final Fantasy fan right now, you are eating so good. Final Fantasy is so like the stronger it's been in a very long time. I think with like 14, 16, 7, they're killing it right now. Like... Those PS3 days of the 13 trilogy, it's over, dude. We've moved <laughs> on. Square's Square's back right now with yeah. Final Fantasy Lease, and it feels so good. Very powerful. I think they're back yeah. in a lot of ways. I'm I'm proud well, of them. I they are it. in a lot of ways, and they take a lot of missteps, I feel like, too. Especially yeah. with their smaller games they fucked up a lot on. Well, certainly, I think their new strategy, you know, folding... Tokyo RPG mm-hmm. Factory, which I was sad to see. I was very bummed about that. Yeah, me too. Although I, I, I liked all three of those games. It's, yeah, you, I, they're not I know great. that. I, yeah, they're not great, but I like them and I appreciated them. I, I think I Am Setsuna is an arguably top 10 JRPG of all time. And then I think the other two, I didn't beat either of them, but I, I, I wasn't drawn into them in the same way. Okay. I think I Am Setsuna is one of the most emotional and strange 
games I've ever I've ever played. Like played I, it just captured me so deeply. Um, yeah, I think Lost Sphere is maybe a little. It's more involved, I would say, combat wise, because you get like the mechs and all that stuff. But I could see people not being as into it. I've finished all three of them, and I liked all three. But Setsuna definitely had more of an impact because it was the first of its kind. Mm-hmm. And you know the unique, the snow setting, the music, like the pianos, pretty much the whole soundtrack. Yeah, I think it has more unique stuff like that. But yeah, it's, um, it's incredibly sad. But I think you're generally generally right that they've it's disappointing to see their strategy kind of spelled out in their quarterlies and stuff about wanting to make bigger bets on on fewer games and get kind of they were one of the only companies for two generations that were really exploring the middle ground Mm -hmm. that's much more worn now but when you think about like think about their deep experience with releasing vita games and all of the the random spinoffs like dragon quest builders or um Right. Like all the the weird chibi Final Fantasy games. And I don't know. <laughs> I just the Dragon Quest spinoffs and Kingdom Hearts spinoffs. And it's cool that they were trying to do things. And I think that they just got a little bit ahead of themselves. I, I'm, I'm bummed that on the tail of getting something, which I'm sure is awesome, but I have not played it yet, which is Star Ocean and and Live a Live or Live Alive or Live Alive live, or whatever. Live Alive. Um, and other games like that, and of course the the upcoming mana game and and all of the rest. I just hope that this isn't the last gasps of them doing this and kind of getting stuff from their catalog out, and they're not going to do it anymore. And I feel like that's probably yeah. what's going to happen, and that bums yeah. me out because mm-hmm. they have such an awesome and a, a deeply untapped back catalog of games. Between just thinking of the Enix stuff that they got in the merger alone, that hasn't been re released. Some of that hasn't been localized at all. You're talking about a series of games from Quintet and treasure and all of this shit it's like dude you should be bahamut lagoon and even games from square soft as well and Mm -hmm. other things like get those things translated and out and i feel like maybe the only thing that they got from the any other direction was something like final fantasy or or what was it final fantasy pixel remaster i was gonna call origins which Mm -hmm. apparently did really really well for them and I'm, i'm super happy about that but i hope that they're not scared away Though I think they have been already from side projects. Yeah, Yeah. I totally agree. I think they just should just be more focused because it did feel like they would kind of rapid fire these games out a lot of the time, especially like uh, the Dio Field Chronicle and Valkyrie Elysium Mm. came out like two days apart from each other. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, there was that doing that. There was that I want to play both of those, but I can't. Yeah, there was that one. uh, We did it on Sacred Symbols like that was that one run of like four months where they released like 19 games. Yeah, it's like <laughs> just too much stuff. Just have it more focused. I think they'll be more successful and probably better games, too. Uh, let's see. Brad Felix wrote in, gentlemen, with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth on the way, I have begun my virgin playthrough of Final Fantasy VII original. Having been an N64 kid, I missed it when it came out all those years ago. Mm. I am nearing completion and confirm it de- deserves all the praise that it receives. A truly fantastic title. My question to you guys. What town slash event slash et cetera are you most looking forward to seeing brought to life in Rebirth? Personally, I cannot wait to see Cosmo Canyon and all of the mini games. All the best and cheers to the new best show on LSM. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so, Dig, and you haven't finished Remake yet. So no. You still got a lot of good stuff Not to experience. Not even close, yep. But Colin, I know you finished it. What are you looking forward to? Um... I mean, there's a lot. It, it, first of all, the stuff stuff that w- isn't in it that I haven't seen yet, I'm excited about. Like, I haven't been to, I haven't seen Yuffie yet mm-hmm. and all of that, so I'm excited to get there. But well, you haven't I, played the DLC, right? Yet, yeah, or yeah, did I, you? I haven't played, I never played the PS5 version, so that's what I'm going to oh, do in the coming, okay. in the coming okay. days. Because I only, I played it back on PS4 in 2020. Okay, got it. Um, And I loved it there, but yeah, I don't even, so the the Yuffie stuff I'm excited about in and of itself, but stuff that's going to be in the second one. I mean, I, Cosmo Canyon is a good choice, but isn't the, this would be like the forgotten capital, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. that's going to be interesting. And I mean, it's kind of a lame choice, but I'm very fascinated by this place from just how influential I think it was on other games, which is Gold Saucer. Mm. That's Um, not a lame choice. That's the best choice, Colin. Yeah. I like that choice. In my opinion, We've discussed this on Sacred in the past, and there, Dustin's a huge role playing game nerd, so he can get into the conversation deeper. I don't know how Chris feels about it, but I feel the Gold Saucer is one of the most important, like, additions to a game that that 
it was the first time I played a Japanese role playing game in sequence where I was like, oh, there's like an entirely different component here. It's not like Final Fantasy VI mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, here's the Colosseum, and that's right. kind of the place you go, or you know, other games like that, Wild Arms or something, where it's like, oh, go fight the optional bosses and get the best weapons or whatever. This was like an entirely different space that you could totally get lost in for dozens of hours and i did and i mean i want to see how i saw some of it like i saw some footage of like the the motorcycle thing and i want to see the snowboarding Mm -hmm. and all that i want to see how if it all translates i'm very very interested in it and i want to know i'm fascinated that people even want to play this stuff without having played final fantasy 7 the original one but there are a lot of people that do and a lot of people that take umbrage yeah that's so interesting yeah like where i like bust balls about that where i'm like i have no idea what you're doing or whatever why you would do that there are people it, yeah it's exactly <laughs> but also it's like you don't know what to compare it against right which is fine it doesn't matter whatever do what you want but i i think people that didn't play the original i'm very curious to see how gold saucer feels to them because it's probably mm-hmm. gonna be instead of like the beginning of a trend maybe the fulfillment of a trend and sure. not realizing that it's like full circle in some way between the two yeah. two games and in a lot of ways that's kind of symbolic of final fantasy 7 and final fantasy 7 remake which are really parallel products in and of themselves anyway and yeah. dude let me just say this i can't fucking wait to play this game final <laughs> fantasy 7 remake was so good it had no business being so good it had no business being so fun and so deep and emotional it had no business fucking around with the story with like it did it had no business right. doing a lot of things and yet I was done with it and I was like, wow, this is, this is absolutely exceptional. You know, like th- this is, mm-hmm. I can't, and especially with the, them cyber connect working on it originally and like them pulling them off of it. I, I, Cause I remember, I remember being so down on it. That was during the PS. I love you, I guess, era mm-hmm. of podcast when I was like, dude, this game's going to fucking suck. You know, like you got, you have cyber connect working on it. So Square Enix doesn't even care enough about it to make it inside and they fixed it. And it's dope and i have i have the i know people that i'm sure you do too i know people that have it and Mm -hmm. sounds promising sounds real good yeah so Uh, yeah yeah dagan you did play the original of course so yeah man like what what are you looking forward to seeing you don't know what's coming no but like what what would you like to see i know i'm missing that space in between to compare it against yeah But just for me, like even dating back to the original and that experience and the hype building up to that experience, like it was so huge. Like, yeah, you know, ads on the side of buses, huge. You know, it was really the it was really the breaking of JRPGs into North America. Although, of course, it happened earlier for us gamers, for the masses. It was just an event. And you know what? Just. The fact that the game did all of that justice. To me, it just comes down to the characters. Like, this is my favorite cast of characters in any, probably any video game, let alone JRPG. Like, I just love this cast of mm-hmm. players. And I, I, I want to, and small and large, like everyone from Cloud down to Vincent, like I'm obsessed with every one of them. So oh, yeah. I just, I, I'm excited to be back in that world again. And then, of course, the whole steampunk thing and, how much it reminds me of my favorite favorite cyberpunk stuff, yeah. you know, and just the world totally. building. Like I remember, even in the original Gold Saucer, just felt like that Blade Runner esque. It made the it made the world feel so big. Like, yeah. wow, what is going on in this place? Yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah, man, and you're just at the start. Oh, I'm oh lucky you, Dagan. I know. I'm, je- right I'm jealous the of this guy playing the original for the first time, but I am fortunate that I'm, I'm just you know, experiencing remake for the first time, even though it's been what, four years or something? Almost yeah. four years? Dig. Yeah, it came out in 2020. Key question. Mm. Final Fantasy Seven remake question. We'll get more into this when we talk about it on our show, but best girl. Tifa mm. in the Final Fantasy Seven remake. Tifa, Aerith, or Jesse. I'm gonna g I gotta I've always been a big Tifa mark. I'm gonna go Tifa. Hmm. But I like how you? different everybody is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, what what you mean? I like that there's a there there's a certain flavor for everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm Team Jesse all the way. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I would say everyone I've talked to at Last Stand has been unanimously Team Tifa. Yeah. So you are the one so far, Colin. Yep. Jesse's a great pick, though. Yeah, I, I, I like Jesse. I don't think Dagan's there yet, but there's a chapter that revolves around her. I don't know if you. Okay. And I I think it's really awesome. Like, yeah, plays a big it's good. Um, and. Yeah, like 
I don't know. I, I think it's just so I can't wait. I'm actually going to start playing it in the coming days. I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I want to play Banishers, uh, which I pre-ordered and that comes out tonight. Um, and I'm still kind of working through Grand Blue for some reason. And uh, yeah, I'm curious why you're still playing that. Hell, Di- yeah, I'll, I can get into that. And Hell Divers, obviously. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm a little distracted now. And then Pacific Drive, I think, is coming out soonish. Yeah, which I really want to play. So getting a little fucking a crowded, but I got to make room for Final Fantasy VII Remake and Final, yeah. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth just takes precedent. And I just love, I really, really, really loved the experience having played Spider-Man in 2018 and then Miles Morales in 2020. I loved playing them back to back and then playing Spider-Man 2 immediately. I think I got mm-hmm. the most out of Spider-Man 2 that way. If I Actually, I was laughing because I was like, if I, if I didn't do that, I would have been like, oh, I don't even know what the fuck. <laughs> and, and, you know, that was like so many games ago. And so I know th- I'm going to get the same thing out of Final Fantasy VII Remake, which I just don't. That was so many games ago. I just don't. Yeah. I don't know if you're similar, Brad, but I don't retain very much about like the further I get, unless it's a really iconic game. So, like, for instance, I could walk you through Bioshock. Sure. In my in my head, like I could tell you, like, this is happens and then this happens and then this happens and then you go here. It's like. But most games, I'm like, I don't even know. It's, it's, it's sometimes like when I watch a movie and I'm like, I haven't seen this movie since I was like 10 or 12 and I watch it. I'm like, I don't remember this at all. So yeah, the retention sure, is I don't. Low. So I don't know yeah. if that's just me, but I, I don't I mean, retain like an incredible amount about the games I play. I just kind of churn through them. You know? Sure. I can understand that. I think you always lose something over time, no matter what. But I think some key elements will stick with you. <laughs> Funny example is Colin Kingdom Hearts. Hell of a lot going on in that universe. The story. When I am playing through those games, everything makes sense to me. I got it. I'm all in there. Once I'm done with them, though, I forget a lot of the details. So I think that's just pretty normal. That's that's your brain trying to excise all of those dark thoughts from your mind so you don't marinate on them too much. No, no, no. Those are <laughs> thoughts of light, my friend. About who was who was it? Uh, Donald Duck has like the most powerful spell in Square Enix history yeah, he, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, fuck yeah, he does. <laughs> I didn't know your ass. You can't tell me that Donald Duck and Goofy being your party members isn't the tightest thing around. That is, those are the coolest party members you could ever have, Colin. Yeah, you got Orange County brain for sure. One day you will learn. (laughs) One day you will learn. You got to take the leap, my friend. I've known people like you many such cases. I never thought of the Anaheim you know connection. Yeah, there. There's something to that. I mean, Disney's dumb all the time. I think a lot of Disney <laughs> stuff sucks ass. But Donald Duck and Goofy are pure. There's no corruption there. They haven't I, they haven't been wrung dry completely yet. They I still think, got something going on. I think Dagan's theory about Bert and Bert and Ernie about or no, no, it wasn't about Bert. It was about someone else about it. They're quiet. Their quiet is what betrays their darkness. Is yeah, that was what Mario. I get out of. I get out of early characters like Disney characters like that, where I'm like, you're a little too mysterious. Like we don't know, we know you well, but we don't really know anything about you. Like you've just been mm. kind of around. Like you're part of the furniture, but who are you, Donald? Yeah, there's something shady. What is going, going on, on with you? Where do you come from? Why are you around? What purpose? Because yeah, they were serve? just a vehicle for singing and dancing and stuff, right? You know, or having well, like he's a, a propagandist. A then, if that's the case, he's just a propagandist. If that's all he's around yeah. for, is like, oh yeah, just sing and dance. Here's a fun. They hand him, you know, Walt Disney hands him some fucking sheet music. Hey like, man, he- they got <laughs> fucking Goofy's got a kid. You know, they got Goof Troop. There's that's some right, lore Troop. down there. That's true. Duck Tales. I was going to say, Brad, it's around kind of in that cool. too. Donald it's cool Duck Tales. Okay, it, how does he relate to them? Who's uncle that? Scrooge. That's his oh, uncle. Scrooge, and right. Huey, Dewey, and Louie are his nephews. Yeah, right. Somebody's missing in that whole DuckTales equation. You yeah, wait a minute. Suspend your disbelief. I don't think they show his dad or anything like no, that. No, no. Wait, so uncle, like whole... Scro- uncle Scrooge. Donald, who, so who is Donald? Donald Duck? Those mm-hmm. kids are Donald Duck's kids? No, those are no, his No, no, nephews. no, no. Those are his nephews. But I thought they were the nephews of Uncle Scrooge. The, 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 they all call him Uncle Scrooge, Uncle but I'm Scrooge. pretty sure it's Donald's uncle. They're so Donald's Donald siblings. and Scrooge, so they're brothers. Okay. And so whose right. kids are those? Some off-screen Donald siblings kids. And that's established. I don't yes. I have a, no idea. I'm going to look Donald Duck's family tree. I'm looking this shit up right now. <laughs> There's people missing, like key people yeah, missing. Yeah, they keep from people the out because they don't want to give you, they want to keep some stuff mysterious. You know, Who's it's having like sex team, with the rooster? It's like a, t- it's like a team eco <laughs> game, Colin. You don't, they're not going to tell you everything. All right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. You know they what, though, like, Brad? Do you go back, like, does your fandom go back to the Carl Barks comic books and stuff? Because no, that's all what no, informed no. the 90s. TV I show. just watched DuckTales when I was growing up in okay. Goof Trip, you know, because I, I was Goof like the perfect age for that kind of stuff. Disney after school 
Because I was going to say, it's so yeah. cool to see a younger guy so reverent about such classic characters that like I'm even too old. Like I'm even too way too oh, young. Oh, I'm not, I'm not young, Dagan. I'm 36, dude. That's young. That's young. I feel like fucker. that's young. But Listen you guys did test. have that whole renaissance in the 90s yeah. with everything on TV. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Tales, Tales Dagan, this is way You're, so, you're a, but, a, but a boy, but a young boy. Yeah, you're a boy. Well, you're only like three years older than me, Colin, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a young boy. To, I'm just a boy. I'm just, well, but a young boy. We got, we got fucking lad. Chris and Dustin who are like preteens, essentially. Yeah, they are in this group. Yeah, they say yeah. things like, "I'm like," and Micah. Oh yeah, Micah, yeah. the same thing. Where I'm like, "You weren't even, you weren't even around for like, what do you know?" Just with a consternation, and judgment. You know. <laughs> yeah, this is too much. I'm not looking at all this fucking Ducktales. Oh my god! Right yeah, now. it's there's got to be a lot. It's, there's a lot. There's people yelling at us right now for I don't, sure for not knowing this. Dude, well, if you're getting mad at me about DuckTales lore, get fucked, dude. Listen, <laughs> I don't care. Listen, he, here's the thing about this. If you, I'm going to posit this. If you know the answer to this question, that's fine. But you have got to have known your own genealogy too. In other words, if you put this energy into understanding the fictional dynamics of the genealogy of the ducks in the Disney right. world, and you don't, and I ask you like, oh, what are you? And you're like, I don't really know. It's like, that's completely mm-hmm. unacceptable. You need to put that energy into something. <laughs> no, I love that. You know, you. it's like the whole, I, love um, I think so, the website Something Awful used to do the thing where it was like Wikipedia page for real thing, Wikipedia page for a fake thing. So it would be, and but they would be similar. So that's it'd be cool. like, you know, the moon. And then it would be like the moon in some sci-fi thing and the moon sci-fi Wikipedia would be like 10 times longer than the, mm. the, the real Wikipedia. I'd always love that shit. Oh, dude, People I love the, the I love the nerdiness of knowing DuckTales heritage and origins, but not your own. I'm, I'm here for that all day. I hope there's people out there listening <laughs> don't know where they came from. But like, oh, Carl Barks invented Donald's sister in 1932 in this yeah. you know, issue three. <laughs> Dig, you know all these answers. You know, the that's the thing is you're doing the voice, but that's you. Yeah. Yeah, you're the animation master. There's something missing though. Like Donald has a sibling. I don't know if it's a brother or a sister, where Huey, Dewey, and Louie come from. By the way, guys, let me give you a little quiz right now. Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Give me the colors. Uh I think Huey's red, Dewey's yep. blue, Louie's green. Yeah. I'm proud of you, Brad. Yeah, I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known. That. You know how I know that? Right. It's from fucking Kingdom Hearts, Colin. Because you know, oh, in they're the in game. Kingdom Hearts? Yeah, they're there, man. They're Uncle Scrooge there? is there too. Holy yeah, cow. man. You know how I know that? Huey Lewis is red. I don't know why. Dewey is blue, like Morning Dew. Yeah. And Louie is the last one. That's green. That's how I know it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that how is I insane remember logic, it. but I like it. It's it insane. works every time. You're like, it, it's red, like the shades of Huey Lewis's 1983 record sports. <laughs> He's a rock star. <laughs> or <I don't> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> he drives a red Corvette. I don't yeah. know. That's yeah. funny. One day I'll get you. One day, I'm da- dude, I'm Colin. down. I mean, I'm, I'm in a very role playing game mood. Yeah. The last few months, which I'm not always dude, they're, in. They're pretty short, too, man. Some or at least the early ones are. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day. All, it's all a in one I mean, collection, dude. It's all in one. It's all there. I think I own it because I think we. Oh, no. You know what? I own Kingdom Hearts three, I think, because I we Chris and I played it back in the day and did a video. OK. Where you we, guys played. Oh, days. you did? Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was a demo, but I think it was the full game. Yeah, because we, we yeah, did a few we did a few let's plays no back in the day. Any. But a Square Disney collaboration. Now, how long ago did the first game come out? Remind me. Two thousand eight here in the States, two thousand two. Yeah. Okay, so this is thirty two year old Dagan. No, that can't be right. Is that right? No. Thirty two, no. Twenty nine. Right. Do the math. Twenty nine year old Dagan. Still in my twenties. Weeb dating back to the eighties. That Square Disney collaboration sounds like a dream, but there's something about those character designs that really bothers me. It's not all dreams are good dreams, Dave. Just yeah. really bothers. They change over time, Dave, and fear not. The shoes get smaller as time goes on. Okay. Isn't, that some, right. isn't there some weird story about how that deal happened in an elevator or some weird Yeah, shit? that's like the, the story everyone says. I don't know if that's true or not. It was like a Disney and Square executive in an elevator or some, something. I don't know if that's true, though. Interesting. But, elevator yeah. pitch. Yeah, the classic yeah. elevator pitch. Yeah, I just yeah, that's a and I think Kingdom Hearts. You would know this better than me, Brad. Probably is that's probably one of the last SquareSoft games, like that was published. Yeah, mm. probably. Yeah, definitely. The end which of an is, era, man. Yeah, because I remember that. That's on that old logo is on the box, which, mm-hmm. which I remember, which is cool. 
a different time. Great box art. Different time. Yeah. Hell of a different time. All right, Dagan. You've been playing Link's Awakening, dude. Mm. The Switch version, right? Yep. The remake. Tell me about this. Tell me a little about your history with Zelda also. Oh, sure. Yeah, man. I mean, so yeah, I've been playing the 2019 remake, ground up remake of Link's Awakening for the Switch. And uh, I mean, the whole origins of me talking about this game today is I think about this a lot. Like my podcasting, my first five years or whatever of podcasting, I never did a conventional straight up video game podcast. So whenever we played a game for one of the shows, if we were playing something retro for knockback or something, I've always had the luxury of playing one game at a time, which really makes me it makes my head spin thinking about what you guys do for a living in playing so many games so frequently, juggling multiple games at a time. I never really did that. That was always kind of my style of game playing, even dating back to being a kid. I would just play one game at a time, really savor it, take my time with it traditionally, and then get through and then move on to the next one. So it was always a one at a time type thing. Since we started punching up the Nintendo podcast last year, I try to play multiple games only because we go bi-weekly and I feel some kind of responsibility to keep it moving as far as, let me talk, I don't want to keep talking about playing the same game over and over. So conventionally now I'll have two games going at once, which is even kind of weird for me. But then in doing, especially the Nintendo podcast, not to mention Knockback, I try, I have a huge, I mean, my video game backlog is a lumber yard. <laughs> like it's, it's totally ridiculous. So there's always, it's always building. It's always kind of like, it's a little bit of like two steps forward, one step back, but it's really not. It's one step forward, two steps back with my backlog. It's always just building. I can never really catch up. And so when we were closing out, So that's kind of the first half. The second half is we were closing out 2023 with punching up. I felt like not only were we closing out the year, but we're kind of sunsetting the switch, right? We kind of think, all right, we're going out on this console. Nintendo's, it's imminent that at least the next thing is going to get announced. So let me take a look at my switch backlog specifically. And what have I, what have I not really addressed? What, What deserves my attention that I haven't really been able to savor? And I went back and a couple of games popped up and I looked through my stack of games. I'm, I still try to get physical games for all the consoles regardless, but especially, especially Switch, I'm kind of a purist. And mm-hmm. I grabbed Link's Awakening, which I have right here. And it was still in the, sh- it was down, you know, four or five games down and it was still in the shrink wrap. I'm like, holy shit, I haven't even played this. And I've always been fascinated by Link's Awakening because... My Zelda fandom dates back all the way to the beginning, you know, with the NES. We got, now I know NES came out in the States in a limited capacity in 86, but I don't think we had ours until I was, it was either my 14th or my 15th birthday. I always forget, but it was a couple of years in and Zelda was pretty top to, you know, pretty close to the top of one of my first NES experiences, fell in love with Zelda Zelda 2. And then, of course, with the SNES, which is still my favorite console, Link to the Past is still one of my favorite games. Mm -hmm. So, and then, of course, skip ahead to Ocarina of Time, which we did on Knockback a few years ago. And I, Colin and I have always loved Majora's Mask. I've always been really into Wind Waker. And then on and on with the more modern Zeldas. But Link's Awakening has always been a gap for me. The remake and the originals. So, but I remember as a kid looking, I don't know if it was the strategy guide or what issue of Nintendo Power it was, but I've always really responded from afar to the Link's Awakening imagery. You know, like the the illustration of the owl and the giant speckled egg sitting on top, nestled on top of the mountain. I've always been kind of fascinated with it, but as Colin knows, I hated the Game Boy when it came out. (laughs) I couldn't, I was so frustrated with that console. I wanted to like it. I wanted to have an NES in my hand and it wasn't the monotone spinach colored thing. It was the fact that I just really, as a however old I was in 89 when it came out or 90, whenever Colin got it, um, I couldn't see it. You know, I just could not play that game. I remember trying to maneuver under the lamp 
in my mom's apartment, like trying to see it, but I was always so frustrated. So I never, I never got acquainted with Link's Awakening, even though I knew it was going to be awesome. So I think finally in 2011, 2012, I played the Game Boy Color sort of color version, the DX oh, version. DX, yeah. For 3DS, which I didn't even own a 3DS at that time. My daughter had one. And my little, my youngest, my, my little guy had a 2DS. He had the brick. So I didn't even own, I, I think eventually I got a 2DS XL for myself. But I didn't even own one. So I would grab, I would just kind of abscond my daughter's 3DS and I would play the, you know, I finally got into Link's Awakening, but I never beat it. So, you know, I spent hours with it, but I never got anywhere with it. So the remake really caught my eye because I love, you know, I guess over the lifetime of the Switch, right, dating back to 2017, we had Breath of the Wild in 2017. Any Nintendo fan worth their salt started playing that as soon as the Switch was released, right? And then we, in 2023, we had Tears of the Kingdom. But here's the thing. We had three Zelda games. The Breath and Tears were kind of the bread of the sandwich, the meat that came in between those two things in 2019 was Link's Awakening. And I always refer, on Punching Up, I always refer to Breath and Tears and Modern Zelda. I would include Skyward Sword in this a little bit too. But Modern Zelda, I always refer to as the Studio Ghibli Zelda, right? It's a very sure. specific yeah. art direction. It's a little more serious. It's a little more dramatic. It's a little more realistic, if you will, that whole cell shaded thing. And then the other kinds of Zelda, there's a, there's a bunch of different flavors, but the other Zelda I would say is the more cartoony Zelda, right? The more whimsical, the more visually playful. And when I saw the way they were redesigning Link's Awakening from the ground up, I was like, oh my God, it just speaks to like my, my, my senses as a character designer, but also what I just love in a game. It feels like a 3D version of what we had back then or a 2.5D version. So it's kind of new meets old a little bit. And I just love the appealing sort of Fisher Price, Rankin and Bass holiday special, chibi, super deformed aesthetic. It's very cartoony. It's very playful. It's very colorful. feels very cozy to me. I just really go in for that aesthetic. And looking at Link, like I'm even looking at him on the box right now, He's definitely like shades of like Hermie the Elf from Rankin yeah. and Bass's Rudolph, right? I mean, it's just like takes a page out of that old stop motion. I don't know, like Rankin and Bass Gumby holiday special type thing. It's just cute. So I just said, I told myself, okay, so for I'm going to tackle this game for punching up and really get through it. The only, the only thing, the only downside to this whole thing is that, oh, there. Is I, I forgot all about the amiibo, which I don't have him. Hmm. And I always try to get the Japanese versions just because I like the Japanese packaging. Oh, yeah. That's got to be on top of my list, Brad. I'm glad you reminded me about him. He's adorable. <laughs> you know, and I love that. There's always, I'm such a big fan of Zelda, Zelda because I don't know, there's something about it being the underdog IP to Mario that's very appealing to me. Um, obviously it's big, but it's not as big as Mario's ever going to be. Right. So I like that. It's kind of like in second place, it's the middle child. Mm -hmm. There's something cool about that, but also the fact that traditionally they were so playful with they, it was always, I mentioned this on punching up in the past, but there, there's a willingness to reimagine it every time. And that, you know, hence the convoluted timeline and all that kind of thing. I don't care. I like Kind of going back to the well and saying, how can we reimagine it this time? How can we re reimagine the look and the feel and the visual aesthetic? I remember Wind Waker really being polarizing and divisive. I was already an adult at that point, you know, with right. a career and working in animation and everything. And I remember my fellow nerds arguing about it. And I was like, I'm down for it. Like, why not have something new every time? Have a bold visual approach. And that's what this one felt like me felt like to me. But getting into the game, what's interesting is that it is visually completely reimagined with this 2.5D look. And it feels very 2D in the gameplay. 
but they also really try to pay homage and be faithful to the original. So it comes out very strange. This is a very strange Zelda game. It feels actually irreverent in a way. Um, the way they tie in the Mario IP and some Kirby stuff, things that Nintendo doesn't do anymore, typically, outside of Smash, of course, right? Right. In that, yes, they're redoing something old that was irreverent, and then just going back and saying, all right, I'm going to talk about this on Summon Sign. What's the story with this game? Like, I didn't know anything about the development history, and apparently... They were the the original conceit was they had an early dev kit for the Game Boy, and once I guess Link to the Past came out and was a smashing success for the SNES, the idea was we're gonna we're gonna kind of port Link's uh, Link to the Past onto the Game Boy. So they there was a team there. I guess it was the typical you know uh, Tanabe and Tezuka, Marita, and of course. Shigeru was over there lording over the proceedings, but they were basically doing this at night. And bit by bit, it just kind of became its own game. And I think the parody feel of this game comes from having like, all right, what just throw Shy Guy in there, throw Goomba in there, throw, you know, and then eventually bit by bit, it was left in there and became its own thing, its own story. I guess the conceit was let's have something outside of Hyrule, no Triforce no Princess Zelda. Let's take Link and put him somewhere else. So this game really, if you know your history of Nintendo and you're an old guy like me, this game ends up feeling like the Super Mario 2 version of Zelda. It just Mm -hmm. feels completely like a departure, a one-off, and really kind of like this strange entity in the middle of you know, all these other Zelda games that feel like they're more in line with what Zelda should be. This one is a complete departure. It's almost like an acid trip version of Zelda in a way, but it's also very fun to play and very thoughtfully developed in terms of everything we love about old school Zelda, right? Exploration, dungeons, collecting, you know, rubies, buying items, and just kind of that tried and true thing of I guess evolution, like the world opens up as you gain items and you gain abilities. And the world, if you kind of, if you zoomed out and looked at this world map, probably wouldn't be that big. But the way it's so cleverly designed, it just feels like a game that's much bigger than it really is. Like it feels legitimately vast, even though it's probably not that big because it's got you backtracking, it's got that whole what the kids call Metroidvania thing of having to really the exploration, the fluid combat and that sort of momentum where you kind of build and you unlock more and more areas with just, just by gaining ability, just by finding a new item. And now, you know, this portion of the world opens up and that, that sort of build, you know, that sort of domino effect. And, um, you know, when I got into this game, I'm probably only about halfway through it. I understand it's pretty big. I understand it's bigger. There's more to do than Link to the Past. And so when I got into this game, I realized, you know, it, it has all those tried and true sort of hallmarks of a classic Zelda game. Only you're playing in a modern package. So it has those quality of life things you could just save on the fly and the menus easy to navigate and all that kind of thing, but it's it's got the puzzles. Like it feels properly obtuse and cryptic at times, right? It challenges you a little bit, not to the point of frustration, but you got to be dialed in. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You got to listen to what the NPCs are telling you. You got to listen to what the owl statues are saying. You have to really look for clues. Like you may miss something. It's that old school gameplay of it doesn't hold your hand. Although it's probably a little easier than some some of the classic Zelda games, it has that thing. It has that classic gameplay of not holding your hands in a package that I guess would be more appealing to younger people now. So it has. This is like one of those things I was I was so rooting for as I started because I really wanted to like it, it and it has everything. You know, it's kind of like everything we love about classic games wrapped up in a more modern package. 
So when I think of the game, you know, future Zelda remakes, I'm not even talking from an aesthetic perspective. I'm just talking about from how do you remake a classic and modernize it a bit, you know? I would love them to take a page out of this book. And the other thing is, I don't think this, because of breath and because of tears and being bookended by these gigantic games that are amazing, I think this game got overlooked a little bit. Mm. You know, I, I got to say, like, I sure. think this game is such a cool, you know, kind of lump of cold cuts in between that other bread. Now, the bread's, the bread's amazing. This is fresh baked bread, you know what I mean, right out of the oven. Yeah, but I love what's in the middle, and I love having that. I love having that different flavor of Zelda because I'm, I'm relative. Look, Tears, Breath of the Wild, some of the best games that I've ever made. I'm sure Zelda is going to be continued. Nintendo is going to continue it in that tradition. But I love having that complement of having these offbeat Zeldas to complement the other Zeldas because that's what Zelda always meant to me. It always, it always meant reinventing it every time. Right. It's like Link is sort of this vessel to take us on this adventure, but it was always different. And that's what I kind of dug about it. So this game was a, is, is, has been an absolute blast. Again, it's, it's kind of a slog. I make it a slog because I, I want to stay in this world. So it's like, I'll just go and collect rupees for two hours with the shovel, you know, <laughs> it's a game for a while for the collectibles. I'll do that. This game has a really cool thing where you could kind of trade up items you keep trading until you get that ultimate, you know, payoff, which is really cool. The fishing game, I could spend at, the fishing mm-hmm. game is like triple triad. It's like addictive to me. It's like there's it's a mini game that I just don't want to stop playing. So this game just just had everything for me. The, you know, only, again, the only downfall was that I'm I'm juggling this with Prince of Persia on Switch right now, which is awesome. I'm still playing Illusion Island, which came back. That came out what in October still playing that so i got a lot of plates i got i'm spinning a lot of plates right now which is not normal for me i went back and revisited metroid dread because i felt like that was another one i didn't spend sufficient time with but this is the one on top of my list that i'm really really enjoying and if anybody missed it out there even if you didn't play the original which i never really did it's so cool because it's it really stands out i think in i've played most of the zelda games even the weirder ones like Minish Cap and Triforce Heroes and all that kind of thing. This one really stands out as an anomaly. Like you could see in the final product that, you know, it makes sense when you find out about the development and the way it was kind of, you know, it started off as something else and ended up being this. And I think it kind of also speaks to a Nintendo that doesn't, that doesn't really exist anymore because they were still, they were still feeling themselves out, especially in North America, and still taking chances and still experimenting and figuring out what these IPs meant. And I, I kind of miss this era. So I like that they were so, I like that they were so faithful in the remake because it, you still get that funkiness. It's weird. It's a mm-hmm. really weird game. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, Zola games are usually surprisingly weird once you dive into them, and especially with like, a lot of the characters you meet throughout them. But um, Link's Awakening definitely always had a, a really special tone, I think. Very whimsical, like you're saying. Like, of course, Win- Wind Waker is, but the NPCs in this game, like the chain chomps just like out in the <laughs> yard, tied up to a post like a dog. And the story of the game, I won't spoil what it is, but it is a very different Zelda story, especially for the time when it came out. So I think that definitely stood out or still stands out to me this day as being a special little game with a cool story. And I do I, I think the, the size of the game is really impressive for especially with originally being a Game Boy game. I do think they make good work of it, like you're saying, how they handle backtracking it can be a little too sometimes. Yeah, you got to think about some of the stuff, but some of it's really cool when you do when you figure it out, like early on when you get the chain chomp to like munch on the swamp area to let you through. I love that. That's all really great stuff. I love all that kind of stuff. And the, um, the newer versions you play in the, the DX version and this one have the color dungeon that are also new. So make sure to go in there if you haven't yet. I read about that. It sounds amazing. Okay. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think they make some good moves in this remake. Like you're saying, like the button mapping, is a lot easier and less tedious in this version compared to the Game Boy version because there's only two buttons, essentially. 
So that helps a lot. That had to be a nightmare. It was. That yeah, that sounds tough. Was. Uh Colin. Yes. You had this game. Tell me about your experience well, with this. Yeah, actually <clears throat> it's actually a game I remember buying because uh I bought Game Boy games not i didn't buy them often but i bought pretty much all of the ones that you would think that i would have so like i had all five Mega Man games i had all the castlevania games the mario stuff kirby and the final fantasy legend games final fantasy adventure metroid 2 you know all whatever kid mm-hmm. icarus but the the thing i remember about Link's awakening honestly is i didn't really like it at the time mm. and it took me years to beat it because i and this was this goes to show you this was like pre-internet for me era mm. when i bought it but like i was just stuck in the game at a certain sp- place and then i would restart and get back to that place again i don't even remember what it was but it was probably a third of the way through the game or maybe halfway through the game and i wouldn't know what to do next and then it wasn't until i was older and had access to game facts and all of that that i went back and actually beat the game because i knew what to do and i, I remember being really really frustrated about that especially as a big fan of zelda 1 zelda 2 and links the link to the past and i love the capcom zelda games that came out very late in the game boy era which i think are awesome yeah yeah the oracle games right ages and seasons where you're not too far off at that point from me being out of zelda because you get you get wind waker in what 2003 and then you by the time you get to Twilight Princess, I'm, I mean, I hated Twilight Princess. I was like, yeah, that's 2006. I was out. Yeah. And I didn't like Minish Cap. Actually, it was kind of like a one, two thing because I wasn't crazy about the Minish Cap. I just wasn't crazy about the, the mechanic of like going small. I just wasn't for me. But I remember mm. when Phantom Hourglass came out, I mm. was like so crestfallen because <laughs> I didn't pay attention to it at all. I was at IGN. This was like early in my career at IGN. I was like an editor. And very similar to the way I operate now, it's very grand blue fantasy situation, actually, where I'm like, I don't even really know what this is. I'm just going to not pay attention to it. And when it comes out, I'm going to play it. And it was Zelda. So I was like, oh, I'm going to definitely play that. And I don't know why I was so confident on the on the back of of my experience with Twilight Princess, but I opened it and put it in. And I was like, it's like you have to use the stylus to control the game or whatever. And I'm like, I can't do this. And I never played it. <laughs> that was literally my entire story with the game. It was like I put put it back into the case, just slid it on the shelf and just never played it. Wow. And that's so funny. Just not going to do it. So, yeah, that was Link's Awakening to me is one of the weaker ones in my and just because of that experience. But I really haven't played it as an adult. So I don't know. And I, I think Dagan, it's funny, as you were saying that you were explaining it, I was thinking I'm like, it sounds like Mario 2 in some sense it sounds it's dreamlike and i dig that for zelda because especially on the back of link um a link to the past because a link to the past is really dark and i think it's the first it's the first zelda game with a real tone so to have like the Mm -hmm. the next game after it have a different sort of tone is is special and dig and i are both big fans of the original zelda and zelda 2 we both love zelda 2 as well i think zelda 2 is mega underrated but it's a great game. But Link's Awakening, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't my favorite. And, and I was a pretty big Game Boy advocate. But what I appreciated about it, very similar to the Final Fantasy Legend games. Was it felt deeper than your normal Game Boy game? A lot of Game Boy games were just like I remember sitting down and playing Mega Man. You could just play a Mega Man one or two or whatever, like and just all the way through and no time at all. It, it felt it felt very limited. So it was cool that Nintendo was treating the console or the handheld like a real machine in some sense. And yeah. I, so I appreciate that. And it just brings up in my mind to, to Dagan's p- problem with the original Game Boy hardware is just how seminal we forget. Like I, Game Boy Color was cool. And obviously Game Boy Advance and then Game Boy Advance clamshell has backlighting. But I think the r- real revolution began with Game Boy Pocket, which mm. I feel like just made everything so much more visible. And it popped so much more and really helped Game changer, that problem, yeah. yeah, in my opinion. Sure, yeah. That's a big deal. This is a lot. I mean, retroactively just thinking about squeezing this game onto the Game Boy in 93 is, that was a big feat. And it, you yeah. know, it really did. If I knew more about this game back then, it would have occurred to me that like, wow, this seems like a Game Boy version of Link to the Past. You could see it in the way it looks. Obviously, it's boiled down graphically and everything. But that's this game really strikes me as like chef's kiss, like Brad said, in terms of the progression 
and the way they design the progression into the game. Like there is something classically cryptic about it, the way these games were made so that you really have to be tuned in. And again, like if you're missing something, it could be a little thing sometimes that's just barring your progression. But if you're not really 100% tuned in, you kind of, it's that dynamic of like, you feel like, all right, it's my fault. I got to pay closer attention or I'm missing something. I can't believe how good that is in this game. Like that whole thing of like, I could see where I have to go, but I can't move that rock. What am I missing? And then realizing, all right, I'm an idiot. Like I've been stumbling around for 15 minutes. I just got a hundred more rupees as a result of it. So there are some net positives. But that that's the thing about a Nintendo game, like a Nintendo first party game, new or old, that you it's nobody does it this good. Like it's like, holy shit, like this is unbelievable. Not just the way it looks visually or the animation. I see a lot of people complaining about, yeah, it has a stop motion look, but it's missing frames, like especially in the main character. It seems like they could have done more there. And I agree. You know, they had to kind of come down on one side or the other. Like, is this supposed to be a stop motion game with accompanying choppy animation? Or do we might want to make it fluid like some of the bosses move? You know, there's a little inconsistency there. But when you come to just playing a game and having fun and the the game design, the level design, the way the per, the way the dungeons are like to a pixel, like just such an just such amazing experiences there's always something new in each dungeon so there's an evolution it's just it's it, nintendo has always been the pinnacle for me of like it didn't even even like this was for 10 year olds it didn't need to be this good and it <laughs> yeah. always comes with that 100 you know 110 yeah, percent quality that's rare you yeah. know and um so it was kind of a return to that it really hit me in the feels and i really hope Whatever remakes come next, I mean, I, I, we hear a lot about Ocarina now, but um, I really so, hope they that's take gonna a page. Be so out. dangerous. Oh. <laughs> that is another. Remake, that's a yeah. dangerous. Well, one not for not sure. yeah, not just another remake, but remaking that game, I think, is well, that's a big yeah. one. They remade it on 3ds. They'll do it again. Yeah. Well, that yeah, was a sequel. I don't think it needs one on 3ds. No. no, they they did a three version of the game with new graphics and all that. And they also did with Majora's that. Mask. You're that's thinking right. of Link Between Worlds. Oh, Link Between Worlds. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. That's right. Which is yeah, the, yeah, probably yeah. the last. Really that's probably the last Nintendo game I beat. That was. Wow. Oh, really? That's, that's a good one, though. Yeah. That's yeah, a good that one to end one. on, I guess. But uh, yeah, Dagan, I agree with you. Special game. Nintendo. They still got it in a lot of ways. As much as I get frustrated with them, they still when they put out a good game, man. They feel like they're leagues ahead of people still Absolutely. to this day. It's I, incredible. I think. It, what's funny, Dave, you you had said something too and to that point, Brad, is like maybe it's that Nintendo captures people as children, not because they make games for children only, but because they treat children with respect. Yo, it's yeah. huge. By like saying you're it's not just that you're a child banging blocks together. You understand that the level of quality that's in this, like you intrinsically get it, even though you can't maybe fundamentally express it or whatever, you know that you're being treated better than as mere children ex exposed to just the most base fiction or most mm -hmm. rudimentary licensed product or shovelware. I think it's probably the secret sauce is that everyone knows Nintendo means quality and everyone knows that. Like it, That's it, a yeah. great point. And that, that really speaks to, I mean, I know this is the industry I'm involved in, but that really does speak to children's entertainment, high quality children's entertainment, video game or not. Like if you think of the best in the business, you, they have, there's a quality, but there's also like an edict, like a philosophy not to talk down to kids. You know what I mean? Like you talk to them one-to-one, -one, you know, person to person. So Sesame Street, Pixar, Nintendo, they make the best content because it's the most thoughtful, you know? And yeah, there's, there's something in, that's why we still talk about Nintendo and our, and our warm and fuzzy memories of growing up playing these things. And I like the fact that they can preserve it. You know, I yeah. understand. We talk about that with the Pixel remakes, the Final Fantasy Pixel remakes on Knockback. Like, yeah, this might have been a bridge too far for kids nowadays just because of what they're used to in terms of technology and the way things look. So how do you make this for them? So having this classic thing in a new package 
and being able to kind of serve both masters in a way, if you will. Like it's it's kind of a hard thing to do, you know. But they they pulled it off with this. I re- I'm surprised I didn't hear. I know it's been almost five years or four years, but it's I'm surprised I didn't hear more about this game. You know, I mm. remember it coming out. Remember there was a little climber. Everybody was kind of excited. You know, I went in GameStop, I think, and bought this. I, it was one of those rare anomalies where I didn't just buy it online and uh, took it home and kept it in the shrink wrap for four years, you know. So it was yeah. nice to finally crack the seal and experience it. And I'm, 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 it's going to be one of those games where it's going to be hard to see it come to an end because the backlog is so big. I know I'm never going back. So I'm just trying to savor it now. Yeah, you savor know? it. Until they remake it again, then we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo way. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, boys. It's time for sort it out. All you at home. If you don't know this segment, we just talk about something that's annoying us in the game industry, company, game, person, whatever you're feeling. Colin, do you have one? Yeah, uh, I was. My answer for this was uh, sorted out PlayStation just with the stuff Ooh. going on with Helldivers. I just think. If you're going to be in this space, you need to you need to be as solid as possible. And I know that the game is doing well, but I can I was thinking about it when I was trying to sign on last night. I'm like, how frustrating must this be for people? I have all the time in the world mm-hmm. to play video games. I play video games all the fucking time. It's not like the end of all things. But someone sat down after someone was watching the Super Bowl last night. Well, I was I can just explain for myself. I was watching the Super Bowl. I worked out before the Super Bowl, did everything I needed to do. So I was like, I'm going to play Helldivers after. Super Bowl, sit down and play Helldivers, can't sign in. Go play Grand Blue Fantasy for a few hours and then go back to Helldivers, can't sign in. Like, this is going to be the first and for many, maybe only experience with the game on PC that's going to get people refunding their game, obviously. And you can do that on PlayStation. You just have to, it's much more difficult to do. And I just think that's too bad. I think if you want to play in this games as a service space, you need to be more prepared to not blunt your own momentum. And I think that they hurt themselves here. So while Helldivers is working out critically and commercially, and I think that that's really awesome and I'm glad people are enjoying it. I hope that Sony is able to take this energy into Concord later this year and fair games next year and some of the other products that they're working on and just be better so that you don't get in your own way. And of course, also envision a future where all your games come to PC, which would be nice. Sure. Dagan, what about you, dude? We're gonna dish the dirt right now. We're gonna we gonna dirt. dish. Dish it. <laughs> I have a I have a real gentle jab. It's nice to have a forum to talk about this because I think about this probably weekly, and it's not mm-hmm. it's not really so much of a beef as much as it's like, oh, where is where is my next thing? Studio MDHR, Moldenhauer Brothers of Cuphead mm-hmm. fame. Where mm-hmm. is my next masterpiece of a game? Where is it? <laughs> At least T. I listen. It's only been. What? It hasn't been that long since Cuphead's been out. Six years, I want to say. Right. Something like that. I know I know these things take time. Cuphead was a masterpiece. I need and and I know these, you know, you're big guys now. You got the Netflix animated series and everything. You're you know what I mean? You're too cool. And it, where is my next game? And the rumors that this is a stop motion game this time, I see. Whoa. You know, there's there's these gentle rumblings of I just need my next thing. And and while we're dishing the dirt, we might as well sort of turn the same exact sentiment onto Collins boys at yacht club games. Where is my oh, next shit. shovel night? Where is, where is our next shovel night? I we, mean, you're not going to get that for years at this point. No, cause, yeah. cause of, cause you don't of, think it's a, to explain that to me. How come? Cause mean of the hollow is their, their project right now. And that's right. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, still not out. No, that's I, still I, not out. No, it, it, was, it was dated for December, but I, I think they said later that they had to just put a month on Kickstarter or whatever. I think it'll come out this year. Um, and it looks fucking awesome. I mean, there's just no doubt about it, but I really oh, it's gonna be amazing. I don't I haven't spoken to them in, in a while, but I would be curious to ask them. They were too. They were too loose and not following Shovel Knight up like they made. I think they made. A mistake like you could have probably had a whole trilogy of Shovel Knight games in this, and I know that they technically will say we do because we have the DLC expansions, but I'm like, they're just built mm-hmm. on the same games with the same enemies. I appreciate them. They're cool. I've played yeah, them all. I've good. platinum Shovel Knight. I love Shovel Knight. I was a, the original Shovel Knight advocate. They admit that they totally used me like in that regard because they knew I'd love it, you know, and I, I don't, <laughs> I didn't mind being used for Shovel Knight, but, but yeah, I think I would look at it and be like, yeah, what, 
what was going on? And they say like, well, we were fulfilling the obligations of our Kickstarter. And I'm like, I just think people would have understood if you said like, we're going to make a new game and just give people codes for the new game. Like sure. if that's, if yeah. that's like the, I, so yeah, I think they, they lost their opportunity to do that, but they made a shit ton of money on show night. They're very comfortable. And Mina, the hollower is going to be great. So yeah, Dude, I forgot uh, about that game. I've played they're developing that in house. Good. Yeah, that's an in house one. Yeah. They've they, had some they, external okay. games. They like Cyber Nin, um, Cyber Shadow, which was dope. Cyber yeah. Shadow. That was right. an external yeah, that game. That game was good. It was really good. I platinum that one. That was a that was like a game I, I saw all the way through. I really really loved it. And they they published the Shovel Knight Dig game and Shovel mm-hmm. Knight Treasure or whatever the hell that was. I played that. Which were they were cool, but I mm-hmm. I don't think they did as they. The cool thing about Yacht Club is they're very they're very um, external facing with their their financials and with their like they they'll break down how things sold and how why they don't do things anymore and stuff like that and i think that that's really cool so i'm sure yeah, that is cool there will be more to say about that yeah cool. uh my sorted out is little devil inside where the hell is this game we've heard about this game a long time ago it's been in state of plays before just awesome looking little 2d game or not 2d but like uh 3d 2d kind of thing and it's just gone, man. We saw it like when was the last time we saw this game? Like a year and a half ago. Yeah, maybe twenty twenty two. I would say it's something just like, like that. what's going on? Wow. Just they've gone dark on this game. I need an update, please. Not sort a good that sign, especially because that game no. that game has been in development for that game was in development for a long time before Sony ended up really kind of affiliating with it. <clears throat> so it, yeah, it, I I wonder if it will come out or not because like you just never really know. But Sony sometimes just does announce games and then never talks about them ever again. Like uh like that game wild remember that game um yes that was that was a michelle ansel game that was at yes, gamescom that, that year game. and all of that it was supposed to be this crazy thing where you can kind of play as all these different animals and then they just never talked about it so who the hell knows what's going on with this yeah uh we got some write-ins from listeners twiddle sticks writes in hey you fellers my sorted out goes to my mom long pause for dramatic effect just kidding you guessed it it's microsoft Maddie has already mentioned Microsoft has a, had a huge communication problem, but boy, oh boy, this week takes the cake. I just can't believe they let all these rumors and conflicting reports prosper while they don't set the record straight. I'm not just referring to the whole exclusive debacle. Why did Jez and other reporters have to set the record straight on what was going on with Toys for Bob? Why did they decline to comment to the media? What the hell is the future of Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 since their staff got a huge hit with layoffs? Is the content update slash rolling out going to be slow down the line? And keep going on with some of the other issues like retail and whatnot. I'm not I'm going to stop here. Wherever direction Microsoft and our Xbox goes, one thing is for sure. They got to sort that shit out. Uh, Yeah, they definitely got to sort some stuff out. A lot of question marks on there. Everyone is looking to that company right now to see what they're going to do next. They, it's a weird time. Uh, I think they're I think it's the beginning of the end of them as we understand them as an exclusive brand. I mm-hmm. think Xbox remains and Game Pass remains and Xbox exclusives remain too. Like I said earlier about concentric circles, but I, I do think things are on the verge of changing. I think that they I think they've been successfully marginalized in some sense by two competitors that refuse to mimic their they, they they flip the economic table over with Game Pass, right? And the other two were just like, we can't do it. We're not going to do it. And they just, they resisted. And you got to kind of give them some respect to, to to look at the numbers and see that it wouldn't work. And so I think Xbox has to spread the field. And I think that they're gonna, what's going to end up happening is ultimately they'll be the biggest third-party publisher in the world, which I think is is beneficial to them. So I'm very intrigued to see more, but I think that the writing's on the wall for them. And the com- But can I say this in their defense? Yes. Th- they... I don't, you can't control leaks like this in some sense. Like right. people were choosing, I would, I wish being an IGN was fun because we would often know each other's sources because we'd have to vet them. And so when I see stories and I'm like, people say like, that's not true. And I'm like, dude, that source is like, you don't even know what you're talking about. You know, with this, it could be one person mm-hmm. that, that leaked all of this to different people. Someone, it's clear that there's a civil war of some sort at xbox right right and oh yeah that's fairly obvious and i think that there was a side that was that wanted to see things through and a side that was 
had kind of had enough. And I think the side that wanted to see it through started leaking it to make as much PR damage as possible in hopes that maybe it could change something. But I'm not sure that it changed much of anything. Mm. And I so I want I want to say to Microsoft's credit, it's like, what were they really supposed to do about that? If people are not all on board, mm. then maybe you have to kind of clean house. And that's what we were saying is like, I wonder if some of these people are even going to survive. Now, the fact that the 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 podcast they're doing is led by Phil Spencer and Sarah Bond and and Matt Booty indicates to me that they they are going to stick around, which is shocking to me because this seems like a different strategy and that their strategy failed. Um, but to their credit, I, I just don't know what they were supposed to do about that. And I think you're kind of at, at that point in between a rock and a hard place. How do you manage that? I think they, they've kind of done the best that they can do with it. It's like you can't shut it down because it's true. So you have and you're not ready to say anything you're not you don't have all your eyes dotted and your t's crossed so you can't say anything immediately and it might still be up in the air in some sense behind the scenes as far as like how far you're going to go and what you're going to say you're the biggest company in human history so you don't just say things without preparing and so i i kind of feel bad for them on that front though i think they put themselves in this position ultimately not for things to be leaked but for this economic reality to come bearing down on them that the more they consolidated the more urgent it would be for them to sell more games and Right. That's and that and that's going to be that's the situation they're in. And I think the ABK deal, if you wanted Xbox to be stay as an exclusive product, the ABK deal was a total blunder. And for and made them the the made them so much bigger in internally at Microsoft that now everyone's paying attention to them where they definitely mm-hmm. weren't before. Yeah. We we've referred to in the past. If you listen to if you listen to to earnings calls like I do. Um, they're interesting because people with money invested ask meaningful questions of the CEOs and the people there, the CFO, about things that matter to them. And Xbox never came up. Like if you looked at these things, like it's wow. It's not that Xbox was unimportant. It's that like it's five or six percent of the the income of the company. We're not really going to be worried about that. But now it's more like I think ten percent or something. And now they're like okay we're Microsoft. So we're a services company, an agnostic services company. And this is over now because now we're, t- we, we have too much of an investment in this. And I also feel like what the guy said that wrote in, not to beat up on him, but talked about the layoffs, like that's just shrewd bargaining. Activision should have laid those people off and they didn't because they knew they weren't going to have to once the deal went through. And it's probably part of the calculation of letting them rework the deal's timeline. Because remember, Activision could have walked away when the deal wasn't closed, no matter for whatever reason, and it was because of the FTC, Activision could have been like, we're out. Um, and Microsoft right. would have been like, we need, Microsoft would have had to pay $3 billion kill fee. And Activision could have reforced them to renegotiate the deal. But I think that they realized that they had such a great deal that not only did they keep feeding people basically internally that were going to be laid off eventually, but they forced their competitor to just do it when they bought it. So I, I think it's a little unfair to blame them for that. Like that was sure. The, the, everything kind of just materially changed. That the FTC really fucked them up. I mean, in terms of just putting them on their back feet, and you know, think about that. It, it took eight fiscal quarters for it to close. So, like, you think about how much changes right. in that time. I just that's their fault. But that was a right. if, if you care about if it for some reason it's important for you that Xbox games just are always just only playable on Xbox, which is your prerogative. I don't really understand that, but. Um, because I don't care where PlayStation games are played, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I don't think it makes any sense for PlayStation games to be on Xbox, but if they were, it's like, okay, whatever the case might be. If unless that's important to you, I just feel like this is good for the sustainability of the brand. And what will happen will probably be some sort of marketing around strengthening Game Pass's value by mm. saying, and this might have been the, the thing that needed to happen the whole time. They they haven't made it explicit. It's not explicit enough, right? Like to go and say, come on, Xbox or PC, get Game Pass, and then you get these games. It's like, what if you had a la carte options only on competitors where you actually force them to pay full price? You use that money to actively buttress your service and make it better. Mm. And you use that as the most wonderful ability to magnify the value proposition and say like seven. And you can't probably explicitly say it on the competing platforms, but this is what I was saying about the splash screen itself. The Xbox Xbox splash screen as it is should go away. And when an Xbox game starts up on a competing platform, it should just have the Xbox logo and Game Pass next to it. Mm. And just explicitly make that over time, months, years into a thing. This might actually save them in some sense. They Microsoft or not Microsoft. Xbox hasn't been Sega'd 
already because of Microsoft. <laughs> right. And so much money. Right. Yeah. And people say like, well, there needs to be competition. And I'm like, I agree. The competition is between Sony and Nintendo now. And I think that they're going to turn the, and especially Sony is going to be turning its eyes onto Nintendo in a major way. And I think that it's the rumored moves it's going to make and handhelds and all that. I think you're indicating that they want to fight again and it doesn't stop or preclude a third party from coming in again. Right. Whether right. Apple or someone else That's that looks, that looks like it. So this idea that like PlayStation has no competition now is silly. It's like, it, why does Xbox have to be the competition? It, it right. doesn't have to be that way. And I just, I don't know if, did you guys see it, Brad? I don't know if you saw it out, out, out West, but it was certainly true out here is like they were giving Xboxes away over Christmas, basically. If you, it, oh yeah, I saw that and, for cheap. And yeah. I think that that might've been one of the things when they came back from holidays and assessed the data and stuff, they're like, didn't matter. Right. Like I think we, and that might've been the gambit where it's like, let us try to get these things out. I saw Xbox series S's at, at Costco for, or BJ's for like a hundred bucks. Brand new. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. I didn't know that. And they still wouldn't sell. So I just wow. think it's maybe it's over for some sense. That's as a as we understand. But I, but I want to, but I do think there's a spectrum in which I think people are being incredibly dramatic about this. Like, I just don't think they're going to undercut their entire business all at once. I just think this is the beginning of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, one thing about the layoffs that is concerning to me though, Colin is the, the write in that mentioned overwatch two and Diablo four. These are games that need constant upkeep. And these games already have a problem with that especially reception wise overwatch 2 it feels like that game has been like had both of its legs broken compared to where overwatch 1 was mm -hmm. when it eventually came out and diablo has been very mixed reception wise some people like it some people don't really like or not a fan of it so i'm very curious about like these games future and how they're going to support them because if it's like the way overwatch has been going it's not good so I don't know, like WoW's doing fine, I guess, still right now. But like these are two huge games and I do worry about them supporting them, how they'll be like. I was really hoping with Microsoft, they would get some more money and I can maybe see not even like Crash Bandicoot, but some of these games get more support like Overwatch 2 getting more support or something like that. And that could still happen. But right now, it, it just makes me really concerned about the longevity of a lot of these games that are supposed to be played for like 10 years. I just don't know how that's going to turn out. Yeah, now. that's interesting. Yeah, we'll see how that's good of a steward or not they are. Of, yeah. Of these publishers, I would argue that in some sense, they haven't been a great steward of Bethesda, although people would argue that Bethesda was at an all time low when they were purchased. And that might as a publisher and that might that might be true, but sure, I, it, it just remains to be seen. I just think that what they're doing is probably overall worthwhile if they were a smaller company, but they just the, the demands of how much money they've spent on all these deals indicates to the shareholders they want to maximize it and they look at these right. these user bases of very active purchasers uh, because that's the other thing that's so important and I know I say it a lot but it's it, it is it is relevant is that Xbox depressed sales on its own platform by using Game Pass that's part of it I mean that's you have to understand oh, yeah. that's like when games like Grand Theft Auto 6 were announced and people are underneath earnestly saying like is it going to be on Game Pass it's like are you crazy like like what is this and mm -hmm. but I think that like you you reap what you sow in that sense. So that's why it was an all in move that and I re, again, I respect yeah. the all in move. But when you look at the it's like, damn, dude, they want to sell these games. They want they want people to yep. buy them. And and yeah. so we'll see. It's a, it's a bummer. But yeah, we'll, well see. We'll see. We'll see what the future of Xbox looks like pretty soon, actually. Yep. A few days. Yeah, very soon. Yeah. All right. This is from Meatball. <laughs> Top of the morning, you itchy, rash-infested sussies. Ugh. Uh, sorted out Bioware. Yeah. Dragon Age Dreadwolf has been development for nine years. With so many highs and lows over the years, it's tough to stay optimistic that this game will be any good. What on God's green earth has taken so long? We're set to see a full reveal this summer, but even then, it's not guaranteed to release this year. The only other IP worth getting excited about is Mass Effect, but it appears we're still more than four years away from the next installment. It's so sad to see a studio once held in such high regard crash and burn like this. Will we ever see Bioware return from its former glory or to its former glory? Uh, probably not. Sadly, I don't think so. Games are so much money and they such a big risk. And a lot of those people that made Bioware, Bioware aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Blizzard. It's like when I think about Blizzard, people that made Blizzard, Blizzard 
they're just not there anymore. It's not the same company anymore. anymore. Right. It's just a name now. Right. Exactly. It's just, it, it's, you said it exactly. It's just a name. I have no hope in Bioware. And so anything that will exceed that, that floor will, will surprise me and delight me. And and I think that's just a good place to be because I think that they, EA ruined that studio and Mm -hmm. it was what a lot of people predicted. And I, I had long said too that I think that if, EA didn't think that they would suffer major PR backlash for closing Bioware because of their history of closing studios. And Bioware is probably the most prolific studio they ever bought. And basically it fell apart underneath them. That I think yeah. that they would have done it already. But I think that they... Yeah. And just maybe restart things. And I think that they they mistreated Mass Effect with the, that fourth game. And then Anthem obviously was a huge boondoggle. Mm-hmm. boondoggle uh, and... I don't know. I, I, you're right. It's just it's just a name. So if they come out and they and swinging, I I couldn't care less about Dragon Age to be honest with you. But especially with Mass Effect, if they come out swinging with those games and they're good, more power to them. But I don't know why anyone would expect that they're sure. they're going to be anything more than probably if they're if they're in development for so long, they're not going to look very good. They're going to be very archaic and not age well in that time. I just hope that they're being managed a little bit better than it seems like. But yeah, most of the people mm-hmm. that are gone, a lot of the guys that are, were a lot of the creative people that worked on on Mass Effect, we're working on that um, that game that's being developed in Austin. What the hell is it called? Uh, it's the game with that whole expanded universe that they're planning, and Matthew McConaughey was in the Exodus. Oh, <laughs> yeah, dude, I forgot all about that shit. And that game looks that's cool. That team. Yeah, that, that feels far away, too. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't, I think Bioware, man, like I know of a lot of their games, like I really liked Dragon Age 1, especially on PC at least it was really great and I know people love Mass Effect 1 through 3 so it's just like it's sad to see it go man but I think you gotta kind of move on like if Dragon Age comes out and it's awesome fuck yeah I'm stoked that's great but I just don't expect anything great from them like Colin was saying and frankly other people are filling the void man for stuff like that so don't be afraid to look out there for other stuff play Baldur's Gate 3 man it's a good scratch it'll scratch that itch for you is it good yeah Oh, yeah. Well, let's get through super good. All right, dudes. Let's do the exact opposite. Keep it up. <laughs> Someone we're pleased with. Who's doing good? Colin, let's start with you again. Well, instead of instead of complimenting people, I kind of wanted to spin this into just, you know, um, keep your heads up. Xbox fans. OK, you're fine. You're good. Everything's OK. Quite yet. Um, I feel like they're underestimating how many of them there are and how there's a, a, a dedicated group of people that will continue to be catered to. And yeah, I feel bad for them because I do feel like f- for all of the bad actors, especially on social media and the obnoxious like fanboy accounts, there are people that are earnestly upset by this and yeah. And how far it goes, who knows or whatever, but I just don't think all is lost. And so instead of complimenting some fucking company or something like that i figured i would just tell them keep your heads up because i just i don't i don't think this is the end of xbox and i don't think it's the end of your ability to play your games there and get your achievements and all that and it's probably been a pretty stressful time for you if you care about that it'll be okay fear not (laughs) it'll be okay (laughs) dig it what about you i mean when you mentioned this segment to me the first thing i thought about was kojima i mean who who Right? Like that state of play slash trailer for Death Stranding 2. Like, I mean, who could get us hooked? Who's more, who's better at getting us hyped with just complete, with just like a completely distinctive, genuine vision of weirdness? Mm -hmm. You know, like just double down on no, this is, this is what it's going to be. And just, you know, strange cyborg marionette puppets that move at a different frame rate. And, you know, a guy playing a, the Joker playing electric guitars. Like, it's just fucking like, as I, as I was watching it, I, I mentioned this on a different podcast, like Colin sent me a reminder, like, you got to check it out. And I finally got around to it like one in the morning and I was exhausted watching it. And it was like, my dr- like, it was like a fever dream. It was like watching a fever dream play out. And I was just, but equally as like, as strange as it is, just so excited. Mm-hmm. You know, for like, my God. And it's not just the fact of like, I know the game is going to be great. It's just we're dealing with a really, really unique vision, I think. 
and just uh, an innovation, a level of innovation with ideas that's, I know a lot of people say it's hyperbole, but it's not hype when everybody's like, I need this game right now. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just a blending of all these weird elements, but it's just, I don't know. It just makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Whenever he shows a game, it's definitely a moment in time. I feel like I do love Kojima, but I also get annoyed at Kojima when he comes out on Keeley stage to say he has a podcast or he shows up at a press conference to just, it's just his face <laughs> saying, I'm making a game for Xbox yeah. and that's it. Just like, fuck Kojima. But when you show the goods, man, he's got them. It's nothing. Can you imagine no having like to him. live up to that, though? Like every, you know, every mic drop has to be followed by another mic drop. That must be very difficult, you know, because yeah, that guess. one thing that's not that one drop that's not that Don Rickles mic drop is going to land with such a thud. Yeah, that might that might be the end of the momentum, you know, yeah, so he's, know. it behooves it like he's he has to he can't he's like one of those dudes that just can't fail like he literally yeah. can if he does. You know, it's going to be a very loud thud. Yeah. Um, For this, keep it up for mine, I guess I want to though I have problems with it. I want to give keep it up to Konami releasing Sound Hill a short message. I think it's really cool to get free experimental little projects like that i don't think it's like amazing or anything or it's i wouldn't even say it's like good it's okay but i really appreciate getting small little experiments like that just out of nowhere especially when there's no synergy or anything with the remake of two being around the corner or anything like that it's just fucking here out of nowhere so i love when devs do stuff like that and i i know it's it usually doesn't make sense because you spend all this money making something and you don't get a return out of it. So I, I like when people do that, even if it has mixed results. Yeah, it's uh, right. it's it's funny you feel that way. I feel the exact opposite about it, where I think it's dangerous to do that and bring Silent Hill's reputation even further down in the wake or in the in the anticipation of a, <laughs> a big game. Like, it's cool to do that stuff if it's good. PT was good, you know. Yeah, mm. this PT is, was good because it was Kojima. No, I didn't. Here's what right. I'll say. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll say this about Silent Hill, Colin. Silent Hill itself as a series has been a mixed bag big time. Ups and downs huge. One, two, three, everyone loves. Four people like, dude, some of the other ones, though, man, are not good. I played Silent that Vita Hill one. Itself, I played that Vita one. I think Way Forward made it. Yes. Yeah. They are. Oh, wow. it, it's an inconsistent franchise as it is. And. The stuff they've been putting out for Silent Hill already. What was the fucking TV thing they put out or whatever? Whatever, like that live stream. Oh, yeah, game. that was that was Ascension. Yeah, dog shit game. So they're already fucking it up on that front already. It doesn't matter. This game isn't doing anything different to damage the series's reputation already. Their reputation already is not good. But at least I liked the attempt. This was much better than Ascension. And there was some sort of vision there, which I appreciated. And it was an actual video game. So for Konami, that's a step in the right direction, I suppose, for what they usually do. But hopefully to remake will be good. I'm not holding my breath, but hopefully it'll be good. That will be nice if it was good. God, do we need it? Honor yeah. A classic. Yeah, I don't I don't fucking know about that game. <laughs> I don't know about that game, but I know what you're saying, though, Brad, about like, who cares if you're shooting yourself in the foot? There's already two bullets in it. Yeah, it's like your it's foot, not gonna dude, hurt their anybody. foot's You're... fucking blown off. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Fair enough. Uh, let's see. We got some writings from Matt. Uh, Matt Matlock. Gentlemen, loving the show and I have to keep it up. For PlayStation Studios game releasing day and date on PC, Helldivers is having great success and a lot of that can be attributed to the d- bring a day and date on PC. It's even past God of War 2018 is having the highest concurrent player count on Steam. PC players aren't going to come to PlayStation, so bring the games to them while the games are hot. Make that money. Keep it up. Uh, yeah, this is what you are touching on earlier, Colin. I agree, I agree completely. I think it, it this is a no-brainer. I don't think it's going to happen for single-player games for a while. No. But I think for multiplayer games, it's a no-brainer. And I, it would be ideal for them to eventually get there to single-player games to bring them to both. Mm-hmm. I just think that you don't want to be too bullish on that front because what's important to remember when you're trying to figure out revenue for a game like Helldivers 2 is you'll get 100%. They said it's about 50-50 split, so like between versions right now. So 
you're getting a hundred percent of forty dollars and seventy percent of a hundred of forty dollars on the other platform, and that's yeah. just totally. And you know, sometimes you make like boutique deals where you get better percentage splits, but there's no way that Valve does that. I could, I, I imagine they could give a fuck less if Helldivers was on Steam. So it's right. it's a total libertarian mm-hmm. marketplace, and you just want to be careful with that because the rev you don't want to get all of your revenue through a third party. That's exactly what they do to others, and they know better than anyone else that you don't want mm-hmm. to be on that end of the deal. They make so much passive revenue. You don't want to make the passive revenue. Um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be the passive revenue is something good to rely upon. You don't want to give other companies rivals your own passive revenue. So. Right. And as terms of day and date on PC for everything, Sony still wants you to buy their console. So I don't think they're going to put all their games. To, maybe not for a little while. I could see games coming, maybe call in like a year after they've been out or six months. But Sony still badly wants you to buy a PlayStation. I don't think they're at the point yet where Microsoft was where they didn't care if you played on Xbox or PC. I mean, I have an Xbox Series X and I barely play it because I play everything on PC. Mm. So like you said, they want you in their ecosystem. They want as much profit as possible from you. Right. And Microsoft is is acting differently because they have store. They have potential storefront, you know, storefronts opening on, you know, what they do with PC and then with mobile, like we were saying. So, yeah, you just get all exactly. Yeah. Uh, This is from Philip Flood. Hey, lads, my keep it up is for Nintendo. As someone who owned the Wii U in 2016 and the Wii in 2011, I know all too well the barren wasteland that is Nintendo's release schedule the year before they launch a new system. Not so with the Switch. Last year, we got Fire Emblem Engage, Tears of the Kingdom, Pikmin 4, Mario Wonder, Super Mario RPG, Bayonetta Origins, WarioWare Move It, Advance Wars Remake, and Metroid Prime Remastered. Not only was this a stiff year of releases, but some of these are arguably the best games in their entire series with two uh, two goatee contenders. And I put Pikmin as one of the best of last year, too. While 2024 is quieter, we're still getting oddities like New Princess Peach game, Luigi's (laughs) Mansion 2, and a remake of the most beloved Paper Mario title. It's hard to believe that Nintendo is launching a new system, but I'm so glad to see Nintendo send off the Switch with a bang and not a whimper like they were known to do. I still haven't run out of first party bangers to get through on the Switch. Keep it up. Uh, yeah, Nintendo, they got a lot of software, man. They Their first party, second party is always extremely strong. Well, f- Switch allowed them for the first time to focus all of their energies on one platform since, yeah, since, right. since 1989. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and a smart time. move. Yep. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was totally brilliant, and it, and it and it coalesced nicely with the idea that games are taking more and more expensive. So you need those resources anyway. If they were still supporting two platforms, it would be a disaster for them. Yeah, and it'd be tough. No reason to do that. They they completely turned it around, and they're they're brilliant. I mean, it's just it's they so just smart. Did a great it's job. So smart. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty twenty three was a banner year. I mean, it brings a tear to your eye if you're a Nintendo fan. If you think about, you know, we were singing their death knell during the Wii U only a few <laughs> short years ago. You know, like it, it wasn't that long ago where we're like, I guess they're just making software now. Like, you know, I guess they're done. Mm-hmm. So, it, yeah. And that that momentum and I, I just can't see them only, you know, lobbing the Princess Peach Showtime flag into battle, though. There's going to be a lot more. I mean, oh, yeah, Con- I'm sure Contra's coming out. I'm more. very excited about Contra. I hope but, Contra's um, good. Yeah. When's that coming out in April? I don't know. I think I, dude when they showed that game i thought it looked ugly yeah so i hope yeah, they, i agree <laughs> i hope they kind of reworked that. i agree i was like i don't know this looks a little <laughs> yeah i yeah. don't want to say uh, amateurish isn't the right word but yeah, kind of like, pretty grody yeah yeah, yeah. like no like it. it just lacked style or something yeah, yeah. which is weird because it's way forward so i expected mm. more i guess good point we'll see okay the next game colin grand mm. blue fantasy relink yes. i have through this also i finished the campaign but you've been doing the end game been chipping away at this tell me what's it been like yeah i don't know there's something about this game where it just fell in a pocket where i was kind of in a wait and see approach or just really just a wait approach for hell divers and a few other things that are coming out like banishers ghost of new eden i'm definitely going to play I, I have that preloaded on my ps5 there's that lords of exile game or whatever i don't know if i got that name right but there's there's some like m- mega looking Castlevania game coming out tomorrow that looks or in two days that looks really, really awesome oh, to play. Right. And so I was waiting for these things to kind of approach and I didn't really want to get into something else like Persona 3 is out there. I could start Final Fantasy 7, but it's not really time like I want to really 
get those like to flow right into each other so it's too early so i really gave grand blue fantasy relink a lot of my time and and i have it's a game that count, i don't know if you've noticed this it's a game that counts time in a strange way where not in a strange way in the way that it should be where it um it doesn't count any time like when you're in the menus or anything like that so it has like this very clean time of gameplay Oh, okay. And it says I've only played for like 40 hours, which is incredible because I feel like I've played for way longer than that. It's also tracking it on PSN um, mm-hmm. and it's tracking it like differently than, say, Witcher 3 is tracked or uh, other games where I have these like exploded hour counts. For some reason, it's just very accurately counting how much you play, which I really appreciate because that th- those statistics are always really Mm-hmm. out of order at the end of the year but i've explained this to, on sacred but to, to reiterate it for the audience here is that you know side games the, the japanese company makes this game they make a game called grand blue fantasy i've said many times that this game's not playable in the west and people have been like it is playable in the west you gotta do it. so i actually went and looked into it and you guys are such fucking nerds you have to <laughs> you have to you basically to play on you have to like download something on google chrome and then you play, you have to get into the Japanese version and then get the English out. And that's like a limited version of it. And to get it on your phone, you have to have a Japanese iPhone account or uh, you have to have some like side loaded program on Google, on 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 Android. It's like, guys, that means it's not playable in the West. Right. So I'm just going to reiterate that. It's not people playable. People told me that with like Dragon Quest 10. They're like, oh, it's playable. But you got to yeah. do a bunch of shit like that, too. I'm like, yeah, it's on, like, OK, man. so again, just to reiterate the original Grand Blue Fantasy, not playable in the West. So it's I didn't know what I was getting myself into because I like going into games blind. I, I was just saying that earlier. I, I enjoy that. And with Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, I was going in blind, assuming that it was basically going to be this exploratory game about what Grand Blue Fantasy was. Now, I had no I knew it was an MMO a Japanese thing, I guess, in some cursory sense but i didn't realize that the game was going to take place after the events of the game so you were supposed to already know everyone and know what was happening as you're unlocking these characters you're supposed to be like oh it's a uh, fred you know or whatever from fucking this <laughs> and i just didn't know that and i guess that's my own fault but what i'm most fascinated by about this with this game and i wonder if you feel the same way is uh brad is what took so long i was doing a little bit of research on this game because i know mm-hmm. it, i know it was announced back in 2016 i remember and it was supposed to come out in 2018 and it was wow. supposed to be a PlayStation four game and platinum games was making it. Then at some point, platinum games is removed from it. Um, and you're delayed until, you know, 2019 and then you're delayed until 2022, then 2023, then 2024. What happened? I went and looked at the videos, the early videos of, um, like the announcement, the, the second announcement, yeah, yeah. 2016, 2017 from like TGS and things of this nature. And it doesn't really look different. It actually looks like the same game. So I'm very curious about the timing of this and what their in- initial intent was. I'm also fascinated by the idea that the timeline got so fucked up that their fighting game spinoff came out years before the core game on console. So you had the Arc System Works versus game coming to ps4 in 2020 and then they released it as versus rising last year again on ps5 i know there's also a manga that i don't think was ever translated and there is an anime which i think was Mm -hmm. subbed and i'm sure Mm -hmm. maybe dubbed and i just didn't watch or know any of it so i'm I'm missing all of it but i'm glad i didn't because it probably would have turned me off from it i'm I'm not into like the most weebish (laughs) shit ever and this is like very core weeb this very sort of stuff it is um the game is very manageable and reminds me a lot of a Monster Hunter game or I, I brought up the random game like, uh, well, you know, Freedom Wars, Soul Sacrifice, Ragnarok Odyssey, games like that. Mm-hmm. And this is a higher budget version of a lot of those games and certainly looks a lot better and it's fun to play, but it's very repetitive and I don't really get it. What I keep Mm. playing for, though, is because it's such a sunk cost fallacy. I'm like so deep further than most people will get in the game. I'm like, I want to see like what is like, what's at the end of this? So Gran in my car, I don't know where you stopped, but Gran is at level 94 in my my game. Mm. And now I thought this would be funny to kind of explain this a little bit. People think that I have this trophy obsession and that it comes out of nowhere, but it's just the most recent spin of of um, my obsessiveness with video games. And I was explaining recently that 
Pokemon was like this for me back in the day because I would have to level all of the Pokemon up evenly. And I did do this. So I would like capture every Pokemon and then level them all up evenly as I played through the game. And it was like total nonsense. Or when I play old Final Fantasy games and I would like get the best equipment for everyone and I would grind for 20 hours to get every jump for Gao and I would get every blue magic for Strago and just do all this unnecessary work to 100% complete the game. And I'm finding that I'm falling into the same trap with Grand Blue Fantasy Relink where I want to get every character. I've unlocked them all but one. And then I just absorb them into my party almost thoughtlessly. And they're basically just numbers where Grand just stays <laughs> in the party. And then they it's like, okay, level 70, level 70, level 70. Then one goes to 71. It's like, you're out. And then the next one, level 70. And then they'll rise up and I'll just keep them all evenly leveled mm-hmm. in that way. There's a lot of text, a lot of voice acting. I'm not really blown away by the level of of interactivity with the game, considering how long it was in development. And again, I'm just so curious why they felt like it needed to be take so long. What what changed? I, I was reading deeply about it. I was reading press releases and stuff like nothing changed. It's all exactly what you said it was always going to be. But it is so late that yeah. it can't help but be fat. I, I can't help but be fascinated by it. No matter how tropey and anime it is, it's there's still something about it. It's just it, it, there's not. I also say that there's not much of a difficulty arc. I even started replaying the core chapters on hard and it's like a joke because my guys are so high leveled that it's kind of all broken mm-hmm. at this point. I don't know. There's a lot to say about it, but it, it's it's a very focused game. There is a co-op angle to it that is very attractive to people. I've never interacted with the co-op at all and you don't have to play with right. co-op. And, and I will say that all, there the characters are very distinct from each other. I just don't really play as any of them when I don't have to. So each character has like a series of side quests to do. Most of them are Which just are text. Boring. Yeah, they're boring as hell. Boring. I started just skipping them just because yeah. you get upgrades like stat upgrades for doing them. So you just kind of could skip the text. But each of them has a few playable ones and you have to play as them in those. So you mm-hmm. can explore the different characters in that way if you want. But it, there really is no reason to play as anyone but Grant. It's just if captain. you like their gameplay more. Like I played as um, Siegfried pretty much the whole game because I thought he was more fun than Grant. I liked his... He's like you would time his attacks and you would get more bonus damage if you had good timing and stuff like that, which helped make it a little more engaging for me. And he had some cool like uh, parry mechanics and stuff like that and gap closers I liked. But um, yeah, I think the strength is if you switch around characters a lot, Colin. Otherwise, it gets extremely repetitive because the combat's good and it's fun. But after a little while, you just kind of hit a ceiling, I feel like. You know, there's not like a, like a lot of depth there. Not that I expected devil may cry from this or anything like that but well maybe a little bit because platinum worked on it i guess but i was still like impressed how different some of the characters feel from each other but if you're just playing as grand yeah you're gonna get over it real quick uh yeah yeah. i don't know i don't know if i'm gonna stick with it for much longer i mean it's no no no. i'm frankly i'm shocked you're still playing it well i just want to get to the end like there's a there's a chapter zero afterwards and then there's like another like final quest and i'm like what is this Uh, i just i want to get to i'm so close i've done almost all of the optional hunts at this point Mm -hmm. the the one hunt i have to do left that's available to me right now is like level 90 and since my character's never level 94 and everyone else is level 69 or whatever it's just i can't manage it right (laughs) now. sure yeah yeah i got pretty close i actually got to like 20 or 19 percent left of his health and and, and i ended up running out of the the kind of like the the revitalization bar Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was, yeah. that was the end of it. Yeah, uh, I do like the boss fights in this game. I think they're pretty cool. I do like a lot of the mechanics they do. Like, <laughs> if you've played Final Fantasy 14, these are like Final Fantasy 14 boss fights, 100%. All the stuff on the floor, the markers, the stuff like that, staying out of the zones. I think those are cool. Like some of them, there's like the uh, the wind one column that pushes you back and mm-hmm. you got to like not fall into the little gap to take a lot of damage. I like stuff like that. But I think the game's fine. It's okay. Like, it's hard for me to recommend this game to anyone who's not big into JRPGs already. This is not going to be the one to get you into it. And yeah, the story, I had no idea either, Colin, was happening in the story. I'd never, I've played some of the fighting games, which were fun, but I never saw the anime. All right, so I didn't really understand what was going on. And um, I think the game looks pretty nice, though, visually. It, like, runs good, at least. And I like the art style of it, but it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm playing Forbidden West where I'm like, whoa, this is a fucking showpiece. It's nowhere near like that, but I think it has a nice look to it. But um, yeah, 
gray blue it's cool i beat the campaign and i was like all right i'm not gonna play anymore i'm good right now i think if you had friends or if you're like really into monster hunter kind of stuff or like replaying missions over and over and that kind of stuff you'll get some more out of it but i'm good for now i've had enough yeah, I don't know I how, how much more I'll give to it. Maybe yeah. a little bit more, but I think, but yeah, I might, I might be about done. Yeah, as well. you're running out of steam, dude. You got better stuff to play, dude. Definitely. <laughs> now, I, now I do. And that was, again, the, 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 the reality of that game just for a couple of weeks was it yeah. was kind of in the perfect pocket. You gave it mm. a hell of a shake, dude. Uh, let's see. Papa Flo wrote in, Hey, Summoners. I've never played a game like Grand Blue Fantasy, and I quite enjoyed the demo. However, hearing the feedback from Colin that the game's combat becomes repetitive, I am curious. Is there a game or multiple games that we would recommend or that we would recommend that may be similar to Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, but more fleshed out in its combat systems? Uh, I always think of Tales with this game, Colin, but I don't think the combat's more fleshed out in Tales compared to this at all. It mm. might be even more limited, I think, about it. But Tales does everything else better. Story, exploration, world. Well, I think I think that the Tales thing only is only puddle deep with this game. Yes, like it, it, it aesthetically looks like Tales, but they they really aren't. They aren't really similar. I actually think the Tales combat is way better than Grand Blue Fantasy, in my opinion. Really, but it's, it's different because it's more radial based and like menu based. And yeah, that's true. I don't know. I, yeah, because I, I did play Tales of Arise and Grand Blue Fantasy back to back. And I platinumed mm. Arise and went right into the DLC. And then I played some of the DLC and then I went right into Grand Blue Fantasy. And so I was very much in that mode. And I did feel like this was a lot more hack and slash. Like I said, in the past, Grand Blue, there are times where Grand Blue Fantasy comes off like a Mousseau or something. It's it's yeah, very sure. hack and slashy and not it's trivially hard. If you it, it's it's very easy. Yeah, that's even on the hardest difficulty. It's easy. Yeah. And that's not a problem for me necessarily. Like Final Fantasy no. 16 is easy, too. But mm hmm. But I think uh, it could have used more fleshing out. Again, I just don't, I wonder where the like what took all this time. It, it, I'm <laughs> well, waiting to I, be blown away by something. You know, I wonder if it was maybe their first time making a game like this side games and maybe they didn't have a lot of experience. And they had a lot of headaches along the way. I don't know, because I don't know why it took so long either. I would love to find out. Um, maybe if you're looking for a game with combat kind of like it, Maybe try the near games out. Those are certainly much better games with much better story and probably better combat, too. But if you want like that action flow combat, maybe check those out. Uh, what is the remake? Rec I forgot what they made the remake was called of one. Something with an R. Replicant. Replicant. That's it. Yeah, you can check out Replicant and Automata. All right. This is from Sean Mason. Hello, Summoners. I've been immersed in Grand Blue Fantasy lately, and it's been an absolute bat uh, blast. The dynamic gameplay is incredibly engaging and enjoyable. The boss battles in particular stand out as impressive set pieces. With the storyline, or while the storyline may lack depth, my overall experience has been thoroughly enjoyable. Best, uh, Sean M. Well, that's good, Sean. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I think there's fun to be had here, but not as quite as much as I was looking for. It sounds like Colin... Well, Colin you're just addicted to this game for an unhealthy reason it sounds like you just got to see what the fuck's going on yeah end. i'm just curious i'm just very curious it's it's it is sunk it is some cost i find some of the characters charming and stuff i just sure. i don't really know what's going on in the story the the setting's cool the archipelago in the air kind of airship yeah thing cool. very cool but yeah again it's there's just not much to it just two hub worlds and mm -hmm. a lot of choices and menus side quests where you can just when you beat the game you can use the left trigger and then a menu comes up and you could just automatically teleport to any part of the town. You can teleport to people that give you quests. Sometimes you accept the quests already have what they need and just press triangle again. The quest is over in two seconds. There's like a lot of sloppiness here that doesn't indicate the game was in development for as long as it was. Although maybe yeah. that does indicate it and then I was done more on a shoestring, but I'd love to know more about what yeah, went wrong the, with this game. The environments are pretty like going through them. I would say it's pretty straightforward too. Mm -hmm. It's not a whole lot of depth there. No, not at all. So yeah <laughs> all right dudes i've been playing foam stars a little bit yeah let's talk about this it. game came out was very curious about it. i played it back in the summer and i thought it was all right i didn't when i heard people like said it was a game of the show i was very surprised about some of those comments i couldn't believe that actually but it came out in plus so i figured why the hell not no one at last stand is probably going to try this game anyway so i thought <laughs> i would 
uh, Foam Stars is, I think at its core, there's something there, but everything else is done kind of pretty poorly, I would say. Uh, so basically, the whole game is you are these characters, like these heroes or whatever, like from Overwatch that have everyone uses foam guns and that's how you get things done. It has a very playful aesthetic and storyline. You know, you're shooting guys with foam, they get wrapped up. And the whole way you like eliminate people is you shoot them with your foam gun, then they get up in a little ball and you have a surfboard you ride on, kind of like a split two when you go underground or like underneath the paint and go through there. Sure. You have like a surfboard you go across the foam with and you ram into them and they go flying and that's how you get eliminations. Or if you don't, they'll eventually die after a certain amount of time. But what's interesting though, is if someone's caught up in a foam ball, when your teammates, you can rescue them also like that. So that's kind of interesting, but the main, there's like two main modes. I would say right now to play as the first one is like this, uh, MVP mode. So the game is four V four players fight against each other. Whoever's doing the best becomes the MVP of their team. And to win, you need to destroy the other team's MVP. So if you're playing well, then you become the MVP. You got to kind of maybe hang back because you don't want to. If you get wiped out, your t- it's over. Your game, your team loses. But you also kind of want to be aggressive to get the other player. So kind of nice little thing balance here and there. It's fine. Nothing special. The other mode is called like rubber. Let me. What did I? I wrote this down somewhere. It's like rubber duck party. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's a payload. Uh, mode essentially so in the middle of the map there is a giant rubber duck that whoever's team's controlling it it slowly moves across the map and depending on who's controlling it you can move it back and forward like that but what's funny about the duck is if you're on the duck one of you can choose to dance on this duck you hold circle and your character will start dancing (laughs) and it starts to move but if you build up a little meter you can't really do anything while you're dancing but if you build up this meter all the way the duck will go flying forward and at a much faster pace, so it's kind of a risk reward thing. I love that. And th- yeah, this mode's okay. I think this is the most entertaining mode. I had the most fun doing this one because you got a little t- more time to like explore some of the levels. I felt like had a little more verticality to them, a little more exploration. So that was nice. Uh, a couple of the characters, one of them, the basic one you start with, she has these two foam guns, and she has like a you have two special moves. She has like a her L one. She like jumps really high in the air and shoots a bunch of foam. Her other one's kind of like a foam grenade. And everyone else has an alt and hers is she goes like a giant bubble and runs around and just rolls into people, which is kind of fun. There's this other guy I liked. He was like a shark kind of character. He uh, had like a foam shotgun. So he's better up close. He could go underground like a shark and he had like a little foam shark fin. He could run into people and his alt was like sending out a giant shark, which is kind of fun. And those two modes are okay, but I think they're fun, but there's not enough there to keep me coming back. And I was like, all right, this is fine for a few rounds, but I'm not too into it. There's <laughs> there's PVE story mode missions also where you get a little context for the characters like the shark kid. I think his name's Agito or something. And he's a like a pro gamer kind of thing. So you find out about that, his life a little bit as you're playing. But goddamn, these missions are so boring. What it was is oh. you're defending a point. Think of Sunset Overdrive, Colin, where you mm. defended those points except there's one point it's behind you and there's nothing to the environment you're at. It was just flat and there was just kind of like slow waves of enemies coming at you and they're ch- kind of chatting about the character's life. And that was it. That was mission one. I did another mission is exactly the same. I was like, wow, this really sucks. Mm. It's cool. You could get a little context from them, but it was extremely boring where I would never want to do with anyone else. There's also like some chip things you can get to kind of power up your character in this mode. But like, I just don't want to do it anymore. I'm over that. Fuck that. Uh, there's also uh, you can do this with some friends, too. If you want to squad up with your buddies, if you can manage them to do it with you, I guess. Uh, there is a ranked mode, which is cool. I always appreciate a ranked mode. And there was private lobbies, I guess, if you want to host a private game. Sure. You also have like a little hub where you can restart at. You access everything through there and you can decorate it if you want stuff like that. One thing that really bothered me about this game, though, is when you're in a match, you you like you finish a match or whatever. You can't opt to just go into another match automatically. It sends you back to your hub. So then I have to re go in the menu to queue up for another game. It's just like, just let me fucking keep queuing up. I don't want to go back every time. Yeah. So that was a huge bummer. And oh, boy, oh, boy, the microtransaction this game. They are pretty expensive. A lot of them. The battle pass or whatever. It's yeah. like six bucks. That's pretty standard. No big deal. Whatever. 
uh, a, like a pack. So I looked at this pack. It was like a bundle pack. It was like, uh, I think I wrote down what it was. Okay, so there was a full pack that I wrote down. A full pack that comes with one character skin, one gun skin, one bubble bestie skin. I think that's like a little accessory or something. A surfboard skin, two surfboard skins, one panel, which is like decorations for your profile, and 30 party poppers, which are XP boosts for matches. <laughs> <laughs> I want Not you boys. Party poppers in the I want you to stuff. guess how much this was. Just go ahead and give me a guess. I don't know. I, I have no gauge for this sort of thing because I was so surprised when I found out people were spending twenty dollars on Fortnite skins. But <laughs> uh, I'll say fifteen dollars. Dang it! Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm I'm fearing the worst, so I'm gonna say twenty. Okay, so this pass, this bundle was forty four ninety nine. Holy shit! Why? What do they say? Why do they? How do they justify that? Or do I hell divers just because thing. of all the shit in it, the bundle. Well, to give you more context, a character skin was ten ninety nine. 11 bucks. So this is kind of expensive, especially for Foam Stars, a game that might not even be around in a year. So, you know, when you're buying Fortnite skin, at least you're like, well, I don't think Fortnite's going away no, anytime no, soon. Da, no, no, definitely not. Soon. Yeah. So you're probably pretty chill there. But Foam Stars, I don't know. It's a weird game because I think some of the core concepts are cool. Like some of it works well, like the foam. It's kind of neat when you can like fight over foam with other players like Splatoon, Dagon. Yeah. But you can if you you can like stack foam up top to get high ground and stuff oh, like that's that. That's cool. So there and are some people are better at that than others. Some are more focused on eliminating. I think there's like an interesting blueprint here and it could be decent, but it's everything else is pretty bare bones and the microtransactions are just insanely expensive. I cannot see this game lasting very long, which is a shame. Let me ask you a question. Be decent. Yes. Let me let me because just for some clarity, I didn't. This game wasn't on my radar at all until people started to mention it a little unfairly, mm-hmm. I think, in the whole Pow World conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, is this game copying Splatoon and the whole thing? So, what I got from watching demos, first of all, I like what you said about it feeling a little flat and vacant because I even got that from the demos. I was like, there's something yeah. about the environments here that feel really generic. And you think of Splatoon's amazing art direction. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a it's an immersive world. It's very distinctive. It's very colorful. Right. Mm-hmm. I know this is a little different. But I know this has a little bit more of an anime flavor and everything like that. But so if I'm understanding correctly though, from what I ascertained from what I've heard about the game, it's not like Splatoon in that it's not a turf war in the conventional sense where right. You're not, it's not about how much coverage my ink has right. compared, my yellow ink has compared to your pink ink. Yeah, completely It's different. about coverage so that you could maneuver and mm-hmm. sort of have better accessibility in the levels. In other words, have a better, have an upper hand in combat. Yeah, right? it's all about movement essentially. Okay. And being able Which to is cool. I like, yeah. I like that. And I like the idea of whatever, foam, soap, suds or mm-hmm. whatever, because- what you mentioned, which I didn't even think about. Like, it's not just a sense of like topical coverage. There's a verticality to it. You could build it up. Mm -hmm. So you could like, you know, for height and all that kind of thing, which is a, that's a really cool addition that, you know, to the gameplay that doesn't exist in something like Splatoon. And also just something about inventive, I guess, hypothetically more nonviolent third person Mm -hmm. shooters kid-friendly third-person shooter. It's very kid-friendly. That's friendly. a pretty wide-open... Yeah, Splatoon does it great. It's Nintendo first-party IP. It's going to be hard to follow that, but there's right. space for other things, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm interested sure. in checking it out. I'm, I'm sorry that it's it's not as good as it sounded like it was. I think, yeah, I think you could hop in the match. If you play, like, a couple matches a day, you could have a good, decent time, but if you're looking to sink some time, like, some time into this game nah i don't think there's enough there to keep you invested Mm. but you know like you're saying like i think if you got some young kids also it's a great game for them to probably play it's not violent at all characters don't even die really or anything like that and it's very friendly like the tone of the game is very friendly they make sure like everyone's it's like a party everyone's having a good time stuff like that i like that yeah the 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 environment it's called like bath vegas or something it's like some different version of vegas it reminds me of uh the oh vegas God. level in sonic 2 almost like the background that's what it reminds me of almost but uh 
it's okay. I don't think it's going to have leg zone. I think it's going to not last. But it's on plus if you're curious about it. You could check it out if you want to give it a spin. Uh, Davey Supil wrote in. What's up, the cuties of gaming? I got to say, <laughs> He's talking to I me. like foam stars. I predominantly play competitive games, but I really like Splatoon. The problem is it's almost impossible to get a team on that stinky machine. So I'd have a team of re... Oh, I don't think I can say that. <laughs> who don't know how to play the game versus an elite group of tryhards. At least on PS5. I, convince, I can convince some friends to download Foam Stars because it was a PS Plus game. Looking forward to learning the meta and splashing my oh, smegma all over the other team. Uh. Thanks for keeping the show dope and stay fresh. Gross. Good dodge, first of all, Brad. Good <laughs> Say dodge. it, no balls. Davey almost had you. Yeah, I couldn't do it. You dodged it. I'll get more warmed up in the LSM cultures we continue on. <laughs> if you're not. It's just new for I you. I know there's some heinous shit out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is from Matt Vigo. Hey, guys. Booted up Foam Stars the other night to get all, the, to get all wet and bubbly. Figured it'd be a great one to throw on podcast and trophy hunt what is going on with this trophy list though no platinum and only like 12 trophies that are all pretty uninspired come on square it's so funny whenever there's some sort of trophy drama about a game i always hear people wanting colin's opinion about it oh of course an absurdly yeah, amount of people i'm one of the ambassadors of, of i know you are a trophy ambassador dude when i i said it but when i when i basically convinced psn profiles to make a shovelware um like a shovelware option on their website, I knew I had power in, trophy, in, in trophies. So I, yeah. I, I take it I take it very seriously, this ambassadorship. Yeah, you, got, you got power, dude. Yeah, I saw this, and it's not a huge surprise based on, Brad, the way you describe the game. It doesn't seem that there's very much to it. There, mm-hmm. the, the rules used to be that you had to basically have a, a retail game for a platinum trophy, a retail style game, and then obviously re- every game beginning with PS4 was digital, so that no, no longer made sense and there were some exceptions to the rule back then but then slowly they started to bend the rules for trophies to where basically if your game is of a certain size they they suggest you don't have a platinum and if it's above a certain size then they suggest you do have a platinum but all you really have to do is ask them or just put it in and you're going to get through qa pretty easily um so this is an option nonetheless Mm -hmm. and it could have been something that they did to make the game more sticky for it trophy collectors because the reality is, is a lot of trophy people won't touch it at all because it doesn't have a platinum so it, because they're, they're not even interested in getting the trophies if it's not going to get a platinum at the end right. of it so right. they did hurt themselves and i'm surprised with sony's in, um kind of it's not second party it's third party but sony's hands are on this game and i'm always surprised when things like this get through and no one had said to them like you might want to consider this instead right. you might want to go in and just make a few more triggers or even just make them all gold and silver trophies and just give yourself a platinum trophy keep the trophy list the same like you would think you would get that kind of advice because that, that that does that does help stickiness it seems that achievements and trophies are not as big as they once were no. with with people but they're still relevant highly relevant yeah. and, and yeah, helps yeah, to sell are. games so yeah i was surprised i was surprised by that but then when i hear you describe the game as something with not a lot to it it seems like they kind of stuck to the rules and then didn't really wiggle out and then you would expect Sony to give them the advice that they could wiggle out but they didn't and mm-hmm. and it's it's not very rare but it's becoming increasingly rare for games to come out without a platinum trophy at all no matter like what the game is yeah uh this last one's from Brandon Breland hey everyone my girlfriend Jasmine has a question for you guys this week she's been watching me play foam stars this week through PlayStation Plus and she wants to know why does this game exist why does it contain sexual windows about foaming on your friends does a Splatoon ripoff even deserve to exist? Thanks, guys. Well, I don't know about these foaming sexual into windows. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, that must be some playing. weird character story. <laughs> but I, I don't want to hear any part of that. Uh, Splatoon ripoff? There's definitely, of course, Splatoon inspirations from it. But it's at least it's not Turf War. I mean, you're not like weird, hideous squid children in it either. So I guess that helps separate it. But Splatoon is a better game. Much better much better no surprise there i again no, it, no. i think this is the beginning of the end of or maybe the end of the end of square enix's random attempts maybe. to do this because i think the only so think about it, it's like uh 
they shed Crystal Dynamics. They, the Avengers kind of goes away. So that didn't work. They had Babylon's Fall of Platinum Games. That was a non-starter. They had Outriders, which I think is a really great game. And it seems like that might be the only one of these games as a service that continues. And then they have this game that is obviously not going anywhere. And, and certainly, uh, I just I just love thinking about it as part of a package deal. Like, There's just no doubt. They were like, so mm-hmm. you can have Final Fantasy VII Remake and Final Fantasy XVI and maybe even Dragon Quest Twelve and other things, but you're definitely taking Forspoken. You're definitely taking Foam Stars off mm-hmm. of our hands. You're going to market these games for us and we're going to put it on PS Plus. We're not going to, we're going to get a nice little cut and all that. So there's just, it's just fun to, to to be able to read through those deals by seeing how these games, because there's no way that Sony thought that this was going to do anything for them. Right. They, they, there's, they had to figure out a way to get it out. I think that, as I said earlier, there is some curiosity between it and Helldivers proximity, mm-hmm. but um, it seems like it doesn't really matter anyway. And the, the, the microtransactions seem preclusive. I don't even understand the point of making these games. Yeah, and, I don't oh, get that's it. Odd. You know, so you I know, haven't seen it's... Splatoon copied really. So yeah. it is a good game to copy, of but, course. but, um, it's one of those things. It, it reminds me actually of Cuphead or something where if you copy a game like that, it's obvious. And, oh, and it's yeah. the same thing with this. It's, it's just obvious. Setting it's the bar, the, 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 setting the bar really high. Like, you know what I mean? Like here it is, you know, we're going to make the third per the fate, the safe family friendly, kid friendly shooter. Now you do it, you know, type of thing. It's like, it's mm-hmm. already set so high. I, I don't know though. I like companies like, don't you pigeonhole my square Enix? Like, you know, I like the quirky <laughs> game. Like, dude, try something new, you know, that type of thing. Do you, sure. Are you saying they made it specifically to tie into a package deal? No, I'm oh. saying that like they probably had these various games in development. Like Forspoken is a great example. Like, there's just no way Sony saw that and they're like, yeah, we want that. There's just right, no right, right. way that that happened. They had so what, what ended up. Other. Yeah, it's like we have these kind of other things that are in peril. More. Yeah, there's just like it, it, these kinds of deals happen all the time. There's just no there's no way that a great example is Final Fantasy seven remake was a one year exclusive and it's still not on anything else. Like th- this clearly comes from a place of reworking the deal, <laughs> you know, and sure. it's like, well, what, you can imagine. I'm not saying this is what happened, but you can imagine Forspoken being in that where it's like, OK, we have this, you know, 40 million dollar game that's not very good. We're doing the best we can with it. Can you market it in three state of play states of play? Can we have two PlayStation blog posts? Will you pay 50 percent of our marketing costs? Will we get a better division of the money at the at the back end in turn? we'll make this game exclusive and you get final fantasy 16 and like that, that kind of shit happens. Mm. And, and so I think, no, I don't think it comes from that. I think it's from, honestly, I think Babylon's fall was probably so catastrophically expensive for them that they really needed to find a partner for this game pretty urgently. Cause they made basically right. nothing on that game. And that was just, and they, they made the mistake. It's not a mistake. I appreciate it, but they released it, which means they can't write it off. So that's true. Yeah, it, that's what's happening with that Wiley e. Coyote movie right now. Is that you know that movie's basically going to be deleted from existence um, <laughs> to be able to write it off. So yeah, <laughs> man, they did Avengers also. They have not had yeah. good, a lot of good live service games. Seems their MMOs do fine in some of the other mobile games. Yeah, maybe, 14, but, 11 still alive. Yeah. Dragon Quest Ten is yeah. alive. I, I am. Um, I don't begrudge. It's the same thing with Sony with fair games. And Concord, where I'm like, I don't begrudge you chasing this. I mean, of course you want to be here. I just mm-hmm. think it's it's like, why wouldn't you want to be here? This fucking everyone looks at this stuff and it's like, we can get a little piece of the pie. There's no doubt you just have to do it really deliberately or not at all. And mm-hmm. like no one's going to drop the games. That, no matter how good Foam Stars is, it sounds unlikely that people are going to drop what they're playing to play it. They're not even going to give it a chance. Like there, there needs to be more nose at the, at the, like the pre-production cycle to be like, this game doesn't make any sense. We have to project out three or four years and it's going to look differently. And we're releasing this game into this weird environment. It's going to be called a Splatoon ripoff. Like even if it's not, it's going to be called a Splatoon ripoff. Like anyone can tell you that it's just, it's Mm -hmm. just, it's just, it, it is strange how some things get greenlit. I just, I say that over and over again on sacred in the sense that like, we know so much more about games than you think. Because like sometimes we take it for granted and then you make predictions that even people in the boardroom are like, no, it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, there are so many games where I could have told you the first time I made a real bold prediction like that was with Battleborn. I remember from from Gearbox from like, oh, that game my is God. D.O.A. Yeah. And people were like, oh, no, it's like, a, you know, it's a hero shooter and it's got a chance and a Gearbox and all this. I'm like, there's just no. 
there's just no way that that's going to that's going to happen because you have to imagine people are going to give up on Overwatch or give up on whatever they were playing at the time. And it's just and over and over again, like the Back for Blood enough. was another example of that. And it's just like, I don't know, man, I don't. You got to go all in on great ideas, really collaborative ideas, I think would even be better. Like people should look at what Fortnite did. And actually, I think this is what Disney's doing is kind of just conceding and saying, oh, yeah, we'll take a little piece of this pie and you can fucking make a Fortnite corollary for us and mm-hmm. just go with where where the winners are and not don't even bother trying to siphon people away. You have to make a game not only better than Fortnite, but you have to make a game that attracts enough people to know that it's better than Fortnite and stick with it to know yeah. that it's better. It's just like, it's such a fucking inconceivable. It really is. That's why, I mean, that's why it, it how dire is it when the, when Sony cancels what I understand? Cause I know people that played it a completely great online game that they were like, mm, I don't think so. I mean, Damn. if they, if, they, if they don't want to do it, then with that, then I imagine it's going to be pretty hard sledding for other products. Yeah. Yeah. All right, dudes. Last game. Uh, Persona 3 re- uh, Reload. I've been playing a little more of it. We talked about it in depth last week. So if you want to hear like really in depth thoughts about it, check that episode out. But I've just been chipping away at this game a little bit more, a little further now. And it's really great. I still think Tartarus sucks, despite some of the improvements and the visual stuff. I think it's pretty damn boring to go through. Uh, I think it's the best version of the game too that I recall. It looks it looks nice. It runs really good. It's like 4K, 60 FPS ray tracing. So it's pretty nice. Some there's some nice combat changes like the baton pass kind of thing being in there that I find a really key. And I'm just having a damn good time going through it again, uh, getting to know these characters again after a while because I haven't played this through this since all the way since the PSP version. So it's been great and seeing a lot of the environments fully 3d and getting to like rotate the camera around a lot of them is really great colin please do not play portable mike is playing it now on switch if you're gonna play persona 3 play this version instead trust me yeah i think i probably will i kind of conceded with final thing or uh, persona 5 rather as well with that if i ever get to it which i'm sure i will i will get to it but yeah I, i was thinking about playing the original i like to have context you know it's it, but you're I not feel missing like I, context. But I, you're not but missing. I, but, I, but I all that's probably true. But I also feel like I do have the context because I've watched Micah play it pretty extensively. Yeah, so, you got it. So yeah, I, and well, what I what I think is so remarkable is just how similar to Persona Four it is. Like I didn't I didn't know mm-hmm. that they basically updated nothing. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's basically I don't know if that's just the port for the portable ports or whatever, but. It's like the same sound effects, the same menus. It almost it almost comes oh, yeah. off like the pixel remaster where they've unified well, like, everything after the fact, but it's not unified after the fact. I think they're just re- so it makes it it makes it even more confusing how Persona. I think Persona Four is awesome, but such a beloved game. I'm like it's really built on the skeleton of something else. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, yeah, they keep a lot of the same sound effects throughout the series and stuff like that, like menu sounds, and so you'll get those even in five. It's just how they do it. It's cool. But, um, I don't mind it. It's, yeah, yeah. Not, it's not insulting it because I, I love yeah. Mega Man and those games are just yeah. carbon copies of each other. So it is interesting. Like your party members, there is no social link with with them like there are in later ones, like four and five, stuff like that. So you kind of miss out on some of the the depth with them for now. I'm in earlier parts of the game still, and I know you get to know them more, but it is just interesting how much this series has evolved over time. And I think Persona 3 is kind of the birth of modern Persona as we know it. So it's cool to see it get a new version of the game, a much more accessible version. So, yeah, man, I'd recommend it. It's on Game Pass, too. So if you have PC or Xbox, you're curious about it, you can just hop in there right away. Uh, Let's see. Adam Begarby. Oh, Bill Harby wrote in. Greetings to the Brad Bradster, Colster and Dagster. Hold on a second. Yeah. Oh, Dagster. Dagster. We gotta talk about this. I know there's some Dagster <laughs> gate going on right now, dude. It's so fresh. How did I know this? Start? Did I? I started this, didn't I? You yeah, started it, the Dagster. It's so, it's so casual. Thing though. Is, the thing is, Dagan, it's caught on now. It really has. It's catching on. It's shocking. Begrudgingly, to, I think it's catching on because it annoyed Colin so much. <laughs> yeah, that's. That's yeah, just like, like calling. Yeah, it's like calling Constellation Steli. I'm like, I hate that so much. You don't I hate like it so that, much, no. and so now I everyone calls Dustin. it that. Yeah. I blame Dustin for Steli because I call <laughs> Steli a lot now in my mind because of Dustin. Yeah, Steli's catchy. The Dagster, 
I feel like there's two levels to it. Like somebody calling me the Dagster, okay, but calling myself the Dagster also is extra egregious. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's stick with it as long as we can. Yeah, I think we should keep Dagster rolling just to annoy Colin. <laughs> yeah, whatever you gotta so do. do, what you gotta it's, do. <laughs> it's like the most cheesy nickname possible too it's for so you. Bad. <laughs> so, but it's what it's not like the insulting ones I grew up with, like Muffin and Muffin, God, whatever else. Like, you, oh, you don't know the origin of Muffin. So what Muffin, the, people call you Muffin. That was a bully nickname. But let's say it dates it dates back to grade school. Let's say fourth grade. Oh, okay. Because I have Colin and I always talk about we keep our hair short because oh, if we right. don't, we have the crazy tightly the top, woven yeah. Italian mafia yeah. game show host afro thing you know it's nappy it's not good you know and uh yeah they and they you know somebody caught on some slightly older kid caught on that looks like a muffin which it did and then my (laughs) nickname was muffin because they said i had a muffin head that's kind of a cool nickname it was ingenious like even i had to even acknowledge its genius when i was in fourth grade whilst crying being like god these bullies are so smart Muffin, dude. Muffin. I like that. That's cool, dude. Maybe we should get that to trend instead of Dagster. Would you? Would you be more happy with that, Colin? Hashtag Dagen is, is muffin. Yeah. Yeah. What about Muffster? Muffs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's gross, dude. Sounds that's like heinous. something from sounds like something from the Warriors. Something like Strange Wool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's yeah, on yeah, Hinge, right. dude. We will do the muffin. <laughs> Uh, what kind of dialogue choices do you make in games where they really don't matter? I'm playing Persona 3 Reload, and while I usually try to pick choices I myself would make or say, some of these options are too wild to ignore. I've already told a child multiple times that she's to blame for her parents' divorce. So what do you keep? Or so do you keep it serious or do you dabble in the wilder options? Have a good one. I definitely dabble in wilder options when it doesn't really matter. Have fun. And I have done that encounter with that young the young girl, she's like a grade school kid. And you can say you're the reason your parents got divorced. But it does matter so in Persona, doesn't it? In terms well, of some like... Of, some of the dialogues, it does. Like... You get points it matters and, stuff, and maybe... Right? Yeah, you maybe get like more reception points. But I don't think those happen until you get further into the relationships. I could be wrong, though. But it's not like you get locked out of the character or some shit or anything like that, you know? But uh, I think it's fun to goof around with some of the the dialogue choices. This is the game series I feel worst about not having jumped into yet. It, but, but I know what a time, what a they are time sink it's going to be. Yeah, they're long. Yeah, oh, man. I think they're really good, but they're long. They're supposed to be they're amazing. Like, they sound yeah. so good to me. Every time somebody tells me another one, like, that sounds like a game made for the Dakester. And yeah. I don't know. Or the Muffster. <laughs> the Muffster. <laughs> the Muffster. <laughs> <laughs> but I just can't jump into a 60-hour yeah, game. I just can't do it. They're on Switch now, or a lot of them at least. Yeah, I so know. That does help. They're more accessible now than ever. Yeah. And I don't know. It's I gotta, a bummer because get there. Persona 5 is my favorite one, and it's the longest one. So is that the longest like, one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like three is like probably like 60. Then I don't remember what four is, Colin. What do you think? Like 80? It's been yeah. a while. Yeah. That's a long game. Yeah. Four and, is four was yeah. I play I was I'm thinking like four I played with a guide like a social link guide and it still mm. took a really long time because the the dungeons are long and you have to kind of grind if you want if you want to unlock the different cards and mm-hmm. if you want to do that stuff yeah yeah well, which i think is somewhat relevant to the experience in the game i mean you sure. there is there are difficulty levels where you can make it somewhat trivial mm-hmm. so yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah interesting yeah and Monday. persona 5 the base version of the game is over 100 hours wow probably like 110 and Royals probably like twenty more hours, I guess, or something like that. It's like so disrespectful more. of your time, but that's totally fine. I mean, you know, it's what like Dra- love- it, Dr- Dragon Quest Eleven was the last game that was so disrespectful. That's supposed time. to be another one. Be <laughs> kidding me with this, man. Jesus. Yeah, but that speaks Dude, to I'm- a good game. Only a mm-hmm. game, go- only a great game could be even dare to be that long, right? Yeah, that's why it's, it's extra yeah. tempting. I don't know. Yeah, if you can make it through to the end, yeah. Or, like I made it through five, and I was like sad it was over. Because I enjoyed it so much, but it's so long. We play them in like, retirement. The Gen Xers will play these games in retirement. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know? yeah, yeah. Still got time. Okay, so this is from Dylan Michaels. Last question for Persona. Hey, Summoners, for anybody playing Persona Three Reload, without spoiling anything, how do you feel about the party? This is my second time experimenting, or yeah, 
exp- uh, experimenting with Persona 3 story, and I can't help but feel like the party, while friendly to one another, aren't friends on the level of P4 and P5. It's pretty unusual for a JRPG party to not seem like they're best friends. I also think it kind of sucks you can't start their social links until much later in the game. Okay. But I still really like the ch- or characters individually. How do you feel about these characters? Uh, I I like the characters. You definitely see some of the archetypes for later Persona characters, like uh, Junpei, if you meet very early on, is pretty much the Yusuke role. Your best bro kind of character. Very up or very peppy, I guess. Um, I it's been so long since I've played through this game. It's hard for me to compare them to one another, but they definitely is a slower burn in a lot of ways where you don't feel like super great friends with them. It, uh, Persona four and five. I feel like you get to know these characters on an intimate level or more of them on an intimate level. If you choose to much earlier on in the game, which is, I think a strength, they Atlas just probably learned over time developing these games and how to really flesh them out. But I still think the characters are good, especially in the end. Like, I think Persona 3 overall has a very good story. But I think the start is kind of slow. So if you're a little worried about it, just stick with it. And I think you'll be happy by the end. Is this oh, writer someone... saying that everybody has to be friends in a party? Because don't discount like the antagonistic relationship that slowly blossoms into a friendship. That's interesting. Yeah, That's good sure. character yeah, yeah. development. It's right? not in like, well... I won't get into it. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. I guess just with four and five, the characters are kind of more friendly with each other. There's obviously some that aren't like, um, what's the guy in four's name? Call him blonde. Ryuji? No. Oh, I don't remember the anyone's chair. name in that. Something with a the, the K. He's the, he's the one that's like the kind of the, 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 the punk one. Bully. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's really not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He's a real. Yeah. Softy. I don't remember anyone's name in that game. No, don't even ask me anyone's name at all. <laughs> hey, that's fair enough. It's been a while. Uh, we're going to get some questions to end the show. I had a question further up. I forgot to read that I kind of want to call his opinion on because they specifically asked about Colin. So we can fit it in here. Good. Oh, this is from Chase H. Fit by it the way. in. Yeah. Fit it in. <laughs> uh, good day, summoners. This one goes mostly out to Colin because of his intense stance and how people who play a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth need to have played Remake, and you can't play Remake without the original. My question is, I guess, can you elaborate, please? I only ask because there are some people, such as myself, who have never played a Final Fantasy game, and I don't really understand why I'd want to play a lesser version of the game instead of just getting the full Rebirth model of the game. Thank you, as always. Praise the sun. Because it's not a remake. Watch the spoilers. <laughs> yeah. As much yeah. as you can. Yeah. No, I'm not I'm not gonna spoil spoil it because it's not a remake. It's a remake, but I don't know. I don't know how to explain it's, it. Like they like I, they're, they're different ga- they're different games. And yes, they're fundamentally they different games. And I also don't as much as I like as much as I love Final Fantasy VII Remake, let's cool the jets on it being better than Final Fantasy VII, which it's not. The original? I mean, no. Yeah. Um, they're obviously very different games, but Final Fantasy VII is a seminal mm-hmm. game, and it's in no way better than than it was in the remake version. It's different. And mm-hmm. what makes them so fun to play and so vital to play, I think, is their connections to each other. And I don't want to get any further into it than that. It's different than we're going to get that two or that, that what is it? 2d HD kind of Octopath Traveler mm-hmm. style Dragon Quest three remake at mm-hmm. some point. Oh, is that and right? when that happens, I don't think it's going to be, I'm very, in, I'm very familiar with Dragon Quest three. It's not going to be necessary for you to re- replay Dragon Quest three on NES or Famicom in order or the game, the game boy color versions or whatever the fuck you want to play mm. to play that. Cause it's a straight up remake. And I actually feel maybe this is the same way about persona three remake in some sense where these are more faithful. There's something again, I don't want to get too deep in it. It's different. It's just different. Final fantasy seven yeah. is, is uniquely different in that it is. Yeah. I'll just leave it there. Just, but but yeah. just play just play them both. Just play them all, and you'll understand. Yeah. So ideally, I would say play the original because when you play remake and the games after, like Rebirth, 
things are going to hit much harder for you. Things you will notice things that you would not have noticed otherwise. Things will make sense to you that you might that might not make sense to you. And I totally get people are trying to get caught up for rebirth and not everyone has time. But just keep that in mind. If you want like the the crazy true, if you want to see the game for everything it has to offer, <coughs> I would say play the original if you can and Crisis Core. And even having children. Well, mm. let me this I guess this would be a spoiler, so I guess I'll I'll warn everyone ahead of time and take maybe you okay. want to take your headphones off for 10 seconds because you don't want to probably want to hear this care either. About spoilers. Oh really? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Is that really don't. Final Fantasy 7 and Final Fantasy 7 remake both took place? Yes. Yep. Just keep that in mind. That's all. That's all like they're not know. it's not just one thing. They Great. both happened. That's and you'll understand spoiler. when you play. You know? mm. So that's the end of the spoiler. Cut off. Yeah. Boom. <clears throat> so yeah. All right. This is from Andre. Hello, the Dagath Dagator. Dagan Ator and his flunkies. Or you know what? Let me re Daganator. That's probably how you okay. do it. And his All flunkies. Right. Daganator, dude, you have so many nicknames already. That's a, that's a the, good the, one. The gat, the ganitor. <laughs> the ganitor. I was about to say it like that. <laughs> the ganitor. <laughs> that's that's, that's a good boss one. energy. I like it. it, it the ganitor. <laughs> Dagan a tour. Daganator. I'm starving. What are some indie games that you have played that are adored yet didn't connect with you? And on the opposite side of the coin, what is an indie game that you think is an absolute must play? Mm. I personally was just bored to tears with Fez when that was released. I could never understand the hype, but I recently picked up Sifu, and I think it's one of the greatest indie games that has been released in recent memory due to it being a perfectly balanced of challenge and replayability. Thanks so much. And Colin dot dot dot. Oh, <laughs> like it's like a ninja gaiden cutscene it's fresh yeah. um it's fresh so he's saying indie games specifically yeah yep yeah i, I was wondering that because like i'm like i'm not even sure sifu is really an indie game but i think people there's two things about indie games generally which which were funny to me is that and you guys might remember this brad you were in the industry so you certainly remember is there was there mm -hmm. was this there was this prevailing notion for years that people were like oh i don't want to play that shit yeah, I don't want to down. I don't I don't play downloadable games and I don't play mm -hmm. $10 games and all this stuff. And now everyone's like up these games asses because this is where all of the innovation happens. It's extremely exciting to have smaller games coming from smaller studios that are viable. It's a pretty rare thing because so many operations are going belly up and games don't sell and things just come and go and the market's very crowded and it's God, man, I can't even imagine. A, well, may, actually, it's not really true. All all entertainment mediums are dog eat dog right now. Like there's just a fucking glut of music in red letter media. They're always making fun of all these movies and TV shows that are out. Like you don't even know what the hell any of these things are. And it's the same thing that happens in games. And so a little bit of freshness coming from the indie space where people can invest a little bit, maybe even on the side from a big job and then find that right chemistry that happens with games pretty often actually. And so I'm excited to to see the future right there. What, what, what's that game that just saw? Uh, Ultros, right? Is the one that's mm -hmm. just coming out. Uh, yeah. Got good that reviews. Right. And uh, there are a few others coming out as well. Pacific Drive. But the, but again, I I use inter, I, like Kepler Interactive is publishing Pacific Drive. It's not really an indie game. It's just a small game. We're kind of losing. That's a big misnomer. And that's not it's what a, that's not what yes. this is about. But that's the, but like well, Lily Moe's huge in, conversation. Yeah. My studio is a is an indie studio we're like a real indie we don't have a publisher we we fund oh, our right. own games that's independent but insomniac was an independent studio and so it's not mm -hmm. necessarily or bungie was it's not necessarily what's a good example now uh remedy is an independent studio mm -hmm. and that's kind of mm -hmm. insane so it's it doesn't also encompass what we know it means and so i just think we need to be that's again another conversation but like we need a better way to describe indie games and people just think it's like oh smaller games and it's like well small games aren't necessarily independent and big games aren't right. necessarily published by people so i'm off on a fucking yeah. diatribe anyway I <laughs> <laughs> we're listening we're listening dude 
uh day is there any indie games you could think of yeah that were hot I mean, and you couldn't get into yeah i got i got one for each of those i mean the one i have to say and it's not that i have i wasn't able to get into it it's just that i haven't had the time to really get sink myself into it yet is hollow knight you know mm. team cherry oh, so 2017 good. beautiful i mean i was really attracted to it because of the art direction initially i was like what is this crazy sort of 2d meets nightmare before christmas thing going on and then i when i heard before it came out because i remember i finally bought it on the switch for my son before it came out i heard it was a metroidvania so and i was looking i mean colin remember this i was fixing to get my my son into castlevania and i wanted him to play symphony in the night and i was like i'll just acclimate him i want to acclimate him into the idea of a metroidvania in a classical sense so hollow knight Seems like it'll be a cool introduction, a more contemporary introduction than he could go back and play the vintage games that we grew up with in that same model. So, but I never sat down and really got into Hollow Knight yet, although I know I'm gonna I'm gonna love it. But again, that's mm-hmm. another game that's it's very difficult. Yeah, it's supposed to be hard. I like that. Yeah, you know, I'm down for that. I'm down I for I couldn't do you know, everything no- in it. I couldn't do all the optional stuff. It was some of it was too hard. Was it really? Like I just I don't want to smash my head against the wall. Over from and over a puzzle again. perspective, you're saying? No, no, no. From a combat perspective, no. like there's some yeah. really difficult combat in the game, like oh, optional see, bosses that's... and stuff that are fucking hard as hell. Oh, dude, that yeah. sounds so yeah. fun to me. Yeah, yeah. I, that's a big romance. Like optional. that's a that's one on the top of my back. Like I have to play that soon. Mm-hmm. You know yeah, that? that sequel comes out this year, I think. Finally. Yeah, <laughs> that's we'll right. See. <laughs> we'll see. That's the I feel other. Like thing. I've been he- hearing that for years. Is it? Yeah, it's supposed to be this year though. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, Silk Song. It's, it's cool. Go- I mean, the game is just gorgeous. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's the type of thing too. Like Kyle knows how I like to play games. I don't, no guides, no internet walk, no YouTube walkthroughs, like just pure, try to figure mm-hmm. it out, bang my head against the wall if I need to. It sounds like it's going to be a frustrating one. Um, so that right. sounds good. And then um, the other one that n- I never hear anybody talk about this game. I believe it's pronounced Gris. I've heard it pronounced Gris. Grease. G-R-I. Grease. Grease. Okay. Yeah. Oh, all right, Brad. I'm talking. Brad knows this shit. I reviewed it, so I know. Oh, you did? Yeah. Gorgeous, dude. What yeah, a beautiful game. I don't even remember mm-hmm. how... I, I played it on Switch. I don't even remember how it... Like, how I heard of it. I don't even remember mm-hmm. what turned me on to it initially. But I know... I remember it was Nomada Studio. I think they have another game. Not a not Greece, but a new game coming out this year. Mm. But be- just beautifully executed, really gorgeous watercolor graphics, and a very emotional experience. Like when you turn one of those games where, if you look at the graphics in conjunction with the music, it's very. And I know the whole thing, without spoiling it, is about um, sort of coming to terms with grief and depression and all that kind of thing. It's just really gorgeous, really kind of unique, um, very unconventional. And uh, I know a lot of people haven't even heard of it, let alone played it. So that's one that I would definitely turn people onto. And mm-hmm. I think it was only like six hours, eight hours. Yeah, it's pretty short. Kind of yeah. brief. So mm-hmm. definitely digestible. That was a good one. Yeah. Uh, so an indie game that's very celebrated. But when I played it, when it came out, I just I didn't get it. I need to revisit it though. Maybe I'll enjoy it more now. Was uh, the Outer Wilds, which is this space exploration game where you pretty much go out into space and you there's a riddle or a mystery going on. You kind of solve it by exploring the galaxy, but there is a time loop thing that resets every twenty minutes or so. I think like that. It just resets everything, and it makes sense for the story and all that. Like that, it ties into it. But I just got so annoyed when I was exploring out there, getting into something, then it just whoop, take me all the way back. And I was like, well, I wish I was still exploring that. Now I just got to fucking go all the way back there and try to get it's like Majora's further. mask when you're in the middle of a dungeon. And then you're like, oh, I don't think I can be able to do it. You got to like back out. <laughs> yeah. Well, with Majora's mask, at least I knew where I was going and stuff like that with uh, the outer wilds. A lot of it was just kind of like figuring out what you're supposed to do. So I was just like, well, I don't feel like I did. I made any progress here, I guess I'll try next time. But I would like to revisit it. Maybe my opinion will change on it because I know a lot of people really love that game. And in terms of uh, an indie game that I wish more people gave attention to is Colin, you brought up earlier with Cyber Shadow. Mm. 
I reviewed that game when that game came out. And so it was good. fucking awesome. Yeah. It was great. I was like, this game's sick. And like, no one played it. No. Yeah. They didn't no one talk it. about it. It was very sad, dude. Yeah, it sucked. It came out, if I recall, it came out like that right in the beginning of the first. It did. Like of the year, like right after PS5 came out, right? Yeah, it was like January. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it a lot. It's it's a, a awesome ode to Ninja Gaiden and, and other mm-hmm. Ape It, you know, side scrolling action games yeah that's a that's a wonderful one i i actually didn't answer the question i should look at my trophies and see if i've i don't bounce off of so many games anymore mm-hmm. i really like to like sit down and play games more deliberately but uh what what's what, what's the last one i even bounced off you know what actually i i played rogue legacy 2 for probably 30 to 40 hours and mm-hmm. never beat it because it's just so so difficult and annoying at times and so <laughs> so abstract but it really is very good it's really pro- good that was probably the last one that i really bounced off of because yeah a lot of these i'm just i've just finished them and a lot of other ones are just not they're not independent in the yeah the truth that's actually yeah like chained echoes i i didn't i bounced off of oh too. okay but okay. i i would like to get um i would like to get back to that but you know someday yeah there's a million games it's never ending the backlog uh let's see here uh this is from abel cosmos hello summon crew persona 3 is for sure my favorite modern persona game just behind the amazing persona 2 with the great success of persona 3 reload selling 1 million copies in its first week what game early in its franchise would you like to see being remade and what kind of changes would it need to have for more modern audiences Hmm. Early game in its like in its franchise being remade. Mm. It'd be cool to see like a f- fantasy star remake or that if we're talking one? About, yeah, fantasy star, star one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a master system game. So I mean it would it would right. it would be yeah. worthy of that. Fantasy Star two and four are probably the favorites for most people, but it would be mm-hmm. cool to get them all out there. It's been a long time. I, I also think about that with Breath of Fire, which came up recently on a show yeah. in some context yeah yeah capcom capcom joint. right exactly and so there are so, i oh. mean there are so many that get lufia yeah. there are a lot from that from that generation that actually i feel like and lunar would be another one lufia would be uh an interesting choice although i think that might have been attempted or maybe that ha- that actually already happened on game boy advance maybe or something or ds mm-hmm. but i have to go to look i have I, well it's actually it would be with dagan because I, I would have that game but um yeah there's there's the Japanese role playing game genre and that environment is is ripe for role playing games and that are I'm yeah. sorry for remakes. That's why I'm so excited for Dragon Quest three and it would be really cool to get really go even deeper than that in some sense. Oh yeah, they released one and two as a package, but they weren't really remade. They were just the Super Famicom versions, I think. But you might want to not want to go that far back. But God, there are so many the tale the old Tales games, Tales of Fantasia, Tales of Destiny. Yeah, I they kind really of remade those, Tales so of Destiny. That. But, yeah. I love that. What about you, Dagan? Anything you could think of? Yeah, I mean, you guys got me on the JRPG mindset, and old guys and girls like me will remember right before Final Fantasy VII, we got a little JRPG called Wild Arms Mm, that could definitely stand for a remake just because the combat screens are very primitive, very jaggy, very sort of um, polygonal spare they really reflect that age of uh what was going on in cg animation although the rest of the game looks gorgeous like a really high profile sharp 16-bit rpg but yeah those those combat screens are are pretty atrocious they don't they don't they didn't it's not the part of the game that age well although i still think that's one of the best mm-hmm. jrpgs ever made so that would be cool to they see they did some yeah. sort of enhanced port of it on psp but I never played it. Did they? Yeah, it was like I can't. Remember, I don't know if it was Alter Code F or if that was a separate game. But there was something. But I never played it. I do remember um, that Alter Code F thing, but I didn't. Realize. And yeah, Media Vision I think still exists, but I don't know. That's incredible. What they're doing, you know, anymore? Yeah, because there were there were five Wild Arms games, I think. Yeah, and three of them are out now on PSN. Um, I, I think they'll get to all of them eventually because Sony owns all of them. So that'd be they nice. They were ahead of the curve. They were one of those. You know, yeah, they were investing in that stuff. Yep, Mm -hmm. they knew that they needed them, and uh, and they got them for sure. And some of the early games were not very good, but some of them, 
like Wild Arms were like Beyond the Beyond was bad, and there were there were a few other yeah, ones that were questionable. But but Wild Arms was an early glowing game for yeah, that genre on PS One. In terms of a remake for me early in the franchise, I would like to see a remake of Parasite Eve. So my envision it for it is kind of like a Resident Evil perspective, the modern remake ones over the shoulder with some action shooting, but also incorporating turn based or like kind of like how Final Fantasy VII remake does the ATP gauge, some sort of like menu based kind of thing where you're selecting like some of her spells and stuff like that. I'd really be down for it. Dude, so I yeah. haven't played that game in yeah, so mind. long, but I I remember it being so ambitious, ambitious, and I loved it. But it was I don't know. I remember it as being underdeveloped. It was like sure. this is yeah, the, yeah, yeah, right. Like this concept is so much better than the execution. Yeah, yeah, I think it's kind of rough in some areas, but I think there's some really cool things there, and that make it really stand out for me. Like the setting alone, you know, just being yeah. in New York City. It's haunting. It's so good. Yeah, I, Aya Bray, right? That, that was the character's name, or something like that. Yeah, I yeah that's right. Wow. And then they did they did the um there was the sequel on PS1, but then they did the third birthday. PSP. Which, yeah, yeah, which I never which was more of a third person shooter, I think. And I never I have we, never played two. We or had three. it, we had it because we used to get UMDs like so early for some reason. I have no idea why. Mm-hmm. I think for manufacturer. But I never played it like in a post release environment. And I don't remember I think Ryan Clements reviewed it at IGN, but that was the last time we ever saw the Parasite Eve. Yeah. And sadly. Yeah, yeah. And that would be cool to read that. I bet you that's in the cards, dude. I wouldn't be surprised if that was in the cards. There's something. Yeah, especially with survival horror. Right. Nowadays. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like they have their own. They have their own survival horror series, really. And not only in that, but in others, too. But I, I think that, yeah. that that could be a, a big win for them if they if they did that. But I wonder. Parasite Eve seemed so relevant to me. I And I wonder if it was relevant to a lot of other people, too, because when, when I was a kid, I had I remember in PSM. They had like a lo- the logo and I cut it out and put it on my door. Mm-hmm. Like the, it was like the P cool. logo with the circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good shit. All right. This question is from Mike. Hey, Deuterinos. Have any of you tried Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin? Yeah, it has crazy slowdowns at times on the PS5 and a lot of in-game upgrade currencies, but I found it very entertaining. I oh, found it as a very entertaining story and the gameplay was very fun in a DMC type of way. I picked it up on picked it up as the PS Plus game a few months ago and purchased the DLC as well. The game is only one of three platinums, the other two being Destiny 2 for PS4 and PS5, so really only two plats I've ever gotten with over 3,500 total trophies. I highly recommend the game for FF fans and as a long as long as you're not expecting FF7 remake quality, I believe it's worth trying. Really enjoy the long form video game uh, content podcast. Take it easy, guys. Mike. So, Mike, I have played through Final Fantasy Origin Stranger Paradise. This game is sweet. However, I cannot recommend it to everyone. It's very rough in some areas. This game is much more in line with Neo than Devil May Cry. How it handles everything combat wise, it feels like it's the same team. So it makes sense. Mm. Combat wise, there's a ton of loot in this game, which is very annoying. And I, I don't like that about Neo. But the combat is cool. The job system is really cool. A much more unusual tone i'll say for a final fantasy game jack the main character is awesome dude he just he's like when you hear someone in an rpg like a villain explaining their plan to you he literally says like shut the fuck up i don't want to hear your kind of story it's very (laughs) awesome it's so cool and it's fully co-op too so you can play with your friends if you want so it's a cool game but it's pretty rough in some areas but i like it like i don't know if you would like it colin yeah, I was I was sure. scared off by by it's Team Ninja, right? Like you said, so yep. Um, yep. They if it, if it felt more like Ninja Gaiden, I would I would be into yeah, it. But, it's it, not. but it, they kind of just don't make games like that anymore. Um, no, they make Neo game Neo. Game. Yeah, like they make Dark Souls games. So that that was what turned me off for. But the story sounds kind of cool because as I understand it, it's supposed to yes. kind of lead into or surrounds Final yes. Fantasy One, um, mm-hmm. oh, which wow. is which is interesting. Yep. And I would love to see that story, but I can probably just spoil it for myself if I wanted to. I'm I'm kind of, <laughs> you know, I have this. I was automatically turned off even before I knew what it was, though, just based on the last Final Fantasy game I put like spin off that I put any hope in was when Type Zero came out or Type O. I'm not oh, really sure which yeah. one it is, but yeah, yeah, I think it's Zero. And I actually played it for the first time in Japan, and I was like, yeah, this is all right. And then it came. I was like, this just it was a port of a PSP game. 
as you might recall that they kind of like mm-hmm. redid the graphics and ported it to console and it was just kind of weak and i just always was like ah, i'll just focus on the mainline stuff and even sure. that wasn't really doing it for me either so i wasn't truly ever open-minded to this game to begin with but um, yeah i don't think it's yeah. for you honestly yeah i don't think so either so and that's how i feel about rise of the ronin like i i need to know more i mean obviously that's koei tecmo but uh, um published but but playstation um exclusive and um as opposed to working with square enix like they did on on final fantasy but it's kind of the same thing where i don't really know what i'm going to be getting and it really all hinges Mm -hmm. on if it's going to be more like ghost of tsushima which it kind of looks like like yeah when i saw the trailer for it i was like oh this looks arcadey to me but if it's not Mm -hmm. then i'm not playing it and i don't so i have no i still don't know where i stand with it yeah i have a lot of questions about that game also like i'm excited for it though I kind of resent the whole just from a personal point of view. It's great for people that like these games, but like the whole takeover of the Soulsborne, like mm. difficult thing. It's yeah. ruining so many games for me that I would otherwise be interested in. <laughs> I'm like, it's, <laughs> well, it's, this game has difficulties, Colin. Well, I'm not going to knock it down to anything normal. else. That I'm going to. Yeah, normal. I'm just play. saying it's yeah. easier yeah. to get into if you. Yeah. If you're worried about difficulty. Yeah, it's uh, if he said it was on PS Plus, I don't remember that. But if it was, then I own it. So it might have been on extra or something. Oh, OK. Like the tiers, I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah. I don't remember I got it you. being on plus other. I got you. Oh, shit. My Chrome's fucking up. Uh, we got one more question. As soon as this loads. Boop, 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 boop. All right. This is from Simon Freeman. Hey, sensational, sensational summoners. If you could go back to any year of gaming in your life one last time, which year would it be? Figured since we have the knockback boys, we could throw it back. P.S. Thank you, Dagan, for telling me you liked my skate clips on Instagram last nice. year. Yeah, good clips, man. It's the Dagster, guys. It's the Muffster. <laughs> the Muffster, yeah. That's right. Oh, it's the Muffster. <laughs> um, I'm happy right where I am, to be perfectly honest with you. Oh, good answer. Because we have sure. everything. We have everything. Like, why would I want to go back to anything? I yeah. guess it maybe is the feeling you had of playing in the game. Yeah, I understand that. I do understand that. And there's so many of them. But I don't know. I I still experience that today at the same time. I guess like going back and playing Bioshock for the first time. I got my Bioshock mm. would be yeah. pretty amazing. Like there's certain game Metal Gear Solid. There are definitely certain games, but I feel like I'm always getting a new game that delights and surprises me. I don't think we're in a bad spot or anywhere close to it right now. I think last year was historically no, we're not. good. We are. But, yeah, it's great. And so it's going to be downhill from last year for sure. But I still think we're in a great space. So I like the question in premise, but I just I'm happy where we are. Like it's everything's cold. Dude, I was on I was on PSN last night. I didn't even know this because there's so many fucking games that come out. So I, I try to go on there like every few weeks and just look at everything chronologically. They ported Oregon Trail to PlayStation Network. Really? <laughs> Oregon Trail? Yeah. Wow. I was like, whoa, what? I fucking love this game. Dysentery. You know, I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah, there's a trophy that's dying of dysentery you get um, for dying of dysentery. But <laughs> of course there is. I'm like, oh, I got to get this bad boy at some point. Like, this is incredible. There's just so I can go back to the 80s when I was playing that on or, you know, the early 90s when I was playing on an Apple II C or whatever or whatever that w- I was playing it on. But it's I can just play it right now on PlayStation Network along with everything else. So mm. that's where I that's where I stand anyway. It's not a great answer, but it's where I stand. Digging, what about you? I mean, I'll be the old man shouting at clouds, man. I'll be the boomer. I'm going back to the 16-bit generation. Ooh. I was a Super Nintendo guy. My best friend was a Sega Genesis guy. We had the best of both worlds. And uh, yeah, I just love that era. I think I think about game, specific games like Link to the Past, Chrono Trigger, of course, Secret of Mana. Eventually, eventually we play Sega and Densetsu 2, but... Um, and other non JRPG games too. Mm-hmm. That was the first time, like, you know, for being such an old guy who cut his teeth with the NES and before that, as a little kid with the Atari 2600, it felt like games in the home were properly emulating our, the arcade experience. Right. You know, Street Fighter 2 on the Super yeah. Nintendo, you know? So that was a great. That, that, that's a really nostalgic one for me because that was my high school console. And that was like the last time I played video games without any kind of responsibility, you know, without before college or owning a home or having a family and all that kind of thing. That was like the last time I could just kind of shove off my homework and just play video games instead, that type of thing. 
feels yeah. baby just feels yeah it's tough for me i think about like 97 you know i think uh metal gear or was that 98 well, final, fantasy 7, 98. Final, fantasy final fantasy 7 came out in 1997 i remember that just consumed my life whenever i got it <laughs> i was just fucking enthralled with that game 98 maybe i'd pick 98 because of metal gear solid also the first time and ocarina of time the first time was just incredible for me i was blown away by that game. Like you guys remember when that game came out, how impressive it was. Oh like my God, 3D was first 3D out. Zelda. Absolutely insane. Yeah, I was obsessed with it. <clears throat> I still have my um they're back there on my shelf. You won't be able to see them. They're yeah, they're both I still have my action figures from that run of toys that came out right when the toy that they came out this um I have Link and Ganon. Oh that's so cool. Yeah from that. I don't even know who made those. Yeah I don't remember either. This one? Yeah that's the one. Wow that's yeah. the one. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. those. and i had the, like the, so the insert where it says link on the front like the cardboard part i had yeah. i saved those from all the boxes too and had them like on my wall you know so wow. cool yeah, that's, that's awesome in the bubble though i love that yeah that's super cool yeah. that's exactly the toy i'm talking about yeah damn dude wow look at banjo kazooie dude remember when he was a thing yep damn i missed that free microsoft yeah yeah, yeah right. <laughs> well right. he was microsoft but they they massacred my poor boy on nuts and bolts <laughs> those bastards all right dudes that's gonna do it for this episode of summon sign uh colin thanks for being here man appreciate it yeah thanks for having Always me dude. having your insight no it was good to be uh, here I, I was excited to uh to do it i didn't sleep very well last night because i was having stomach problems so it was cool to be able to focus on something else <laughs> cool <Yeah. laughs> and of course the muffster muff legend a legend of ls legendary dude. Uh, it was a pleasure Love talking to, be to you here. both. It was a pleasure. This was thank you. I'm honored to be sitting with two video game legends. And Brad, congratulations, man, on oh, all thank your success you, so far with the show. You're killing it. Yeah, you were the last person we needed, I think, to have everyone on. Well, is that right? I'll need to get I'll need to get Jaffe on, I guess, sometime. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, cool. he'll do it. Just uh, we I'll be chaotic, but it'll be fun. Yeah, oh, he would love that. I'm sure he would love that. He plays okay. so many games, so he. I think he'll be the game. last person for LSM. Then, then I'll have everyone on. Cool, man. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody, or listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, check out patreon.com slash last time if you want to support us. We'd appreciate it. Till next episode. See you all then. Goodbye. Summon Sign is a product of Last Stand Media and Colin's Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is written and hosted by me, Brad Ellis. The show is produced by Dustin Furman. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. Summon Sign, along with the rest of Last Stand's media shows, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we are grateful for your kind contribution and generosity to our independent endeavor. Thank you.